Good morning, everyone. I'm Dave Shulman, Senior Director of the Global China Hub here at the Atlantic Council. On behalf, on behalf of the Council and on behalf of the United, uh, University of Notre Dame Keough School of Global Affairs, uh, welcome back to day two of our conference on China in the Global South. Uh, we have an exciting program ahead today, again, of expertise panels on a range of subjects as well as conversations with policymakers. But I'm excited that we're kicking off today with a keynote address uh, by Dr. Daniel Twining the pro president of the International Republican Institute. Uh, before I introduce Dan, let me note uh, that our audience can submit questions for him at askac.org, askac.org. So let me introduce Dr. Daniel Twining. Dan joined the International Republican Institute as president in 2017, where he leads the Institute's mission to advance democracy and freedom around the world. He heads IRI's team of nearly 1,000 global experts to link citizens and governments motivate people to engage in the political process, and guide politicians and government officials to be responsive to citizens. IRI works in over 100 countries and is a core institute of the National Endowment for Democracy. Previously, Dr. Twining served as counselor to the president and director of the Asia program at the German Marshall Fund, as a member of the Secretary of State's policy planning staff, as the foreign policy advisor to U.S. Senator John McCain, and as a staff member of the U.S. Trade Representative. He's been an associate of the National Intelligence Council, taught at Georgetown University, and served as a military instructor associated with the Naval Postgraduate School. He serves on the Bush Institute's Advisory Council, the Wilson Center's Asia Advisory Board, and the USAID Administrator's Advisory Committee on Voluntary Foreign Aid. He testifies regularly before the U.S. Congress on International Affairs, has been a columnist for Foreign Policy and Nikkei, and has served as an advisor to six presidential campaigns. Dan, let me welcome you to the podium. Thanks, Dave. Very happy to be here with all of you, uh, including all of you who are with us remotely. It's a good thing you're remote because we have overflow only standing room here in Washington. Uh, it's great to see everybody. Thank you for coming out. Uh, it is a bit daunting to give a talk to uh, a room full and uh, a world full of people tuning in of actual China experts. So uh, I would just like to maybe make some framing comments just to situate things, I think, in a wider lens. And some of these, I think, are home truths that uh, we perhaps have forgotten in our haste to announce uh, a new rising superpower or our, I think, perhaps sometimes undisciplined belief in kind of a purely new multipolar world. So uh, let me start uh, by really taking on quite directly the proposition that China possesses uh, some kind of alternative and superior model of development. Uh, China, in fact, is following in the footsteps of the Asian tigers, Japan, Korea, Singapore, uh, the city of Hong Kong when it was autonomous. Uh, it is pursuing a similar development strategy, except that because of the political rigidities of the Chinese system, China is now stuck at only between a third and a quarter of those other uh, miracle growth stories uh, per capita GDPs, right? Japan four times richer, Korea and Taiwan over three times richer, et cetera. Other East Asian economies broke through to high income status only when uh, rapid economic development created large middle classes that demanded political rights and the rule of law to protect their property. That, of course, has not happened in China. The fact is, globally, Dave Shulman used to work at the National Intelligence Council, a lot of long-range forecasting and macro forecasting. The only high-income societies on Earth that do not sit on a bed of oil or gas are open societies with the rule of law. Uh, I think we forget this sometimes. There is no modern-day example of successful authoritarian development on par with that of the democracies that produces a high-income society. That does not exist, again, outside of a few microstates and Gulf Petro states. Uh, economically, we know that democracies actually outperform autocracies for all the messiness and imperfection of democratic systems. Uh, the citizens of democracies are on average six times richer than the citizens uh, of autocracies. Uh, we know, uh, look at the Korean Peninsula, that the driver is not culture or geography, it's politics and institutions, right? Uh, compare South Korea and North Korea. 
the Atlanta Council's uh, excellent team that produces the Freedom and Prosperity Index reports that 66% of the variation in prosperity around the world can be explained by freedom, freedom. This makes sense, of course. Property rights, the rule of law, effective and sound institutions, secure capital and investment, promote entrepreneurial aspiration, and generate inclusive growth with minimal corruption. Money follows. The world is not multipolar uh, economically in a way that I think it's sometimes presumed. 70% of the total value uh, of global stock market capitalization, 70% resides in the United States. Democracies produce nearly three quarters of global GDP. An astounding 86% of portfolio investment globally, so this is financial flows, comes from the United States and US allied countries with few indicators to suggest that China and its, quote, allies uh, in places like North Korea or Cambodia are going to follow anytime soon. China is also seen in the developing world in particular as uh, the driver of foreign investment, as, a, as really the decisive source of capital. In fact, the US and Japan are the world's largest sources of outbound investment. According to the OECD's most recent numbers, the US invests more than twice as much abroad as China does. Combined, the US and Japan invest more than three times more abroad than China does. Wealthy Chinese, of course, we know are more likely to export their savings outside of China given the risks of one-man rule. Capital flight now exceeds inbound investment. It's worth thinking about this for a second. There's more money leaving China than entering China. For the first time since really Deng Xiaoping opened up the Chinese economy, attesting to the systemic weaknesses of Xi Jinping's model of centralized and politically directed statist rule. Uh, meanwhile, foreign investment in China is plummeting. And I think friends from the global south hoping for some kind of Chinese windfall should look at what's happening to foreign investment into China. According to the State Administration of Foreign Exchange, China's state administration, uh, foreign direct investment in 2023 into China declined 80% from 2022 levels. Those are the Chinese figures. Uh, the United States has surpassed China as the world's largest recipient of foreign direct investment. The US, not China. China has, as we know, uh, China has gross, massively exported, over -ex exported its industrial overcapacity. We know that debt in China is uh, over 300% of GDP. Uh, heady growth is over in China, I would argue, for reasons related to political stasis and an encroaching totalitarianism. Uh, India has become the world's fastest growing major economy. So that's point one. Uh, I'm not convinced there is an enduring Chinese miracle that anytime soon will match that of, say, Korea or Taiwan, certainly not Japan. Uh, point two uh, is about the fact that even if we want to accept that we live in a two superpower world, uh, superpowers are not created equally, right? We shouldn't take values out of the equation. Uh, we should understand, in fact, that the nature of the Chinese system will be the decisive variable in what kind of superpower Chinese it, China is. So uh, I'm very sensitive. We work all over the world. I'm very sensitive with not leading with geopolitics. The work we do is bottom-up democracy support at the International Republican Institute. Um, but I, I would say uh, that while I think all of us, as Americans certainly, are concerned with a world uh, that features inclusive growth and democracy, and uh, rule of law based development, uh, responsive governance that answers to citizens, uh, we also do understand the geopolitical implications of a world that is more free and democratic, the kind of world Americans would like to see, versus a world uh, that perhaps is modeled on China's vertical of power domestically. So uh, just a foundational point, power works really differently in democracies and autocracies, and their foreign policies out in the world are informed by those distinctions. It's really not simply a domestic equation. In an age of superpowers, the differences in those superpowers' political systems affect everyone everywhere. At home, the Chinese Communist Party accepts no constraint on its power. This fact is literally written directly into the PRC Constitution, so don't take it from me. 
Uh, the weak suffer what they must with nothing to protect them from the prying eyes or the grasping hands of the state. Chinese Communist Party officials do not worry about press exposés, NGOs, or political opponents exposing their misdeeds. In an environment of such thorough impunity, it isn't shocking that bribery and political violence are as routine for an upwardly mobile CCP official as our persuasion and political horse trading. We should not be surprised, therefore, to see Beijing project this philosophy of power abroad. In the race to grow China's global power through any means necessary, the interests of party central and lower level officials are extremely well aligned. No PRC official trying to expand their personal fiefdom ever need fear being called to account for bribing officials in a country like Ecuador, signing opaque contracts that leave countries like Sri Lanka, Zambia, or Kenya on the hook for ruinous debts, or for trying to turn the Chinese diaspora abroad into a political weapon through threats, violence, and judicious infusions of cash. Quite the contrary. Uh, those officials will probably be promoted uh, beyond accountability by the time anyone realizes anything went wrong. So say what you will about the messiness and the accountability structures in democracies. No mid-level official in really any government in an open society wants to get dragged in front of a legislative oversight committee or see their name on the front page of the morning newspaper. Democracy is not just a government, but a system that puts power in a cage by putting fear into the uh, minds of would-be transgressors. Democratic political institutions are fundamental to preserving countries' sovereignty and freedom of choice, including in their dealings with both the US and China. Okay, point three, I would like to take on this argument that I hear a lot, that countries should not be forced to choose between the US and China. We work in over 100 countries, as Dr. Shulman uh, pointed out. Most of my colleagues are not American. They are from those countries. So we are very highly attuned at my institute to local realities. Our experience is that it is Chinese Communist Party officials and propaganda that want to frame the question about America somehow making countries choose, pressuring them to make a choice. It may well be true that in some countries, the offices of prime and foreign ministers do not want the US to lobby them on their ties with China, some of which can be corrupting. Uh, however, uh, the reality is that on the ground, taking a holistic view, Chinese influence is a hotly contested issue. The line that countries don't want to be forced to choose is denying the intelligence and the agency of people everywhere who are trying to sort through the complex impacts of China on their country impacts that are not uniformly positive, irrespective of what Beijing says. People in Ecuador, Sri Lanka, Kenya, and many other countries don't need to look to the South China Sea or the Taiwan Straits for evidence that China is changing the global system. They can see for themselves how China corrupted elites and institutions in their own backyards. The civil society activists and politicians we work with aren't, quote, picking a side in a grand geopolitical struggle. They are putting their countries and communities first because they can see the impact that China is having on their livelihoods and their democracies. So in the International Republican Institute's work, the National Endowment for Democracy's work on China's influence around the world, uh, we do this not because we are, quote, anti-China, because our partners, but because our partners tell us how China is impacting them by corrupting politicians, intimidating journalists, and swaying elections. Our interest, and I would say the U.S. interest, is in countries exercising democratic sovereignty. Decision-making should be vested in citizens, not in some distant foreign capital. Similarly, leaders in developing societies and in developed societies should, of course, be responsive to their citizens, not to foreign interests that advance an agenda through forms of coercion, corruption, and co-optation that is corrosive of democracy. Our interest, I would say also, all of us, since all of us come from countries that are smaller than China, except Indians, uh, our interest is in a world that is safe for small countries. And of course, we still remember fondly when Chinese Foreign Minister Yang Yechi in 2010 told an ASEAN meeting, China's a big country and other countries are small countries, and that's just a fact. That's the kind of might make right world that the Chinese Communist Party envisions. Okay. Uh, 
Next point, we are leaving opportunities on the table. I've sort of assessed part of the problem, which doesn't mean that we are uh, operationalizing solutions effectively. The reality of China's impact cries out for additional involvement with and support from other democracies for our partners in the global south. We know that there are many people who want to work on this issue, from academia to journalism uh, to politics to civil society. Uh, people all over the world are hungry for and interested in China and knowledge about it. And they want the resources to build healthy, equitable relationships between China and their country. Yet all over the world, we see enormous gaps in understandings of how the Chinese Communist Party actually operates and what its objectives are. We see journalists hesitant to tackle a Chinese corruption-related story because of complex corporate structures and massive, opaque party-state bureaucracy layered on top of an unfamiliar culture and language. And we see politicians who want to put forward sensible, well-grounded solutions but lack the time and staff to figure out what has worked elsewhere. We also see people all over the world who want to work together and self-empower to build democratic resiliency, to protect their country's sovereignty, and to enjoy healthy and equitable partnerships with China. Uh, I think there's a big role, including for groups like this, in helping to build a global network of activists and experts who can help our countries navigate the complexities of dealing with uh, a rising Chinese superpower. So, Despite the wealth of opportunities for engagement that I see for all of us who are like-minded, uh, many big countries, including many American allies, are actually quite hesitant to engage in this out of fear of being perceived as, quote, picking a side, being, quote, too pro-American, or, quote, having a Cold War mindset. These are things that you hear from the podium of the Chinese Foreign Ministry, by the way. When working with the Global South, these countries' approach to China is often overly technocratic or tentative. So people will talk about, quote, governance, development, and institutional capacity without talking about democracy, despite a growing body of evidence showing democracy actually advances governance, development, and institutional capacity. That Beijing's quest to export the, quote, wisdom of its system does not. Uh, I think more countries need to get in the game, not just because partners around the world uh, want help and support to do meaningful work on China, but because the future of democracy is at stake. And I would say this is especially true uh, of India, a country where I've lived and worked and visit frequently. India's aspiration is to lead the global south and not cede that space to China. India's uh, foreign minister calls India a non-Western power, but not an anti-Western power, which of course is an important distinction. India is rising as the decisive member of the global south in partnership with key Western powers that are supporting its rise. This is, frankly, a superior approach that India is pursuing compared to China's effort to promote an anti-Western and anti-freedom form of development that privileges economic growth partnered with uh, political authoritarianism. And we really do just need to remind ourselves again of the casualties of China's development model, including inside China. Uh, millions of Uyghurs in camps, uh, the end of an autonomous Hong Kong governed by rule of law and effective institutions, that we can see the price inside China. We don't want to see that globalized around the world, including through the export of Chinese surveillance capacity and other technologies. Uh, I have a lot more to say, uh, particularly about Latin America and Africa, but Dave, I know we want to have a little chat, so I'm just going to park some more specific comments, though I do think it's important to maybe focus in rather than staying macro. Uh, it is important, obviously, to talk about these issues, not simply at the 100,000 foot level, but how they relate to, uh, for instance, debt traps in countries like Zambia, where China was a decisive election issue because of the corruption and indebtedness it fostered. Uh, in Latin America, where frankly there is uh, not deep knowledge of uh, China's grand strategy and ambitions, a belief that business with China is just business, with the result that China has decisive stakes in countries' telecoms and uh, communications and energy infrastructures. So let me just wrap up. Uh, with a few, again, macro thoughts. Just because dictators have been able to maintain power through repression does not mean their people don't want a voice and a vote. And I would argue that's true even inside China, of course. Uh, no one should underestimate the power of freedom's appeal. Even dictators nod to this unique power 
of legitimacy. Therefore, Vladimir Putin will be holding presidential, quote, elections quite soon. Xi Jinping claims to run a, quote, Chinese-style democracy. There is no other source of legitimacy on Earth except popular consent, which is why even the world's great autocrats invoke democratic norms to justify uh, their one-man, one-party rule. Uh, this is not, of course, to understate the enormous threats facing us very directly in this world today, perhaps the most dangerous world since the 1930s. Authoritarian aggression is on the march from Putin's invasion of Ukraine to Iran's attempt to reorder the Middle East through its violent proxies to China's menacing threats against Taiwan. Autocrats are also playing offense by deploying economic coercion and sophisticated campaigns of political interference against free societies. The democratic model, however, has repeatedly demonstrated its superiority to authoritarianism, including, as I started with, just in terms of basic human development outcomes. But there's also just a structural reality. Without free elections that reflect the genuine priorities of citizens, political competition to generate fresh approaches to policy challenges and the free exchange of information to provide leaders with the information they need to make effective decisions, authoritarian governments inevitably do become sclerotic, insulated from reality, and fundamentally unable to deliver for their citizens. We're seeing forms of this in China, in Russia, in Iran, and elsewhere. Uh, these regimes are actually far more vulnerable to economic, social, and political instability. They are not sources of instability. They themselves are fundamentally unstable. They also are much more inclined to make catastrophic strategic mistakes, like Putin's belief that Ukraine would fall without a fight. So final thought, those who argue uh, that Americans uh, don't care about foreign policy, and this sounds like a pretty wonky conversation, but it's not germane to uh, where we are as a nation, uh, I think should actually consider the lessons of history, right? American presidents actually do suffer when they are viewed as abdicating our international leadership responsibilities, even though it's fine to have a very lively debate about what those responsibilities entail. Uh, I could go through many examples, but look at how President Biden actually went underwater in the polls when he abandoned Afghanistan and has literally never recovered. Foreign policy is a factor in the success of our political leaders. Polling by the Reagan Institute, where I am part of its strategy group, shows that a clear majority of Americans on a scale of 1 to 10, the average polling in the U.S. comes out at 7.5, want the U.S. to maintain international leadership rather than ceding it to our adversaries. So that's about 75% of Americans. While also about three in four Americans, according to the polling, believe that we should, whenever possible, stand up for democracy and human rights. I think this is a comparative advantage for the United States. We can engage with the global south in a qualitatively different way. We're never gonna do it perfectly. We're always going to be behind and not have enough resources to bring to bear. But uh, there is a qualitative distinction uh, difference in the way that the US wants to help countries pursue inclusive development and prosperity, uh, democratic development that delivers for all citizens. I think that is the United States' most important calling card, and uh, we should uh, use it in the global south and the developing world, again, given the success of the democratic development model. Thank you all. Thank you, Dan. Uh, that was compelling and insightful, as always. Uh, great comments. And I really appreciated you bringing in some of the work that the International Republican Institute is doing and what you've been seeing on the ground in your, what, five, almost six years uh, almost leading seven there. Years. Almost seven. Getting okay. old, Dave. Wow. <laughs> um, so I have a bunch of questions I could ask, but we only have about five minutes. And we do have some decent uh, questions here from the audience. So sure. thank you uh, for those who put those in. Um, and one of the ones I wanted to ask relates to a point you were making about the general um, failings, arguably, of authoritarian systems mm -hmm. for delivering for their people, right? Um, and this argument about freedom and prosperity and how they're linked. And so the question we have here is, we've long believed in the high correlation between freedom and prosperity. But after the brutal crackdown in Hong Kong, international businesses, including American multinational corporations, had few qualms. Hong Kong and China's economies were going strong in 2020 before COVID, which really is what kicked off the demise. Um, so the question here, I think, is could Beijing have continued to pull off the kind of record mm. growth and continued success and prosperity that we were seeing earlier 
Um, is it is it the you know fault of the authoritarian system? Is there something inherent in authoritarian systems, not just China's but others, that kind of eventually lead to the kind of uh, you know economic malaise that we're seeing now in China? Mm. So Hong Kong is an interesting case study because. Uh, the average Hong Konger was something like five times richer than the average Chinese. It really was the golden goose. Uh, the Hong Kong democracy protests peaked in 2019 before the pandemic. So I appreciate the mention of the pandemic, but the pandemic is not what killed Hong Kong. What killed Hong Kong was uh, a CCP crackdown, an attempt to revoke Hong Kong's economy that brought as many as two million Hong Kongers, a quarter of the population of the city, into the streets, mm -hmm. protesting for uh, political freedom and the rule of law, which was crushed. The national security law, uh, the uh, gross interference in what had been democratic elections in uh, that city. Hong Kong no longer is autonomous. Uh, capital has fled Hong Kong. And it's really disappointing because like Taiwan, it was just a vision of a very different Chinese future. I think the Chinese Communist Party leadership in Beijing understood very clearly that if all of China became like Hong Kong, uh, Xi Jinping and company would no longer be in power. Ultimately, the Chinese Communist Party would not actually succeed. Uh, so uh, they uh, acted preemptively to prevent what was happening in Hong Kong from essentially going viral more broadly across China. But again, uh, Hong Kong's development model had spoken for itself, and it's a shame because the Xi Jinping development model is not going to produce what Hong Kongers accomplished in terms of prosperity. Right. Um, a related question that we've talked about a little bit in our panels yesterday about China's slowing economy and whether that changes uh, the nature of its influence and engagement across the developing world, because we always think of China as leading with its economic influence, and China thinks of its comprehensive national power and puts the ec economy at the heart of it. Uh, so the question here is, given the increasing trend, and you mentioned this, of global South countries uh, looking more to the United States and its allies for foreign direct investment, um, how do you view China's role in the global system? Is that going to fundamentally, the shift we're now seeing in terms of uh, away from China as the necessarily as the kind of investor of choice for developing countries? I think yes. So the Chinese offer is different than it was five or six years ago when the Belt and Road investments were vast and China was growing much more robustly and leaning forward. Uh, the Chinese offer seems to have changed. You know, the global civilization dialogue and some of mm -hmm. these other more recent pronunciations, the pullback of Belt and Road, the uh, precipitous drop in Chinese direct investment in many countries. I mean, I didn't get into it here, but Dave, there's an impressive number on Africa that Chinese investment uh, in Africa uh, was uh, down from 20 billion to less than 1 billion in 2022 at a 20-year at a low. Yeah. I mean, that's not declined by 10 or 20 percent. That's declined by 90 percent in Chinese foreign outflows of capital. So uh, the Chinese offer is changing. I think that's partly because of China's development struggles at home, the new statism, but also the fact that a lot of these projects didn't produce right. uh, or produced backlash. Uh, so uh, let's see. I do think it's important for us to concede that China takes the global south very seriously, so seriously that they deploy extensive influence operations, propaganda, diplomacy, to try to energize and rally countries in the developing world against the United States. Now, we should remember they are not trying to energize and rally countries in the developing world towards some amazing development outcome. They are essentially, they themselves are using Cold War mentality to try to turn uh, countries, including in like Central America and Latin America in our own hemisphere against the United States. That is their ultimate strategy. And I think our friends in the developing world are smart enough to understand what's going on. Yeah, that's a great point. I think the, and this came up in some of our conversations yesterday, which is that even though we have China kind of perhaps not being able to leverage quite so much their economic engagement and influence in countries, they are going to potentially now uh, lean even harder into some of those other methods to ensure a level of influence uh, politically and otherwise in some of these countries, whether it's uh, through information operations, through cultivating elites, these kinds of other means by which the party uh, has tried to uh, achieve its ends, mm -hmm. right? Um, we have time for maybe one more question, um, and you are uh, both uh, as an academic and also just in your kind of uh, as a practitioner and a policymaker, you have um, looked a lot at the role of, of allies, right, in, in, in the U.S. attempt to achieve uh, our, our goals around the world, particularly looking at, at India, as you mentioned in your, in your remarks, and Japan as well. So uh, we have a question here that's kind of more specific to 
how do you view India um, as a you know, democratic alternative, as a leader of the global south, given what's been happening in India? But I want to broaden that out a little bit as well to talk about, you know, and we'll be discussing this today in our Asia panel and then with our policymakers later in the day. How important is it for the United States to be working with, with India, with Japan, mm -hmm. and then, of course, with, with Europeans and others uh, to be achieving these aims and giving alternatives uh, to countries uh, in the global south to what so China's it, offering? Thank you. It's a great question. It's super important. I mean, one is obviously our development cooperation with both Europe and Japan and now Korea, which is leaning far forward, including on democracy right. assistance abroad, that yes. we really need to step that up. And I think our friends in the administration understand that. We're all trying to work to operationalize. That, that the West writ large has a big mission together to accomplish, including in uh, the global south. But India, I think, is quite singular because it is a non-Western but not anti-Western country, yes. because it now is experiencing its own, its own essentially development miracle uh, under Modi, but set in motion by previous Congress-led governments. So this is a bipartisan uh, affair uh, because it is doing extraordinary things uh, that are inclusive and empowering for the bottom billion, basically, through the digital stack and uh, digital welfare payments, uh, uplifting of women in rural villages through new technologies, that sort of thing. So there's a particular role for India, which itself is a development donor, I think, to play mm -hmm. uh, in coordination with us, but also on its own in showing countries in Africa, for instance, that there are alternative models to totalitarianism that produce broad-based prosperity and technological progress. Uh, I think we all have a lot at stake in India's success. India's genius, and I think part of what will propel its rise, is its democratic system its inclusive, pluralistic, democratic system, which makes it non-threatening to countries in the developing world in ways that China is not, in ways that China actually is corrosive of sovereignty. So India needs to protect those democratic institutions and that democratic culture, because that is part of what will propel it strategically in terms of the influence it seeks on the global stage. Well, that is a fantastic way to end our conversation and to lead into our next panel on Asia. Great. Thank you, Dan, so much for kicking us off with such uh, fantastic uh, remarks and, and conversation here. Thank you, Dave. Good to be with you all. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, we will take a, a brief moment, but uh, please do remain in your seats as we transition to our next panel on Asia.
Good morning. Uh, this is the regional panel on Asia, the regional lightning panel. Um, Asia, or the Indo-Pacific as we often call it, is a vast and diverse and dynamic region. Uh, it's also China's neighborhood. But China's approach and engagement in this region has varied tremendously across the region. So to assess China's influence and impact on the different parts of the Indo-Pacific, we have three authoritative experts to share with us their insights on particular parts of Asia. Uh, let me introduce them briefly. Um, starting with, to the west uh, with South Asia and to my left, we have uh, Susan Osterman, who's an assistant professor of global affairs and political science at the University of Notre Dame uh, and the Keough School of Global Affairs. She's the South, the South Asia Area Studies Specialist who has done extensive field research in Nepal, India, and Pakistan, and has been engaged in the region for nearly 25 years. She has a PhD in political science from the University of California, Berkeley, and a law degree from Stanford Law. And she focuses on policy-relevant research related to state capacity, regulatory compliance, and norm change. Uh, to my immediate left, I have uh, Richard Hedarian, who's a senior lecturer at the Asian Center at the University of the Philippines. Richard is a prolific writer, an academic, and policy advisor. He's currently um, uh, a senior lecturer, as I mentioned, at the University of the Philippines, and he is a columnist at a number of publications, including the Philippine Daily Inquirer, um, TV host at One News, and he's a regular contributor to many publications uh, across the globe. And he's written a number of books, to name just a few, the Rise of Duterte, A Populist Revolt Against Elitist Democracy in 2017, uh, The Indo-Pacific, Trump, China, and the New Global Struggle for Mastery in 2019, and he has a forthcoming book called Confronting China. And joining us virtually, we have du Duveri Hanau, who's the founder and CEO of The Legacy Group, a geopolitical consulting firm. He is joining us from Papua New Guinea. Uh, he has over 20 years of experience in advising governments, regional organizations, and foreign investors on geostrategy and political economy in Papua New Guinea and the Pacific region. Um, he specializes in trade mo aid for trade modalities, faith-based diplomacy, and technology investments. And he's had several important positions in Papua New Guinea, including his current uh, appointment on the Eminent Persons Group Foreign Policy Working Group, which is drafting Papua New Guinea's white paper foreign policy, and he has a law degree from the University of Papua New Guinea. So let me start by asking each of our panelists to give us an overview of their particular corner of Asia and how China is perceived and how China has approached countries in the region. So let me start with you, Susan, um, in South Asia. Uh, Sri Lanka is often considered the poster child of some of the negative consequences of a lot of Chinese engagement. Um, but there are a lot of other countries in the region. So can you uh, share with us your thoughts about China's role in the region and how it's viewed? Absolutely. And uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. And thank you for having me. Um, South Asia um, has had a really mixed record in terms of Belt and Road, but also Chinese engagement more generally. Everybody, I think, is familiar, both uh, those in the room uh, physically and those uh, present virtually, with the Sri Lanka example. Um, what many people don't know is that Pakistan is just a step behind. Um, and uh, with what's going on there in terms of debt unsustainability and the sheer quantity of lending is something like 64 billion at this point with additional projects being signed on to. Um, I think if we wanna understand Chinese engagement in the region, we have to sort of look at um, Sri Lanka as the canary in the coal mine and uh, Pakistan is following shortly behind. There are the rest of the engagement in the region is quite varied. So um, for instance, Bhutan has no formal relations with China. Um, Nepal has made uh, quite a bit of uh, profitable strategic engagement between India and China by playing the two off of, off of each other. Um, and the Maldives recently um, has done the same, but actually has pivoted towards China. Um, so it's, it's going to be an interesting place to watch in, uh, in the near term. Thank you. Um, let me turn to you, Richard. Uh, Southeast Asia, 
you're from the Philippines and you've done a lot of work on the re on Southeast Asia more broadly. Um, China's front yard, perhaps we can yeah. think of it. So, you know, in many ways, uh, it's it's really sort of the the, the core, the the central part of China's sphere of influence. Uh, we might want to think of it that way. So tell us about Southeast Asia and how China has approached the region and whether there are important differences between countries and how they perceive mm. China and Chinese engagement. Three minutes, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this yes. feels like a sports show. I was ready for a, kind of a stock market breakdown and wish this was a coffee. Um, very quickly, in some signposts, things that I look forward to discuss later on with the panel. Mm -hmm. I mean, first of all, and this is kind of a preview of an upcoming book of mine with Melbourne University Press, First of all, what we're seeing is a kind of a 50 shades of hedging and agency as far as uh, Southeast Asia is concerned. I think uh, yesterday there was a lot of discussion about agency and strategic autonomy, etc. But clearly it's a spectral thing, you know. Uh, when you talk about countries like Laos, for instance, their situation is tremendously different from a country like the Philippines, for instance. And Singapore, we had our good friend Bilhari also there, you know, they have also their own kind of degree of strategic agency and hedging. Now, speaking of hedging, of course, you know, it's, you know, I have my own ideas about this. We can discuss this later on. I, I believe there's also some limitation to how much hedging you can do, uh, or what I call strategic polyamory, right? <laughs> um, at some point, countries will have to make choices, because not making a choice is a choice in itself, and it has costs, and sometimes it's a privilege that some countries cannot afford. So I come from a country called the Philippines. We're very close to Taiwan. We're a US treaty ally. We cannot be neutral on issues like Taiwan, for instance, right? And what's happening there. So we're adjusting accordingly. And also what you see in the region is a wild swings, not only among countries, but within countries. I mean, I used to be here almost every month back in the day when Duterte was the president, <laughs> Trump was the president. I had one book on each of them. Now things are very, very different. And ironically, under Marcus Jr., which we all feared will be the next big dictator, but things have turned out very well, interestingly, in the right direction. But then again, you cannot say for sure what's going to happen to a country like the Philippines in the next coming years or after Marcus Jr. steps uh, down from office in 2020. So there's a lot of what I call strategic indeterminacy, right? That's why it's a very fluid picture. And speaking of fluidity, and this will be my last point because I think my three minutes is almost over, um, I don't think the region is really bipolar. I find it intellectually impoverished when they say it's a U.S.-China competition. If you look at the infrastructure development landscape, China has been engaging in what I call pledge trap, not debt trap. <laughs> a lot of pledges, and they get a lot of PR bang out of their imaginary buck. I mean, they're really good capitalists as far as PR is concerned. Um, in the Philippines, I mean, they offered 24 billion dollars in investments to Duterte. I'm still watching for a uh, hundred million to come in. It's, it's already 2024, <laughs> last time I checked. And you know, when Marcus went back there last year, they just repackaged the same thing minus the few millions that got in, right? Put a little bit of renewables here and there. Uh, it's actually Japan, which leads the infrastructure development picture. The metro underground system in Manila is being developed by Japan. If you look at Vietnam, Philippines, a lot of key countries in the region, Japan trounces China by far, even in terms of just pledges. So even in pledges, China is not necessarily ahead. So we tend to forget Japan, we, because it's a stealth power in many ways. Um, so I see the region more like, you know, my understanding of the region's geopolitics is like German politics. You have two dominant parties, SPD and uh, CSU and CDU, but the third parties, the smaller parties, can determine the direction of, of, of the flow. And that's why India is important, Japan is important, South Korea is important, and European partners who are getting more engaged in this part of the world are important. Thank you. Okay, let's turn to the Pacific, uh, Pacific Island countries. Um, Duveri, give us an overview. I mean, even within the Pacific, there's sort of three distinct uh, subregions um, with very different relationships with uh, China as well as other partners. Can you give us an overview of that region and how China's engagement in recent years has been viewed? <clears throat> So, 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 so just breaking it from, from that regional context, um, Micronesia, which is principally on the north, uh, has largely um, uh, been in the, in, the per, in the periphery of the U.S. through the, uh, the COFA and the COMPACT frameworks. And, and China has been sensitized to that, but it's also actively competing on its uh, BRI uh, initiatives and even bilateral initiatives. But if you shift further down south uh, to where PNG is, um, it's, it's a largely um, uh, three-way play between Indonesia that has, um, um, it's now gaining more interest in the Melanesia uh, sub-region. 
um, principally that's been an Australian hegemony for the past 50 years. And of course, New Zealand has um, uh, several um, realm states that connect to metropolitan Wellington as well. So the conversation of China started picking up um, pr probably a couple of years prior to the BRI 1.0, um, and it started increasing towards 2010 on its infrastructure push. And, and, and Papua New Guinea was largely a major uh, a jewel in that, um, in that incentive. Um, again, I, I've been on several oversight committees, and the, the example that I give about uh, the differences on China approach is a three-page MOU worth $200 million versus a 1,000-page agreement from the ADB or one of the multilateral firms of infrastructure. That is basically the playbook that China brought practically into the Pacific. We weren't barred from norms uh, from Canberra, Wellington, uh, or, or even the multilaterals. Here was something completely different, where they offered um, significant resources. Um, in most cases, they just bypassed state solicitors and went straight into these agreements. So that level of attraction, that level of flexibility, even the enticements that uh, several speakers have mentioned about this uh, unlimited capital was where China started picking up. Um, I'll, I'll go into greater depth on wh wh where those uh, um, initiatives are beginning to uh, falter, beginning to pause, mm. and where they're beginning to change. But fundamentally, uh, the, the, the per the pervasiveness of China going into all of the 14 island countries is quite um, impressive and disrupting uh, those um, hegemonies that existed. Again, what needs to be stated on the outset is America has been completely uh, absent in the region, apart from mm. PACOM and, and, uh, and those boats coming back and forth uh, traversing the region. But USG in particular, uh, started um, uh, disconnecting from, from the Pacific, especially in the South, in the 1990s. And that's where um, conversations and other parties began to float within the leadership. And China provided that sort of opportunity that uh, started embracing um, national plans, regional systems. Fascinating. Okay, we're definitely going to want to come back to some of those points that all of you have raised. Um, but let me start again with you, Susan. Sure. All of you have mentioned, um, I think, other important external partners. So, and this point was made many times yesterday as well, that we should not view the Indo-Pacific as a bipolar rivalry between the United States and China, at least from the perceptive, perception of countries in the region. There are other very important actors at play. And Susan, in South Asia, obviously India is the big brother traditionally, um, very present, uh, very strong ties. So has India been able to regain any strategic ground as China has made big moves in, its, in India's own neighborhood? Has it been able to step up you know, its diplomatic engagement, its economic or, or security linkages? Um, how would you assess India's role in the region? And um, relatedly, uh, perhaps, uh, what are the challenges and prospects for India, uh, for India's efforts to become uh, an alternative leading voice in the global south to China? So I do think that India is an alternative leading voice in the south to China, and it has been actually for a very long time, right, starting in the Cold War period with um, strategic non-alignment, right? Um, yeah, sure. That said, current Indian policy uh, tends to drive uh, neighbors into China's hands. Um, so India has been, um, India moves from fear, right? Mm -hmm. um, if you want to understand a lot of the dynamics in the region, all you have to do is look at Google Maps and the sheer number of dotted lines between countries in the region and China. Um, India feels as if it's being encroached upon, encircled, et cetera, and um, it tends to make um, unreasonable demands of its uh, neighbors when it sees Chinese encroachment. So a good example of this is the 
a recent spat with the Maldives. Mm. Uh, you have a pro-China um, prime minister who has come into power, and um, all he had to do was make a few statements before India said, you know, essentially, if you're not our friend, then we don't need you anymore, right? And the Maldivians basically say, that's fine. We'll just go to China, right? And that's not necessarily their best move. Um, but at the same time, this is something that has played out again and again. This happened with Nepal in 2015, the first time that there were um, fuel supplies sent over the Himalaya to Nepal was when India had a, a diplomatic row with Nepal, and Nepal simply turned to its north, right? Um, so I think that India is, um, is a viable alternative. I actually also see it as being pretty multipolar. Yeah. At mm -hmm. the same time, I'm not sure that India is operating at full capacity at this point. I'm not sure they're making all of the right moves. Mm -hmm. mm. Interesting. Uh, Richard, you mentioned uh, the multipolarity uh, in the region. Can you say a little more about, um, about that, how countries in Southeast Asia view other potential partners uh, compared to China? I mean, certainly you mentioned infrastructure. You know, China's Belt and Road and other initiatives in Southeast Asia have delivered a uh, tremendous amount of infrastructure. This has been very welcomed by yeah. many governments less delivery in the Philippines. Yeah. Um, but you know, how, how, do the, how do these countries view, and what are the interesting differences among countries, and how they view China's uh, you know, offers of infrastructure and other kinds of things? Uh, and then what are, what are, what are concrete ways that, that countries view other partners as alternatives? Well, I mean, yesterday we had folks from uh, Africa Barometer looking at very important data and numbers. I think in, in, in mm -hmm. case of Southeast Asia, I mean, of course, we have the Pew surveys, uh, Gallup, among others. But I suggest really folks to check the Institute for Southeast Asian Studies mm -hmm. uh, annual surveys of influential folks. I mean, and, and, uh, they tend to ask the policymaker and thought leaders about their ideas about who are the most preferred partners, what are the pros and cons of that. I mean, consistently we see Japan and, and the European Union coming on top mm -hmm. of others. I mean, there's there's strategic skepticism both towards China and the BRI, but also to a certain degree towards the United States. So if you look at the uh, views of the U.S., it increased significantly when Biden came into power, but now mm -hmm. things are tapering off a little mm -hmm. bit. So I think we have a lot of data and number that shows that not only countries do not see it as purely bipolar. They, they actively want other uh, players like Japan and the European Union to be involved here. Now, of course, as far as uh, you know, U.S. and its network of allies is concerned, then things can get more interesting, right? Mm -hmm. Because Japan can coordinate it with the United States. India sometimes can coordinate it with Japan and U.S. So in that sense, as much as China is very influential, I mean, I'm not being dismissive towards some of the big projects. I mean, they have very big profile projects, whether it's the railway, high-speed railway project in Laos, whether it's mm -hmm. the Bandung Jakarta finally finished in Indonesia. <laughs> but, you know, they get a lot of bang out of that buck, right? That, mm -hmm. that limited but big-ticket projects. But, you see, we want other countries to be involved here. And we see that, for instance, India now is becoming a very big player on the defense front. Uh, mm. They're about to deploy the supersonic Brahmos missile system. Some of them have even Russian technological derivative mm -hmm. there. Uh, but the, the Indians just sent a very big delegation to the Philippines. So they're looking at Vietnam. They're looking at Philippines. They're looking at a number of countries in the region where they can build a big defense market. Well, what's important here is the shot of the future, right? So if we, ha we were to have this conversation three, four, five years ago, the assumption was China is going to overtake the United States by this time. So that mm -hmm. structured people's strategic moves and mm -hmm. expectations. Mm -hmm. Now that the discourse is not that China is going to collapse, but China is not going to really, you know, um, China is almost peaking. Suddenly people are looking, oh, okay, who are the other rising powers? Like, and this is where India comes in. Mm -hmm. Or what are the other players that have not been as appreciated, even if they don't have that upward trajectory? Let's look at Europe. Let's look at France, what they can offer. Or mm -hmm. South Koreans, who have been also very much on the upward trajectory. I mean, South Korea now is one of the largest mm -hmm. exporters of defense equipment, and a number of countries in the Middle East, whether it's Turkey, among others. Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying here is that the strategic horizons of Southeast Asian countries have expanded, and they mm -hmm. actively want that expansion. And if mm -hmm. you look at the discussion in different capitals in the region, they don't sit down and say what US and China think. Mm -hmm. They're looking at how can we leverage our position mm -hmm. while we're building our capabilities. But the last point on this, my sense is I was in the ASEAN meetings and summits last year in Jakarta. My sense is, if you look at key countries like Indonesia, their understanding is time is on our side, actually, perhaps even more than, Indone uh, more than China. 
because demographically we're in a good mm -hmm. position. We're all so since last year, several Asian countries are going faster than China, Philippines, Vietnam. Their idea is give us 10, 20, 30 years, we're all going to be full fledged middle power at the very least. And Indonesia may even vie for something bigger. So let's play it safe. Let's not do something crazy. Let's build our capacity, get everything from the other side. And in 20 years, we're going to have interesting conversations with these big guys <laughs> because we're going to be quite big ourselves. So clearly that applies to Indonesia. Clearly that applies to Vietnam and hopefully Philippines down the road. And it's very interesting that Indonesia um, snubbed the BRICS because it wants to join the club of OECD. Mm -hmm. So when a country as vital as Indonesia, third largest democracy, mm -hmm. uh, largest Muslim majority country says, no, I wanna be in the club of OECD countries. That tells you about what deep inside they're thinking about. There are all of this conversation of anti-Western conversation, global South conversation, mm -hmm. but a lot of us actually, we wanna be part of OECD if you look at the key rising mm -hmm. countries in that part of the world. So that's where I think there's a lot of room for, for the West to come in and build constructive, good, forward-looking relationship. There is chip on our shoulders, because whether it's Philippines and Indonesia, we had certain interaction in the past, to put it mildly, which, which were not optimal. But it's not like the Chinese are doing a good job too, right? <laughs> By elbowing their way through. So I think now the field is open, it's exciting, mm -hmm. it's fluid. And that's why I find Southeast Asia quite an interesting part of the world. I used to you know, write a lot about the Middle East and the other parts of the world. I was bored with ASEAN, but nowadays, <laughs> I think this is the sexiest part of the world as far as <laughs> geopolitical dynamism is concerned, yeah. yeah. Very optimistic. Well, both of you, I think, have painted a picture um, that's an important theme to highlight, which is the, uh, str the strategic agency of these countries mm -hmm. in dealing not only with China, but with other external partners and how they are very proactively looking to maximize their leverage mm -hmm. um, and pursue their interests. So let me turn to you, Devery, because you've made also a similar point. Um, uh, I don't know if the Pacific is as sexy as Richard's Southeast Asia. Beautiful. But certainly <laughs> most, very beautiful. Most of <laughs> the countries are much smaller. PNG is rather large relative to many of these very tiny nations uh, out, spread out in the Pacific. Um, but you, know, you also made the point in your opening remarks, and I, ho I, wish, I hope you can expand on those in terms of how countries have looked to things like creating national plans and you know, uh, the absence of the United States beginning in the 1990s, you mentioned, and using that, you know, using that as opportunities to um, carve out new directions uh, in terms of their external engagements. Can you talk more about the approaches that countries in the Pacific have taken that have been effective or less effective? Yes, certainly. So, 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 so I think the first thing to, to jump into is um, uh, the government is 80% of everything. In mm. fact, in some cases, it's 99%. And the private sector, um, you know, hovers on the side. So, so, so capability building in the public service, um, first of all, uh, uh, changes the dynamics and approach on nation building. And so in, in, in the 90s and the 2000s, one of the success stories of Australian education, uh, soft power use with New Zealand and a certain extent, uh, you know, to the U.S. as well, was it, it built a cadre of um, MBA graduates. And then that uh, regenerated in, um, in the universities back in the Pacific. So, so that started creating um, a generation of national planners that uh, articulated that our development paradigm looks like this. We aspire to have that. We want to move in that direction. So um, prototype versions of those development plans in the mid-90s, uh, stimulated by um, multilateral programs such as the IMF, but indigenous plans started emerging in the 2000s. And that was where the intersection points started coming with um, regional uh, middle powers uh, and even the larger markets um, such as China, that he here is our playbook. This is what we want A, B, C, X, Y, Z type of projects to interface, support our supply chain, support our health services. Now, it wasn't all rosy. Um, I, I mentioned about those three-pager MOUs. That obviously fested into uh, local political dynamics, um, um, and, and, and largely the, the patronage that still prevails uh, in the Pacific, um, that's always a um, uh, uh, rubs against uh, democratic values. 
but but those national plans um, uh, uh, usually with a five-year cycle began to articulate much of um, what the national aspirations are. And um, for, for Papua New Guinea, for example, when we uh, became sexy, Richard, <laughs> when um, the world uh, started to come to our shores, um, and we must have had like 40 bilaterals, it was phenomenal. Um, right. And it was in that space you, you saw Prime Minister Marape uh, uh, put the, the medium plan in front of those his counterparts and leaders and say, this is what we want to do. This is our plan. So even when the friendship uh, dialogue of um, Nahendra Modi inviting uh, 10 Pacific Island uh, leaders um, and then the Americans um, piggybacked on that with uh, Defense Corporation and also Pacific Partnership Programs, you, you, you saw this level of consistency among Pacific Island leaders. Is <clears throat> Here's our national plan. Here's our playbook. Um, where can you intersect? Where can you connect and partner? So that um, level of uh, maturity, um, it, it started um, also connecting into the regional architectural system. So... Mm. We have the blue uh, uh, um, Pacific uh, continent um, framework. It's, it's 10, 15 years. Those common issues on, on fisheries, on climate change, they also began to articulate in the bilateral. So it was as if an echo chamber was happening that whatever you heard from the region, elements of that would also articulate in the bilaterals as well. And so, so that was where we began to see um, a much more... Um, uh, collaborative China, wanting to listen to, to what these infrastructure mm -hmm. interests are. It, it's also reminiscent for me not to also uh, identify that um, because of America's uh, step up using Prime Minister Scott Morrison's term um, into the region, it bolstered the confidence of Australia to also come out on a, on a whole host of issues in uh, competing against the China um, uh, BRI and, and bilateral initiatives. Prior to the American uh, participation, um, uh, Australia had no capability whatsoever to uh, compete, and, and neither could New Zealand. And, and why would they? Because these are the, uh, China is the largest trading partner, so so there, there had to be that level of um, uh, um, uh, um, yeah factored into their engagements. But, but, the, but the clear message here is um, what, what I'm observing now is that these national plans are becoming negotiating talking points. Uh, they, they are in many ways uh, stimulated through back end from Australian support programs, uh, regional support programs. But it, because they're indigenous in nature, um, it's creating that um, operational value on having some of those um, predecessor systems like the non-aligned thinking, the, the mobile staff thinking that we have our own issues um, and you're either going to partner with us or we're going to move on to the next. Mm. Thank you. Um, let me remind the audience that if you have questions for the panel, mm. please submit them uh, to askac.org. That's askac.org. Uh, we'll try to turn to one or two at the, at, in a few minutes. Um, but let me ask, um, actually, Tavari, I'm going to stick with you um, and ask, uh, but I'm going to ask all of you um, what the United States and like-minded countries that are important in the region, uh, what advice would you have for U.S. officials as they think about how to improve, enhance their engagement in the region in ways that countries will find meaningful and might offset um, some of the negative impacts of rising Chinese influence. Devere, you mentioned that the United States has stepped up its efforts, has come back into the Pacific region uh, of, you know, over the last several years. Um, how would you assess U.S. efforts, and what more um, or what types of engagement do you think would be most useful for U.S. Uh, officials to consider? Yeah. So, 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 so although USG has you know, c come back into our, our neck of the woods. Um, it's also important to appreciate that uh, the presence of American values has remained uh, resiliently right throughout 
um, you know, prior to the, um, after the Second World War, through Christianity. So mm. a, a big toolkit that uh, Washington has over China is faith-based diplomacy. China does not have an equivalent. Mm. Um, when I speak to, um, you know, for example, James Marape, he's a devoted SDA. That's a concoction from America. Um, there are other um, very, very deeply pious uh, leaders in the Pacific that have those connections. So, th so that's a toolkit that the State Department um, you know, should utilize. Uh, I know of a delegation that uh, recently just went to the U.S. on the prayer breakfast. Th th these are connections that I think um, uh, adds uh, tremendous value in enhancing. Um, again, an example is uh, uh, John Maxwell is a, um, is a Christian motivational speaker. Mm. When he came to Papua New Guinea uh, 12 months ago, the entire cabinet attended you know, his speech. Almost the judiciary did the same as well. So, so, so this sort of um, uh, faith-based diplomacy is something worth pursuing. And again, America is 700% ahead of China in, in that space. Whether the State Department uh, subscribes to that, that's obviously another question. Um, the second thing is um, I, I, I'm a... a, a um, very interested in the way that AGOA connected um, Africa and the U.S. through very pragmatic uh, G2B connections. And, um, and a lot of great things came out of AGOA, the African Goods Opportunity Act. Um, I, I, I've helped construct European Union Pacific Economic Partnership frameworks, and it, it has a similar type of genre. But the difference that AGOA had was you were plugging American ingenuity investments right into um, African um, uh, resource bases. And there were some winners, some losers, of course. So a Pacific Agoa is, is definitely an area that I think um, America should explore um, because that type of genre is what is needed. We need the Googles and the Microsofts to help us in our digital uh, quest, digital journey. Um, we need um, Exxon's already in our backyard with a, with a, with a huge LNG project. So, so, so it's those sorts of things where you connect the nodes and pump our fish into the markets, n not just in America, but also within that West uh, sphere in, in, in Asia. And perhaps the final thing is just to circle back on what I mentioned about national plans. Um, and, and again, capitalizing on the previous speaker, from the uh, Institute of Republican Institute, um, apologies, I think I got that acronym wrong, but but his uh, the, the thrust of his conversation around democracy prevailing, these national plans are in many regards a, an indigenous definition of democracy, and this is where I feel uh, this is where I think much of um, U.S. support or, or its um, coalition support in, in the Pacific, investing in these national plans is definitely going to further increase democracy prevailing and certainly um, help um, that hegemony of values, of, of trade, of, um, of um, uh, open markets and free people prevail in an, in an increasingly you know, different um, uh, sphere that, uh, that, that China offers. Those are three, I think, really excellent points. And um, on the faith-based approach, I mean, there may be institutional constraints for the United States to uh, to use that at an, at an official government to government level. But it is worth noting that, I mean, you know, implicit in your remarks is that the Pacific is a very, you know, Christian, uh, devoutly Christian region. Um, and, uh, you know, voices that I heard when I traveled to the region were, were really emphasized that point and um, noted that Australia and New Zealand seem to have Fewer constraints, perhaps they they really u utilize that that channel of communication much more effectively um, than we do. But maybe it's worth thinking creatively about how we can um, boost some of those some of those engagements. Um, really excellent points. Okay, let me turn Susan to you. Talk about South Asia. I mean, the United States um, has not been you know perhaps as large a player as the two big countries in the region, India and, and China. But uh, what can the United States and other European uh, other Asian um, partners uh, do more effectively, or what would your advice be? 
So my advice uh, for the U.S. in particular, because I think European partners and uh, Japan in particular, uh, they have done quite a good job in the region. Um, for the U.S., I would suggest that we be more ideologically consistent mm. and, um, and in fact make sure that more of the assistance we give reaches the ground. So mm. emblematic of this is U.S. engagement in Pakistan, right? Um, we have a, a, a tremendous portion of the aid and other assistance we have given has gone to further our strategic goals, uh, and that involves sometimes giving, in fact, often giving aid to the Pakistani military. But then on the other hand, we sit there and criticize their democracy, right? Um, and it is the Pakistani military that has often overthrown democracy in this area. Despite that, I think your average person does still think relatively highly of the United States and the opportunities that it provides, but we're constantly tempering it with our actions, right? <laughs> um, just two years ago, when Imran Khan uh, was facing a no-confidence vote, he was alleging U.S. interference in, um, in that uh, sort of democratic process, right? And it's not that I actually believe that was true, it's that it did resonate to people on the ground that the U.S. would interfere in the region in that way. Um, so I would just, I would suggest um, more ideological consistency in the region. Great, okay, Richard. Um, uh, the United States in Southeast Asia, uh, there's been a lot of criticism of the lack, the sort of pulling back of a trade and commercial mm -hmm. diplomacy. Um, the administration, uh, the Biden administration has made some, some attempt to make up some ground with the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, IPEF. Um, but how would you assess uh, th their efforts so far? And you know, what would your advice be? And let me fold in a question from the audience, um, since we are running short on time, uh, which, which also is sort of relevant, because the United States' approach to the region has focused heavily on ASEAN, I yeah. think, ASEAN engagement. You haven't really talked much about ASEAN in your remarks, but one of our audience members asks, um, can you speak to the role of ASEAN vis-a-vis -vis China and the US as a regional bloc and its approach to engagement with China? So is ASEAN, a useful, you know, platform for the United States to really focus on, or is it, you know, you've mentioned a lot of really uh, sexy countries, in your yeah. word, uh, that are rising. Um, is it, you know, do you think the bilateral approach might be more important? Yeah, Th thank you, 30 seconds. No, actually, I have ASEAN <laughs> here. There's a reason why I didn't mention ASEAN. It's like, oh, I'm gonna get into hot waters and all. Um, <laughs> you can check my latest Nikkei Asia piece on how we're trying to get around limitations of ASEAN. I mean, first of all, I think, um, it is true that just showing up is not enough, although sometimes even that doesn't happen. You have to bring something really forward. But as I said, we also have the pledge trap situation on the part of China. So our joke is that the IPF is America's version of a pledge trap or, or America doing it the ASEAN way, right? Oh. Like vague frameworks and then leave it down the road to deal with it. So I'm glad that there's that mutual strategic learning. Uh, in the meantime, <laughs> while we're figuring out what to do with you know all the structural constraints to market access issues and all. So I think there's growing realism both in ASEAN and also in the U.S. about what are the limitations, but let's work around that. But speaking of strategic learning, I mean, just look at, I just look at the relationship between my country and the United States. The past decade has been transformational. A decade ago, we were not even clear what, what does the mutual defense treaty really mean in the context of South China Sea. My God, we have moved. This is a quantum leap from where we were 10 years ago since I've been coming in and out throughout the years. And on the bilateral level, I think there's a lot of realism about imperfections of political system in the region. The, the, the democracies we have in the region, the TikTok populism we have. Mm -hmm. So there's, I think, more mutual understanding and respect that there was not there before, and, and nuances and, and subtlety in American diplomacy that perhaps was not there before for, for many reasons. I'm not here to point fingers. As far as ASEAN is concerned, um, ASEAN has all of its virtues, right? <laughs> we, ha we can have a long conversation about it. But as far as dealing with high stakes geopolitical issues like South China Sea is concerned, I'll say it again, it's just north of useless. Um, so um, that is where I believe mini lateralism is the way forward. You know, Philippine and Va Vietnam working together uh, for a maritime agreement. Philippine, Indonesia, and Vietnam working uh, together on their own version of a code of conduct. 
the U.S. dealing with key countries in the ASEAN, I hate using that word because it's politically incorrect, key countries, but let's be honest, like, you know, when you talk about South China Sea, when you talk about geopolitics in the region, it's Vietnam, Indonesia, Philippines, Singapore, those kinds of countries. I think there has to be an appreciation of limits of ASEAN, but also the huge potential of ASEAN minilateralism and minilaterally dealing with them. And lastly, I think there has to be also sometimes a, uh, honest conversations. Like, I know you guys, you don't want to make choices, you want to make the most out of this, but push comes to shove, right? Uh, who do you think is really the threat to you in the region? As, last time I checked, the U.S. doesn't have maritime territorial disputes with Vietnam, with the Philippines. My goodness, even the Indonesians have problems with China right now because their nine dash line is going all the way to North Natuna Sea. So that reality has to be reminded that you know uh, uh, China may sound more understanding and all of that, but you have some fundamental territorial and maritime issues that you don't have with us Americans. You can talk about what happened 100 or 50 years ago and all of that. That's important because I think the Global South, now I want to go back to our title, the Global South discourse is weaponized by China consistently to push their own version. But believe me, their understanding of multipolarity is not the same as us in ASEAN. For us, multipolarity is more agency, more room for conversation, an inclusive, pluralistic international order. China's version of multipolarity is post-American, more Pax Sinica. So we have to be absolutely clear about that and push back against the weaponization of the post-colonial discourse. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we are over time, so we have to close this panel. We could probably talk about the region all day, um, but we are out of our time. So I want to thank our panel and ask the audience to remain seated while the next panel gets seated. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That was fun. That was a great time management.
Rose Jackson, the director of the Democracy and Tech Initiative at the Atlantic Council's Digital Forensic Research Lab. And I'm excited to be here today for a panel focusing on questions of technology and geopolitical competition and how that manifests uh, throughout the world. I think part of why we're having this conversation is that technology has become ubiquitous in life. It's required for business, innovation, engaging with our friends and families, participating in democracy in forms of government, emergency response, and I could go on. And so it's no surprise that it has become one of the main spheres of geopolitical competition. However, in that context, you have kind of two competing models increasingly of norms and interconnected ways of operating. One is the long-standing tradition around a free, open, secure, and interoperable internet that requires there to be certain shared standards and practices. The other is a growing model that is often pushed by authoritarian countries, including China, that opts for a more sovereign control of an internet in which a state has the ability to set the rules and boundaries that breaks down the ability for interoperable approaches. While that geopolitical competition plays out at a higher level, often countries fall into a trap of treating the rest of the world as a domain of that competition as opposed to countries in their own right with their own agency and interests. If you are approaching this conversation from the perspective of wishing to maintain a free, open, secure, and interoperable internet, something that certainly at the Digital Forensic Research Lab we endorse, then it becomes even more important to honestly assess the ways in which the rest of the world is walking into this conversation. And so in the midst of this conference that is focusing explicitly on questions of how, quote, the global south, increasingly called sometimes the global majority or G77, have their very own vested interests in walking into an increasingly digital world becomes a necessity for the success of democracy, of human rights, of innovation, competition, and open markets, and all of the things that I think here we wish to advance. So today to have this conversation, we're lucky to be joined by a really interesting panel of experts, uh, four people that you're gonna hear from momentarily, starting with uh, Noor Luang, who is a non-resident fellow at the Global China Hub, also at the Atlantic Council, as well as a senior research analyst at Georgetown Center for Security and Emerging Technology. Noor focuses on China's science and technology ecosystem, including its approach to and development of AI and other emerging technologies. We also have Alina Noor, who's a senior fellow at the Asia program at Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, where she focuses on the impact of technology on power, governance, and nation building in Southeast Asia. We have Chris Schroeder, who's a leading global venture capitalist with particular focus on emerging markets. Chris co-founded Next Billion Ventures and has a long record of leadership in business, innovation, and geopolitics. And finally, Conrad Tucker, who is the director of CMU Africa, the Associate Dean for International Affairs Africa at the Carnegie Mellon University, and will be speaking to us today uh, as well. So you don't wanna hear from me, I wanna to get to this conversation. So perhaps I can throw out first for all the panelists, uh, a starting point of how are you seeing this geopolitical conversation that I think we can say even from the US standpoint from the Trump years to the Biden years, there seems to be a pretty significant focus on China in general and a context or conversation around it's China or the United States. Have you seen any meaningful change in how that conversation has been received or is manifesting in the parts of the world that you work in uh, and how countries are contending with that? Can I start with you? Yeah, absolutely. And first of all, thank you so much for having me today. Um, and I, in my work, as you said, I do look a lot at uh, Chinese um, SNT ecosystem, but also how China has been engaging with the rest of the world um, to meet its own ambitions in, for example, leadership in AI or 5G, in other technologies as well. Um, and to answer your question, what we've been observing so far is, you know, when it comes to US policies towards China, there's now a conversation about how do we first defend you know, technologies from being used by the Chinese government for you know, certain things, for example, you know, human rights abuse or surveillance or for military purposes, anything that has to do with national security. How do we defend our technologies from being misused? But at the same time now, the, the, the other side of that policy is also more focused on how do we promote technology development 
within the United States, but also how do we increase more collaboration with allies and partners. And that includes the Global South, as you said, the, you know, the, the Global 77, um, or the Global Majority, um, however we want to define that today. Um, <laughs> But be a you know, popcorn of references throughout our conversation. Absolutely, um, and you know, um, so so those are the two kind of um, uh, policies that are working hand in hand. And I think you know the conversation now is, especially we're seeing the Indo-Pacific uh, strategy as well coming from the United States, that the United States cannot do this alone, right? The competition with China, or you know, in general, developing technologies um, for you know societal benefit, for economic development, for national security. All these three components are important to a nation, and we cannot do this alone. So we have to work to collaborate with with other allies and partner countries that are also um, share the same interests. Thank you. Uh, perhaps I can turn next to uh, Conrad Tucker, uh, if you want to take that first question. Great, and uh, thank you for having me on the um, program. So our mission here uh, in Africa, in Rwanda, is an education and uh, capacity building uh, mission. And what we're seeing is a, a misunderstanding of, of, of where, you know, the, what is the role of uh, academia uh, as a neutral uh, education mission body. So we currently have over 19 uh, African countries represented in our student body. And a lot of what we do is the transformation of uh, the inclusive digital transformation of Africa. Now, when you think about what that entails, it's a stack of technologies which include uh, hardware, the networks that these technologies uh, use to communicate, and also examples such as AI algorithms that are built on top of these networks. So when we talk about uh, competition um, between China and the US, where do these different technologies fit in, uh, on either side of the spectrum? And that sometimes puts universities at, in a very challenging uh, position where we have students from all around the world. Our mission is to educate and disseminate content. Uh, academia is uh, known for a free flow of students and ideas and once we start having these uh, embargoes or constraints how are we supposed to educate um, students or what message are we supposed to be communicating in terms of their ability to collaborate freely uh, across the world so those are just some of the observations that we're experiencing here on the ground and uh, again this is a very timely conversation to be having thank you nor perhaps you can also shed some, some light on how you're seeing this geopolitical dynamic and conversation, particularly the approach from the United States uh, in, in focusing on China, how that's showing up or if that's changed at all uh, on the ground in the countries that you're working in. Uh, thanks, Rose. I'm gonna assume that question was to me. Um, Look, I think I so I work in Southeast Asia. I work on Southeast Asia as a Southeast Asian. I think it's a complex landscape and depending on who you speak to, which countries you speak to about what types of technology, it is going to render you very different answers. And I think this reductiveness that's been created by a geopolitical bifurcation of the tech landscape, primarily by the US and China, is causing quite a bit of anxiety on the ground in many countries in Southeast Asia. There are countries that are going to take advantage of this rivalry between the two powers, particularly in uh, the semiconductor chip space. And you see that with Malaysia and Vietnam, for example, kind of surging ahead. Uh, the other countries trying to cash in on some of the developments uh, taking place within the United States, such as the IRA, um, Inflation Reduction Act, but also some of the onshoring efforts that are also being developed uh, by the United States. But then I think in general, there is this unease about how this technological competition is going to play out in the long run and what that means for interoperability of technologies in Southeast Asia, but also uh, a harmonization of governance and policy frameworks that may or may not take place if the United States and China decide to go their own ways. I would also challenge this idea that there are only kind of two spheres of democracy and authoritarianism. You know, because we're seeing this particularly with the Brussels effect, for example, in the, in the data protection privacy space, there are norms that are being formulated and, and um, 
being explored by other countries such as India that are trying to kind of patch some kind of their own framework together. Um, and this whole idea of you know democracy on the one side and authoritarianism on the other side really doesn't sit well in a region like Southeast Asia. Thank you. Uh, a lot for us to dive into off of that, but I first want to make sure, Chris, you can take this opening question as well. Um, curious how you're seeing the U.S. kind of focus on China and framing uh, show up or change over time in the places that you've been working. Well, firstly, let me add to the thanks for those of you in uh, putting this together and the Atlantic Council on this phenomenal panel. I mean, in many respects, I'd rather just sit and listen to my compatriots here overall. Uh, let me come at it just a little bit differently. It might be additive in two ways. Um, and more from the bottom up of the look of entrepreneurs and the startup uh, worlds generally. I mean, the first is, at one level, I hate the term global south because it paints with such a broad brush. But the fact is, in startups, there's a lot of truth in it. There's actually more shared in emerging markets among tech startups, I think, with among themselves than there is even with Silicon Valley. Um, and China is a former emerging market, so they actually have a shared language in a way that's very powerful. Right before COVID, I actually spent some time in China with 17 very, very growth stage companies in fintech uh, from Latin America, Southeast Asia, and Nigeria, and they met with Ant. Seventy percent of the conversation was the same, and almost none of it would have happened in Silicon Valley or uh, New York. You know, how do you navigate ever-changing regulation? How do you deal with complexity and logistics and moving things? How do you educate populations that use fintech, 70 percent of whom uh, have never had a, a bank account? And so it, it was a really interesting shared dynamic that unifies them. And it leads to my second observation, because among the hundred things that I've gotten wrong in thinking about China and all this, is that I thought that this was indicating a huge wave of Chinese venture capital coming to emerging markets. And the evidence really isn't there right now. And so the question is why? And just a couple of observations to, to look at. I think, firstly, we just have to make a difference between venture capital and tech startups and then the huge juggernauts. Because the huge juggernauts, particularly in infrastructure, are showing up massively. Huawei and the like have a very, very large plan, of course, across these markets overall. We all should be watching BYD very carefully right now because they are very specifically looking at countries with both proclivity, desire, and regulation pushing for adoption of EV and things like that. Uh, early stage expansion into these markets uh, initially was often about just reaching Chinese there, WeChat really was focused not on making Brazilians uh, using WeChat, but on the 20 million Chinese who were there to be able to use it. But at the same time now, WeChat has opened massive data centers in Singapore, not because they're just hedging their bets, as a lot of Americans think, but because they think that's a very good platform to be able to offer services uh, globally overall. TikTok is kind of in a category of its own, and the big consumer players like Xi'an and all are, are trying to follow that playbook, I think, in a way. They all you know, realize that America is a fantastic market if you can get there, but it's blocked. The rest of the world's a pretty big place as well. And I think in the end, venture capital in China has been asking itself a very basic question. It's a, one of opportunity costs. Should I back a startup in Sao Paulo or Jakarta, or should I just go to a great entrepreneur that's doing something really powerful in a second, third city in China, which is just as large and maybe more understandable overall? Having said that, there is a tremendous amount of money that is being deployed among Chinese companies that look to market expansion, like the other ones that I mentioned before. So they may not want to be involved, in, they may not want to be involved in Brazil with a Brazilian startup as they did with Didi as much, but they certainly are looking at companies who want to invest in a global, in the way that Alibaba has done, she and has done, Timu is absolutely looking at all these companies as already in dozens of actually developed countries. So that will keep playing. And the last observation really is, you know, what does America play in all of this? And I think America has two sort of premises. One of it is particularly with technology like AI, like if there's a divide, that's fine by them. Like this is something that they look at as a divide and hard to find common ground. And secondly, there's a premise, particularly in Silicon Valley, that um, centralized plan and innovation isn't a thing and that they will still be competitive because of the dynamics that we've relied on in America for 20 or 30 years. And I think it's going to be very interesting to see how much that actually plays out, particularly in AI, but in technology more broadly. Thank you. Um, so I want to dig into a few pieces of that. Uh, and let's maybe work our way down to actually doing what we said we wanted to in the beginning of taking countries uh, on their own terms. And Nora, I wonder, picking up a little bit on something that Chris was just talking about, you know, he's talking about the expectation that there would have been more venture capital or certain kinds of investment flowing from China into these places. Mm -hmm. um, You've done some work on kind of understanding the differences or realities of kind of the Chinese 
uh, Chinese companies and the commercial sector, uh, which some people will often conflate and make the assumption that any company out of China is essentially the Chinese government, which is, of course, not the case. Um, but I'm curious if you could shed some light on how you're seeing that show up in some of these places, the role that Chinese companies are playing in both the advancement of Chinese strategies in these countries, but also kind of investments and engagement on their own terms. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, you know, to answer this, this question, first I think we need to take a look at um, the relationship between Chinese companies and the PRC just more broadly um, and to take a look at how that actually plays out within China. And I, I do want to say this very, very clearly in the beginning that um, the relationship between these two entities are increasingly blur. Obviously, there's there's definitely more aligned interests than, than we can imagine um, or compared to, you know, Western um, companies and, and Western governments. Um, but at the same time, I don't think we should over-index the amount of, um, or the, in, the extent of, of which Chinese companies are influenced by the Chinese government. The, the relationship um, or the direction of influence goes both ways, right? Um, the Chinese company can also lobby the Chinese government to, to also you know, meet their own interests, um, their business interests, they are profit motivated. Even SOEs can also lobby the Chinese government to do certain, uh, to shape the policy. So the, the two directions are, are um, something to be uh, noteworthy as well. That being said, um, when Chinese companies go abroad, and they are encouraged to go abroad, Right, um, Chinese government has put out you know strategies, and we can see, clearly see that in the um, 2017 AI development plan um, that put out by the state, the state council. In that strategy, there's a section where the Chinese government is encouraging, um, or has stated explicitly that uh, Chinese companies, especially AI companies, should be going out and expand abroad in order to leverage um, you know other countries' capabilities. Um, in, a, in a similar you know sense that um, companies are going abroad to expand to different markets, like, like Chris said, um, and also to take advantage of other countries' ecosystem. And so, you know, that, that is similar to what we see traditionally. Um, and so, um, uh, and to, to Chris's points as well, um, you know, there's a lot of Chinese money going abroad and um, expanding their, their market. But at the same time, in my research, you know, there, when, when we talk about private sector investment and venture capital private, private equity investment, there is less Chinese money in Southeast Asia. Um, and uh, there's actually more money coming from Chinese companies and Chinese uh, venture capitalists in the United States, right? Mm -hmm. um, the United States is the most uh, attractive destination because the, the AI market here is quite mature and more, uh, more dynamic than other places. Um, so that, that is something to be um, noting as well. Um, but what's important in the future that I am also tracking and moderating as well is that, you know, the more the more the U.S. Has, uh, you know, put more restriction on Chinese capital flowing in and out of the United States, the more we might be able to see that, um, you know, and this is the prediction, uh, not to say that, you know, it's, this is highly speculative, um, <laughs> but based on, you know, trends that we see so far is that um, Chinese companies may be looking towards other places to invest. Um, and to take advantage of, you know, um, uh, especially as the Chinese economy is slowing down, especially as, you know, the United States is putting more restriction, um, you know, when, when it comes to outbound investment screening, for example, we might see those, those um, trends um, coming up in the, in the near future. Thank you. Um, Alina, I'm actually curious, picking up on that, um, you know, the, A, the potential for increased investment, Chinese investment coming into the region, uh, whether that's something you are seeing uh, people kind of anticipating or trying to encourage. And also if you could speak to potentially even just like regionally. So looking at the role of ASEAN and um, how states together are navigating that. Are you seeing just even in this innovation space uh, uh, a difference in how countries are trying to either approach opportunities for whether it's American venture capital investment or Chinese investment or frankly completely other sources. Uh, what is it looking like where you are? I don't want to be crass, especially so early this morning on the West Coast of the United States, but, you know, money is money, right? And so uh, <laughs> Southeast Asian countries are in this race to develop their economies, particularly coming out of uh, COVID. And uh, uh, while there's been significant U.S. investments over at least two decades in the region, um, the U.S. remains one of the top three, if not top two, um, FDI, FDI uh, partners for Southeast Asia, 
there's also increasingly a lot of Chinese investment coming in. Um, I don't have the numbers on me, but um, I, it's it's clear that there are governments in Southeast Asia that are very keen on encouraging um, Chinese investment, both at the upstream level as well as the downstream level. You see this, for example, with Indonesia and the Philippines um, pitching their, their raw minerals for EV batteries, for example. Um, there are already significant Chinese investors in mines, in uh, nickel mines in Indonesia to make that happen. Um, but again, I, I think um, it, for Southeast Asia, it's really about gaining investment, whether it's from Japan, Korea, um, the United States, or China, or anywhere else. And uh, so there's an agnosticism about where the money comes from to a certain extent, uh, the, the whole ideological baggage that is often imposed upon the region from the outside is not shared uh, by governments in the region itself. Thank you. Um, Conrad, I wonder if I could take a slight tweak on this. So as, as you mentioned, you are leading a research and educational institution in Rwanda. Um, and there's certainly been likewise investments both in bringing African students to China as well as investments in training and opportunities from China on the continent. I'm curious if you can speak a little bit about how you're seeing China show up in the educational space and how that matches in some ways to some of the kind of pipeline work, uh, development of, of skills and opportunities uh, in, in the spaces that you're operating. Uh, thank you for the question. So, so two fronts. Um, the first is access to uh, software and services that we use in our education um, programs. Uh, it's, it's no surprise why uh, many uh, firms either have reduced education um, pricing uh, because the students then become go on to become the managers and, and then you have that uh, pipeline and uh, immediate connection to the technology. Uh, we're also seeing a lot of students uh, we're seeing some of our uh, current students who are enrolled who got their um, undergrad or grad studies um, from China. And the question is, is the U.S. providing as many opportunities uh, for African students to study in the U.S.? Or let's take the, the process of uh, attaining uh, visas or the, the rate in which uh, visas are denied to students. All of these contribute to the decisions as to where African students go uh, in pursuit of their education. So I think there are a few tangible steps that we can take to um, establish more of a long-term uh, relationship with uh, African talent. It's not just a short-term transactional uh, relationship, or at least in my opinion, it shouldn't be. And if we are successful in forming these long-term relationships, then when we think about the products, services, technologies that would be adopted across the continent, uh, there may be an increased likelihood that that would be more uh, US uh, leaning because our students then become the technology leaders across the continent. Thank you. Uh, it's an interesting framing to say, you know, the competition conversation that we so often have is the idea of like markets between China and the United States. Uh, and reframing that to say competition over talent and, and people moving into these ecosystems is a, a useful frame. Um, I guess in that context, Chris, I, I would love to hear a little bit more about as you are looking for opportunities in many of these countries to support burgeoning uh, startups uh, and moving uh, the investment opportunities forward, um, what do you think that people are missing about those opportunities, whether it is pathways to connections with other markets, educational opportunities, simply access to capital, et cetera? What are the opportunities taking many of the kind of innovators and businesses on their own terms in these countries? Uh, what are people missing? I think in many respects, uh, what is missing is that even in your use of the word burgeoning, because in a lot <laughs> of these markets, these are not burgeoning, like they are leaders. I mean, I would make an argument that if you wanted to find one of the top neo no. uh, Brazil and Latin America and, and not here. And, um, you know, I think, again, Silicon Valley will argue, well, a lot of the, the technology which is used in mobile payments and in things like neo banking were actually started in America and are, are American enterprises. But the fact is, in these markets where there was nothing before, there's a great leapfrog going on. And that means that there's really world-class innovation, because we all know on this call, talent is everywhere. 
and the idea that two-thirds of humanity has access to a supercomputer in their pocket and all the software tools and AI to be able to uh, leverage their businesses in very powerful ways means that we need to look at it uh, on par. You go to Southeast Asia now, and it's, uh, just, it's just the energy there is astounding, and the talent is astounding, and they're solving very big problems for a region that in many respects isn't even a region, right? It's, it's not one country, one sort of land with one language, but multiple cultures and multiple histories and whatever, and you still have companies like Grab and others who've been able to figure out how to develop uh, multiple services across those countries. Uh, right now, you're not going to hear about amazing startups in, you're not going to hear about amazing startups in the Middle East because the United States will tend to cover everything in the world from doom or disaster or, or problems are going forward. But the fact is amidst great challenges around the world, young people are rising and using their access to software and their innovation and their dissatisfaction that they don't have the services that they think they could have uh, and are being unleashed. And so I really think in a sentence, what people misunderstand is that they they got to they got to get on a plane more, because when you're on the ground, it looks completely and utterly different than what we tend to see even in social media here, let alone in traditional media, and its ramifications bottom up are revolutionary. Thank you. Um, I think I would I would be um, uh, maybe perhaps questioned for having the job that I have if I didn't have a little bit of a conversation on questions of democracy and rights. Uh, particularly in the context of some uses of, of technology, uh, both American commercial and Chinese government technologies that are, uh, you know, using surveillance, leveraging all sorts of extractive tools, et cetera. And so I'm curious because it feels like sometimes we can have two completely separate conversations where people can come to uh, an understanding of what we were just talking about, that there are opportunities in these spaces, there are business chances, these are markets, uh, but that when we get to the discussion on individual rights and liberties or universal concepts of, of rights and this interconnected internet, that it's almost like it's a completely different conversation, even though you know, I certainly open markets depend on interoperability and all of those those values. I'm curious, though, since this is where it seems to be that the tension hits and often where a country walking in talking about rights issues so misses the mark is in failing to address or acknowledge the very real and human desire for anyone in a country to simply have the most basic opportunities uh, and to participate in a global economy. What is it from the spaces that you are all working in that you think are areas where there would be better opportunity to talk about what are people's innate interests in being able to have control, for instance, over their data, uh, the ability to actually have control over a software stack, agency and access to internet connectivity, et cetera. Um, it seems like these are separate conversations and I would love to be told that I'm wrong, um, but I would be really interested in your thoughts with the communities that you're working in. How would you approach those questions so that it isn't taken as either separate or zero sum discussions? Um, I kind of can throw that open, whoever wants to take that really difficult question first. Uh, and if I'm met with awkward silence, then I'll just choose someone. <laughs> awkward silence, great. We'll, no, I'll we'll go. Start. I'll, I'll happily go. <laughs> we'll can, start can, I, can I start? Oh, Chris wanted to say something. Oh. I'll, I'll jump in right after no, Chris. No, you go first. You go first. No, I didn't know. It was oh. actually, I created a, a, a competition for the tough That's answer. Right. This is great. Chris, go ahead. No, no, no. Let, no, no, uh, no, no go ahead. Go ahead, Chris. I'll go after you. I'm now no, taking no, my let, moderator prerogative and I am forcing Chris to answer. Okay, just, I mean, just sort of briefly, and you, you, you cannot find anyone you know, who's more enthusiastic and pro-democracy than I am, okay? And so I'm reporting and not editorializing when I say this, which is at least when you, from the lens of the innovation economy overall, what people are looking is for governance that delivers the goods. And if the government delivers the goods, they're actually very focused on building what they're building. And, and if the governance is not delivering the goods, then you start hearing very different kinds of conversations. Some of the times, as I think, um, uh, you know, pointed out before, maybe about democracy or not democracy, but actually it's often about anti-incumbency or just concerns about goods not being delivered. In my world, goods are mean, you know, a rule of law and ability to build something and to be able to bring capital to bear and then get capital out if it's successful are the things that I think drive people very much. But there's also, I think, a wariness and an understanding that at the end of the day, if I can be clipped in the way I communicate, I may be clipped or my regulation may be unpredictable in another way. So you definitely get the push and you pull you in that effect. But I can tell you without any argument 
that it when governance fails in a go to deliver the goods to be viewed at best as incompetent and maybe as worse as a rigged game that everything then starts to open up, whether it's on the business and economic side, but certainly on the string you're pulling on about whether democracy. By the way, if democracy doesn't deliver the goods, I think we see a lot of things happening over the world that sort of confirms my overarching thesis. Thank you. Alina. Yeah, I mean, I would second uh, what Chris said. It's really about governance legitimacy, government legitimacy in many of these countries uh, that I focus on in Southeast Asia. But I'm, I'm going to take a different angle. You know, we often hear a lot of rhetoric about democracy and rights when we're dealing with Western partners. By we, I mean like us in Southeast Asia. And that's fine. I, you know, I think we should all aspire to, to greater goals. Uh, but I think the reality that we often see and experience is, is very different because a lot of the surveillance technologies, for example, there's a lot of talk about China exporting a lot of surveillance tech. Uh, but really, China wasn't, isn't the first one to do this and has been preceded by many democracies in the West. And the West still continues to export a lot of surveillance tech for very repressive um, goals. And so I think there is this huge dissonance when it comes to us in Southeast Asia listening to the rhetoric of these ideals on the one hand and being told that we have a choice between techno-authoritarianism on the one hand and you know complete freedom and democracy on the other. It just it just rings very hollow, I'm sorry to say. May I add just a quick story to that? Yeah. I, I, I never forget talking to some Latin American uh, entrepreneurs, just happened to be Latin America, and I asked them, all things being equal, if you could get Amazon Cloud, you know, AWS, or if you could have Ali Cloud, and Ali Cloud was 25% less, which would you do? And they cut me off mid-sentence and said, forget 25%. If the customer service is great and if the service works really, really well, and it's even slightly less, of course, we're going to take AliCloud. And I, they could tell I looked shocked by that, as most Americans are shocked by that. And they said, look, you know, trust AWS 100% either. So we just have to be able to rely on service. We know what data we're going to put on any cloud anyway. So we're always a little bit conservative in that way. But I found that uh, answer quite consistent with what uh, Lena just said. And it's something that Americans don't want to hear but it's worthy of at least understanding it and then reaching conclusions you want to conclude with that data. Thank you. Does anyone else want to take the unpleasant question? Yeah, I'll jump in real quick. Excellent. Um, to also, you know, um, emphasize the, the two points that have been made by the other two panelists, by Chris and Alina. Um, you know, on the point about governance, um, there's there's a framework that, the, you know, Saudi, ASEAN has already come out um, with on AI, for example. And, you know, if you, look, if you take a look at that framework very closely, there's a lot of concerns over, for example, deep fake, you know, generative AI, um, and what it can do to society if it's not regulated really well. So there, there, there are definitely concerns over the development of technologies that are going to be used for for harms, for harmful ways, or, or you know, there are risks associated with that kind of um, unregulated technolo technological development. So these countries are already, and to the point about agency, these countries are thinking about, you know how to regulate their own technology development in-house, and also how do, we, how do they um, you know, approach collaboration at a, at a broader level too, you know, both the you know, engaging with the business community and the investment community, but also the research community as well, to Conrad's point, that there are um, absolute opportunities for people-to-people -people exchange, um, you know, university-to-university -university relationship as well. And in my research, we, we also you know, looked at research collaboration between um, you know, researchers in this country as well. And um, the research community is an open one, and, and it, it benefits from you know, having open access to, to um, research that's been published, that's been you know, shared and cited um, by one another. So there is this tension between how do we maintain that open uh, research community, but also think about ways to minimize harms right, that are associated with you know, um, uh, technologies that are developed for, for harmful purposes. So that's a really challenging, um, you know, I, and I definitely applaud the people that have to come up with policy around <laughs> this, um, you know, in all of these com countries and also, you know, at the international level. So that, that is still an ongoing um, challenge that we have to address. Thank you. Um, Conrad, I both want to give you a chance to answer this question. And since I know you have a hard stop and we are coming close to time, have you kick off what will be closing comments from all of our panelists as we have about a minute left. Uh, so I'll kick it to you. So I think uh, you know, my, my takeaway is, is sums it up what, what Chris 
said earlier, get on a plane. It's difficult <laughs> to understand peoples and cultures uh, virtually. And, it, uh, and as much as we can engage in this way, I think we are all, uh, to some extent, don't have the complete picture. Uh, Africa, in many, in many uh, sense and purposes, is at the uh, nascent stages of developing policies around AI, for example. So rather than staying on the sideline until uh, an adversary or a, a competing nation comes in, let's, let's be proactive and, and start engaging now. Uh, Rwanda is one of the few countries that has developed an AI policy. Uh, we should, as the U.S., be uh, collaborating and being proactive so that our partners uh, in Africa and the Global South uh, see us as strategic partners that are helping to co-create, not this top-down approach, but actually co-creating and understanding their context so that we're seen as collaborators as opposed to competitors. So with that, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to serve on this panel with my uh, esteemed colleagues. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, last, last thoughts, parting thoughts, uh, Alina. I would add a plus two to that, get on the plane um, uh, urge. And uh, if you can't do that, then talk to people in the region and from the region. Um, look, you know, even as a Malaysian who resides in the United States, when I go back to my home country, when I go back to Southeast Asia, I am flummoxed by the level of advances in just over a few months. You know, I feel like a dinosaur entering the digital <laughs> age with everybody having payments on their phones. And, you know, we still use credit cards here in the United States. Um, so I, I would say that the landscape is a lot more robust. It's a lot more complex than what we often reduce it to be here in the United States. So talk to people and travel. Excellent. Uh, parting thoughts, Chris. I, I, I think people have already touched on the, the important themes. Uh, I would just sort of add that it was actually quite a senior person in Singapore said to me last spring, you know how is the best way for America to compete? And I said, what? And he said, the best way to compete is to compete. And what he means by that is that, that there's almost this proclivity that government policy should be a fiat in its fear of China and whatever else. And in fact, what government policy should be is unleashing the very strengths that every country has on its own terms. It's true not just of America, but all the countries we're talking to. And I think you can almost predict where countries will be 10 years from now by how the governance is embracing the developments we've talked to and made it made things happen overall. And I think that's a big lesson for America, um, as well as it is for every country we've talked about now. And then secondly, um, you know, things are in flux all the time, as, uh, as uh, Lena pointed out. And so five years ago, China looked at and ascended. I was with, on the phone with a Chinese entrepreneur uh, early this morning who was in a cab ride, and the cab driver was just completely livid about the economy there. You know, you hear stories of young people with, you know, 25 percent um, uh, unemployment and the economic slowdown is real. And, and China seems to want to be open for FDI, but also sending mixed signals to the marketplace. And so all these things are in flux. And I think the greatest way to opportunity is, are you, in fact, building things that are making a difference in people's lives, whether you're in governance or whether you're an entrepreneur in business? And that tends to be a pretty good North Star in either case. Thank you. And Noor? I'll keep it very concise. Um, you know, plus three to getting on the plane, but I would also say go to China as well if you want to understand, um, you know, if you want to study the country. I, I've had the opportunity to, to do field research there to gain a better understanding of how, you know, all of these stakeholders actually um, fit in, in the, the entire ecosystem. And I would also say that there's many players in the you know, so-called so uh, US and China tech competition. We're not only looking at the US and China. These are not the only players you know, in, in, the, um, in this space. So that's the reason why we're talking about you know, other important countries as well. So I do, I do want us to keep that in mind. Thank you so much. And thank you to all of the panelists, to those of you watching online, to those of you in the room. I believe I now get to give everyone a 10 to 15 minute break, which hopefully makes me a popular moderator. Uh, but this was wonderful and really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you.
Welcome back to all of you joining us here in our studios and around the globe. I'm Jonathan Panikoff. I'm the director of the Scowcroft Middle East Security Initiative here at the Atlantic Council. And I could not be more excited to have the opportunity to moderate this session's panel on China and the Middle East, especially given our panelists. Jonathan Fulton, who's on screen with us today, is an associate professor of political science at Zayed University in Abu Dhabi and a non-resident senior fellow for the Scowcroft Middle East Security Initiative. Among a large variety of published works, he's the author of China's Relations with Gulf Monarchies, which has become the baseline standard for those seeking to understand China's relationship in the Gulf. Dawn Murphy, with me here in person today, is an associate professor of national security strategy at the National War College, which is part of National Defense University here in Washington, D.C. A prolific author in her own right, her latest book is entitled China's Rise in the Global South, the Middle East, Africa, and Beijing's Alternative World Order. And I'm just realizing, given the title of this conference, we may owe you royalties on that. Um, our final panelist is Andrea Giselli, who is an assistant professor at the School of International Relations and Public Affairs at Fudan University and the head of research of the Talk China Hub's China Med Project. You'll find his research in a variety of journals. His latest book, Protecting China's Interests Overseas, Securitization, and Foreign Policy, came out just a few years ago. Welcome to you all. A lot to address and not a lot of time. So let me get right to it if I could. Jonathan, you're sitting in the Middle East in Abu Dhabi right now. Give us a broad overview today, if you would, as to your sense of how China is seeing the region. Well, first, Jonathan, thanks for, uh, for having me. Always a pleasure. Great to see you again. Great to see Don and Andrea. Um, so I should stress first, I'm in the Middle East. I'm in, in, in Abu Dhabi. So Andrea probably is better equipped to, to talk about what folks in China are thinking because he's actually there. Uh, I do a lot of reading of what Chinese people are saying, and uh, I'll start with a shameless plug. I host the China MENA podcast for the Atlantic Council, and uh, a new episode dropped earlier today. Um, I interviewed Andrea's com uh, colleague, Zhang Chu Chu, who's a, a Middle East specialist at Fudan University. And the focus of the, of the conversation was, how are folks in China perceiving uh, regional instability, uh, everything that's happened since October 7th, how's it affecting China's approach to the region, interest in the region, and uh, I can't recommend it highly enough. She gives a really great overview of China's interests and concerns, and I think it's a, a really good starting point for folks who, who want to know more about it. So just basically, I think if I'm looking at, you know, giving a perspective from the region, you know, looking at how um, what's been going on since the uh, Hamas attack on Israel, the subsequent war, the Houthi attack on, on Red Sea shipping, um, how is this affecting China's position in the region? I think generally you'd look at three broad baskets. How, do, how does it affect China's, China itself, China's domestic situation, particularly its uh, political economy? Uh, how is it affecting China's engagement in the region? Um, is it reshaping or is it re forcing a recalibra uh, recalibration of how folks in Beijing are thinking about the region? And then the broader geopolitical, systemic, great power competition stuff, which of course is always uh, the baseline of everything. So, you know, just thinking about how it's probably affecting China, we all know China's been undergoing quite a bit of um, economic stress uh, in, in recent years. Uh, this year it seemed much more acute with the real estate crisis, with high youth unemployment, um, if you are familiar, there's a website called Reading the China Dream where um, some, there's some translated um, articles uh, of, of what Chinese people are, are writing about or, or thinking about. And uh, the, the, the lead articles right now that have been translated, one is from the Beijing Review, which is just talking about how um, you know, educated youth are pursuing blue collar careers instead of chasing those elusive white collar jobs just because it's, it's getting harder and harder to find them and it's, it's seen as uh, kind of a, a waste of time to try to find that job. And the other one is talking about the, uh, the don't buy crowd, as in B-U-Y, um, just saying that, you know, with the economy and the shape it's in, a lot of people are turning to a less consumerist lifestyle, more saving, living simply. Um, I think it just speaks to some of the problems that China's facing economically right now. Um, and I think probably there's a sense that instability in the Middle East could exacerbate that. You know, um, the food, food and commodity prices were already uh, 
affected by by the war in Ukraine. If then we saw the uh, shipping costs increasing a lot with these attacks on the Red Sea. If there were to be a broader Middle East conflict, if it actually brought in the principal actors in the region, then I imagine oil prices would spike high. And, and for China, where they import between 40 and 50 percent of its crude from the Middle East, that would be a, a, a very big concern. Um, beyond that, I think there's still a sense of the Middle East as a place of economic opportunity. I've, I've written a lot about this, about how China does, looks, looks at the region primarily in economic terms. It does literally billions of dollars of contracting. Um, uh, a lot of Chinese SOEs are, are very active in the region. Middle Eastern countries' uh, vision development strategies align very neatly with China's Belt and Road Initiative and a lot of what the Belt, uh, well, a lot of what its uh, SOEs and construction firms are, are capable of doing. Um, so I think there's still a sense of the region as, a, as an opportunity. Uh, I think there's also a sense being here in Abu Dhabi, you know, one of the centers of, of Middle Eastern capital. We've seen, especially last fall, um, early this year, a lot of visitors from, from China. Um, representing companies, representing uh, investment groups, representing law firms who are trying, you know, uh, working with different uh, firms around China, looking for Gulf capital to work on joint investment projects. Uh, so I think there's also a sense of, of, of maybe flipping the narrative where a lot of folks think of China coming and investing in the Middle East and others saying, look, Middle East, we'd like you to, to invest in us as well. Um, there was a story that I saw just this morning about uh, work that, you know, the ground was broken on a petrochemical plant in Fujian province. And this is a, a joint project between a Fujian company in Sabic in Saudi, where the Saudis are, are, are up uh, 50, represent 51% of this. So, you know, you are seeing that kind of uh, engagement as well. Um, looking at the second basket, just how, how, chi how it's affecting China's view of the Middle East itself. Well, you know, beyond the billions of dollars in trade I mentioned and, and investment and contracting, uh, there's a huge Chinese expat population here. It's not really obvious. You'd have to be looking for it. Um, but I've talked to a bunch of people about this recently. Everybody's trying to do the math. Nobody knows exactly. General estimate is about half a million people, half a million Chinese people living in the Middle East right now. Um, a lot of that, most of that is in the Gulf. But um, you have to think that represents a pretty significant security concern if there were to be some kind of uh, escalation here. Um, we've seen since, um, you know, hostility or the war broke out in Gaza and since the Red Sea crisis, just the limitations on what China is able to do or willing to do in the region. There's always a sense in the U.S. that China could or should be doing more. People talk about the PLA support base in Djibouti as something that is a power projection um, China refers to this as a supply base. It's, it's meant to support its anti-piracy mission in the Gulf of Aden. And uh, I think we've seen a general reluctance of China to engage in this kind of stuff. Um, so I think when they look at the Middle East, uh, you know, beyond the economic opportunities, I think they also look at the instability as something that could really uh, threaten to undermine a lot of that. Um, the final basket, the broader geopolitical realm, a lot of the stuff I've been reading from Chinese academics or Chinese journalism, um, really looks at what's been happening since October 7th uh, from a perspective of U.S. hegemony. You know, what does this mean for um, U.S. capacity to act as a, a leading power in the Middle East? As, does it still have the capacity to, to, to order the region? And I think there's a general sense that that's not the case. Um, I think that might be early days. I think there's always a concern when you look at recent events. Uh, it's very easy to get caught up in the, the news cycle and, and anticipate the worst. Um, having lived in the Middle East since 2006, I've been through a lot of these cycles. And uh, I don't think, I, I don't know, maybe I'm naive, but I think things are, are, are not as dramatic as it, they necessarily seem right now, or at least in the, in the, the long term, I think probably uh, there's a tremendous desire among leading actors in the region to right the ship on this. Um, you know, all the narratives in the Middle East before October 7th were about de-escalation. Every leader in every country was talking only about development, only about building uh, sustainable economies, only about creating new industries and new jobs for their young population. Nobody, I think there's a, there's a sense that um, regional adventurism that we, that was such a common feature in a post Arab Spring um, was not getting the results anybody I hoped for. Um, so that leads me to hope, perhaps, again, perhaps naively, that 
some of the principal actors in the region are, are probably going to try to you know ease the temperature a little bit. Um, that said, China has rolled out a lot of um, alternative visions for how international politics would work if China had its preferences. A lot of these are are based, you know, are kind of as I'm sure you've all been talking about with this Global South uh, conference. A lot of it is is trying to garner support from the Global South, right? Things like the Global Security Initiative, the Global Development Initiative, these things that are saying China has a, a different approach to international politics and global governance. Um, I think the war in Gaza and uh, Western, generally Western support, specifically U.S. support for Israel, uh, really feeds into this narrative for China. Um, that said, I don't think it necessarily means that uh, this region is ripe for the plucking. I think the Global South, first of all, where I live in the Gulf, I don't think too many countries identify as Global South members. I think the idea, you know, that's often associated with developing countries and, you know, the Saudis and the Qataris and the Emiratis, I think, believe that they're, uh, you know, I, I don't think they self-identify that way. Um, I do believe that there's frustration with Western policy in the region. Um, there's frustration with U.S. policy in the region. There's frustration with uh, what Israel's been doing, um, obviously. Um, but I don't think that just necessarily results in, in countries bandwagoning with the Chinese vision. We saw during the G20 a few months ago when Prime Minister Modi talked about India as a leader of the Global South as well. And uh, I think India is often underappreciated as an actor, especially here in the Gulf. Um, so I think, you know, in the broad geopolitical realm, obviously this looks like an opportunity right now, um, but I don't think it's, it's, is, uh, you know, I, I, I would urge caution to anybody who, who's going to base policy on, on immediate events because I think things are, are pretty fluid here right now. I'll stop here. Uh, I know there's, I, I'm really interested to hear what uh, Don and Andre have to say, so I'm going to try to talk less and, and listen more. Thanks, guys. Jonathan, thanks for that overview. It actually is a, is a great segue, especially your last point, bringing up where we were from October 7th. Don, um, talk to us a little bit about that, if you could. How has China's approach changed or materialized since the October 7th terrorist attack by Hamas on Israel and the ensuing war that has happened. What clues do you think it's going to give us about Beijing's approach to the region in the future? So, Jonathan, thanks for having me here today. And I do need to start out just saying the views that I expressed today are my own. They don't represent the U.S. government in any way. So I think the way I look at it is continuity more than change. And I think it's important to provide a little bit of context, especially for the audience that may not be as um, familiar with China's stance regarding the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. So China views events since October 7th as this, you know, this Israel-Hamas war as a flare-up in the broader Palestinian-Israeli conflict. And so I want to say a few words about what China's, you know, stance has been on that. Um, in, during the Mao era, China was providing material support for the Palestinians, right? But since 1992, they've had robust state-to-state -state relations with Israel, as well as recognizing Palestine as a state since 1988. And at a high level, you know, since 1997, they've essentially had a consistent stance regarding the Palestinians, um, including establishing a special envoy over two decades ago in 2002 to try to contribute to resolution of this conflict. So at a high level, their stance is they want to see a two-state solution with an independent Palestinian state with East Jerusalem as the capital based on land for peace, based on pre-67 borders, and a cessation of Israeli settlements right, um, in occupied territories. So at a high level, China sees the Palestinian-Israeli conflict as the core threat, or has, I think, for a very long time, seen that conflict as the core threat to peace and stability in the Middle East. And it has consistently, for decades, criticized Israel for what China considers to be Israel's disproportionate response, as well as violations of international law. It is important to keep in mind also, I would say, this Palestinian-Israeli conflict and China's Palestinian-leaning stance in that has been a centerpiece of its interactions and political dialogues with Arab states, you know, for example, in cooperation forums and through other mechanisms. So China very much sees this as a longstanding principle, and I think there is quite a bit of continuity with 
um, they're even from the Mao era, right? This is one kind of legacy from that. That said, since 1992, China has had strong state-to-state -state relations with Israel and a robust economic um, and political relationship. So since October 7th, if you look at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, you look at um, Zhang Jun, who's the UN representative from China, right? If you look at um, Tsai Jun, who's the special envoy for the Middle East, if you look at Xi Jinping's statements, if you look at it, the behavior broadly, I would say there's been incredible consistency um, on that issue. So, so what has changed? One thing that has changed, I would say, is Israel's concerns regarding China's Palestinian-leaning behavior. Obviously, there's been a lot of concerns expressed from an Israeli perspective about China not criticizing Hamas explicitly for terrorist activity. That said, I do think it's important to look at that in historical context that China has, has not in the past referred to Hamas as terrorists, right? Has not referred to the Palestinians and is very careful in the ways in which it differentiates that. And although China doesn't frame it in this way in the current rhetoric, I think China still sees the Palestinians' use of violence as part of the national liberation struggle. Um, and so that, compared to China's behavior that we've talked about in other regions, I do think this is one you know, real continuity with the Mao era. I also you know, want to highlight that when we think about now and going forward, because you asked about clues yeah. going forward, right? So I think China's biggest concern right now is the escalation of what's happening in Israel um, with Gaza, turning into a much broader regional war, bringing in Hezbollah, bringing in the Houthi, you know, bringing in Iran in a more formal way. Um, I also think that China does not want to pick sides. And so this would be one case where obviously they're picking the Palestinian side. I mean, if this is a bit of a deviation in that way. Um, but I think they don't want to be drawn into regional conflict. And I do think that although they have a Palestinian leaning approach, given the ways in which they've been framing their critique, um, I do see indications that in the longer term they would want to see their relations with Israel on the economic and political front go back to what it was before, um, to kind of to Jonathan's point. I think it, ultimately there's a continuity of interests and a desire for this to stabilize and that China's interests in the region haven't changed, but they want to get past this conflict. Um, I would also say that China is playing up the U.S. role that I know we're going to talk about more. That absolutely is a dynamic. Um, and China is using this as a way to consolidate its support within the global south more broadly. But again, I do think it's important that China's behavior hasn't changed, but maybe the world has changed around China. I think that's a really helpful overview in terms of the Israel-Palestinian context here related to Beijing's thinking. You mentioned just here at the end um, the U.S. role potential tensions there, something, Andrea, that there's been a lot of focus on the last few years between Washington and Beijing and sitting here in Washington. Even if you're not somebody focusing on China, you feel it on almost a daily basis for every other part of the world or every functional topic. Earlier this week, Andrea, you wrote something that caught my eye, and, and I want to read it um, for the audience. You said when talking about the Middle East, you said the following, quote, Whatever reputational success China may have garnered arises from Washington's self-inflicted strategic blunders and incoherent policies on issues from Palestine to Yemen. If Beijing appears to score so many important diplomatic points in this moment, it is because, regardless of its motivations, it is taking a stance that is not uniquely Chinese. Andrea, are you saying, is your view then that there's an overestimation as to how much the U.S. is factoring into China's decision making and its approach to the Middle East. Walk us through your thinking um, and analysis on Beijing's decision making itself, <clears throat> not just related to the post-October 7th environment, but more broadly in the region, if you could. Sure. Um, okay. So just to uh, clarify, this um, uh, opened in the national. Um, that I, I course with uh, my friend Mohammed Al Sudairi. So it's it's a result of both be of both of us thinking. Um, anyways, um, the, the United States is definitely the I would say the one of the most, if not the most, um, factor in, in in how China approaches the Middle East. Um, I think, but but I think really the point that I, we Mohammed and I were trying to make 
um, in that specific article was um, actually not de-emphasizing the importance of the United States in Chinese decision making, but really um, I've been trying to say that um, if, if China now seems so much on the rise in the region, it's also because it's not really just much China, but something that also uh, Don, Don was mentioning a moment ago. But it, the, what China is doing is not particularly unique. It's simply the world changed, and Chinese position are popular at the moment, at least in, in large parts of the world. Um, now, um, as to, um, generally speaking, Chinese decision-making and the role of the United States when it comes to the Middle East, I think there's been um, quite a lot of debate. It's, of course, it's very difficult, really, to understand um, how everything happens in Beijing and how if and how every decision uh, takes place, what factors are, are considered which are not. Um, that said, there's definitely, from what you can see from open source, or like Jonathan was saying, from uh, articles written by Chinese scholars in the media or academic journals, um, I think it's possible to say there's been quite a lot of debate about what to do about the United States in the Middle East, uh, meaning um, should should there be a more open confrontation with the United States in the region? Um, should Beijing instead just keep a low profile, um, avoiding, um, again, the cost that uh, would come from such a direct confrontation? Um, clearly, uh, I believe that the the events of uh, the, the mass attack on, uh, on, on Israel on, on, in October probably pushed Beijing to um, adopt a more uh, to, to kind of seize the opportunity, to seize what he perceived as an opportunity to further blunt um, American influence in the region. Um, again, probably exploiting a bit what Mohammed and I wrote, that um, its position suddenly became very popular, and not just in the region, but also in other places um, of the world. Um, so probably there's been that, let's say, Beijing approach has shifted to, our, let's say, you could say more confrontation, but definitely uh, more eager to exploit that opportunity. Uh, that's why it's important also to say that for a long time there's also been some, some in China, some people in China that have been saying uh, we should be careful, however, because in any case the United States, even if not, is not as powerful as it used to be, it remains the most powerful extra-regional actor in the region, more than Russia, uh, more than us, for sure. Um, and so even though maybe it's not the hegemon anymore, it still has the capabilities to inflict substantial damage to our interests. Um, and so, and especially as the relationship with Washington has deteriorated over the years, there's been a constant fear, uh, you can see really in the articles in what Chinese scholars have been writing, of a potential connection between the United States Middle East policy and its East Asia or Indo-Pacific policy. So more kind of coordinated strategy of containment um, as, a, as something that, of course, a more uh, confrontation approach also on Beijing side could have fueled and accelerated. Uh, with some, um, and I'm thinking about an article that was published not a long time ago. It was re um, uh, on Chinese um, uh, blogs, and but also in, in academic journals, uh, written by Niu Xinchun, a very prominent expert in China. Uh, really kind of uh, trying to discuss these different options and positions um, and emphasizing how there was no really real choice, uh, and no really easy choice, sorry, um, for Beijing, whether to keep a more uh, low-key profile or just um, be more confrontational. Um, but that said, again, I think for, for the moment, uh, Probably China will try to see as much as possible this, the opportunity that um, a mass attack created, um, uh, especially as it's clearly uh, building its relations um, and strengthening the relations with Gulf countries. Um, it, it seems to me that it, this event is not seen as a is it, it is seen as a short-term obstacle to trends that Beijing sees playing out in the region. Um, the, those of this tension and so on that also Jonathan mentioned earlier. Uh, but in the long run, it, it, it seems to me that Chinese analysts expect things to go back on track. Uh, it will take a bit of time, uh, maybe not as 
smoothly as, as many expected, especially after the rapprochement between the Saudis and the Iranians. Um, but nonetheless, something that can, um, the situation probably will recover at a certain point. And if that happens, we diminish the American influence in the region even better. I don't think that um, anyone will be sad about that um, in Beijing. But they will definitely keep on uh, looking at uh, Washington moves. And I think this is quite clear if we look at uh, Beijing's reaction to the Houthis attacking the Red Sea. They're very firm in saying this is not about the Houthis per se, this is about, again, Gaza, the Palestinians, and Israel in the first place. So we cannot just address it directly. It should be the United States first changing course. And so I think they're going to push in, uh, in that direction. And this is clearly, again, um, evidence of how much uh, the United States and the bilateral relations with Washington are so important in determining uh, China's approach to the region. Thank you very much. I, I think, Jonathan, let me turn back to you because Andrea laid out, I, I think, a very, very thoughtful analysis in terms of China's goals and opportunities. But let me ask you a bit about impact, if I could. Um, you recently wrote something that, that also caught my eye. You said, referring to tensions specifically along the Red Sea, and this was for us, for the Atlantic Council, you said, China's inaction exposes the self-interested and transactional nature of its position in the Middle East. Regional actors need international leadership in the Red Sea, and China has not offered it. Jonathan, as Arab states, as Gulf states are looking at it, if China hasn't offered that leadership now, how does that alter or otherwise impact the relationship and Arab states' views of China's engagement in the region going forward, in your estimation? Yeah, so I think, you know, Andrea mentioned the uh, Saudi-Iran rapprochement, and, you know, that was kind of the crown jewel, but it was also, you know, surrounded by a lot of really big um, events that signaled a bigger role for China in the region, you know. Um, now, you know, for Don and Andre and I, we've been watching this stuff for a very long time, um, so it wasn't really a surprise. But when Xi Jinping went to Riyadh in December 22, uh, I think it caught a lot of people off guard to see just how big of a deal that was being portrayed. Um, there was That was followed by the Raisi visit. President Raisi from Iran went to Beijing uh, two months later. Then there was the Saudi-Iran rapprochement. There was the SEO and BRICS ascension uh, for a lot of Gulf countries. Just there was a lot of... Um, you know, a lot of uh, headlines, a lot of analysis talking about, you know, there's a vacuum in the Middle East that uh, the U.S. is leaving and China's filling it. And I'm always very uncomfortable with that kind of hyperbole because it, it just seems silly, especially if you live here <laughs> and, and see what China's doing and what the U.S. is doing and the tremendous gap. I mean, I remember um, about this time last year talking to a Middle East expert from China who was visiting here for the first time since 2019 pre-COVID. And I thought I would defend him by referring to China as a second tier power in the Middle East. And he laughed and said, we're like a third or fourth tier power, you know. Um, so I think, but again, you know, with all of the issues with the, the, the U.S. Middle East relations being what they are, the U.S. domestic political situation, which dominates the way a lot of people think about things, um, just this, this sense um, Countries in the Gulf saw China coming in, and I think there was a, uh, a sense of an emerging rising power that they wanted to develop a really strong relationship with. And all of these events that I just referred to were, were you know, pieces of that puzzle that made, you know, made that, it, that picture look a lot more clear. Now, in my earlier remarks, I referred to these vision development programs that you see around the Middle East. These are fundamental to what every country is trying to do. Every country in the Gulf, if you ask any Saudi any question, the answer is Saudi Vision 2030. It doesn't matter what you're talking about. This is existential for Saudi. They need to create a post-hydrocarbon economy, and that requires stability. And I think that explains why they reached out to Iran and why they've improved relations with, with Turkey and why they you know, uh, reached out to Syria shortly after the Iranian rapprochement. Uh, it's why they're trying to end the war in Yemen. All of this stuff... Is, is an attempt to create a more stable situation so that FDI is going to flow into the kingdom in a way that supports the, the vision that uh, international investors and international companies and international capital and talent are going to come into the, into the country. And the same is true here in the Emirates. It's true in Qatar. It's true 
you know, across the region. Um, now, the reason why I bring this up is I think there was a sense, especially in Saudi, and this didn't come, from, I, I haven't been in Saudi for about a year, but talking to people in Riyadh, there was a sense that folks in Saudi were disappointed. You know, this, these Houthi attacks on Red Sea, Red sea shipping, this, this more aggressive uh, Houthi behavior undermines what Saudi's trying to do. And there was a sense that China was going to contribute to, to you know, stopping this, that China was going to be a more active partner. And when China wasn't, you know, when, when and I, I wouldn't expect China to join, you know, a US, UK led uh, maritime mission. Uh, I, I don't think anybody expects to see that, but um, I, I still think that a lot of folks were hoping that there would be more of a response from China. Um, and when there wasn't, I think leaders well, I shouldn't say leader. I think just actors in general were thinking, you know, what kind of great power are you if, if you can't step in and, and help out your partners in a time of need? Um, so I understand the logic that Andrea was talking about, but I also think here in the region, the logic is, you know, it's more than peace to, through development that we need. We need peace. We need hard security approaches to this stuff as well. We need extra regional actors who can supply that um, when, when our, our capacities or our resources can't on their own. So um, I think that leads to, you know, I, I don't think, maybe disappointment is the wrong word, but I think just a, a reconsideration to think, you know, China's told us time and again that they don't want to replace the U.S. Um, and I think a lot of people would say, ha, 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 that's a normal thing for, you know, for a rising power to say, why antagonize the, the hegemon, right? But I, I think it's genuine. I don't think that China sees itself as coming into this region and, and playing a major security role and trying to order the region. And I think actors, again, like I said, probably weren't disappointed, but just kind of more clear-eyed, saying, oh, this is what we can expect. And you know, if it's a country where you get a lot of investment, do a lot of trade, and do a lot of contracting, and uh, you know, that's the extent of it, then fine. But I think it also just was a, a moment where people maybe said, uh, you know, oh, that, that's, that's who China is here. Don, Jonathan talked about the role that China is actually willing to play. One of the places that we have seen, I'm trying to pick up the ball at least at the very end of the, of, of the challenge, was mediating a resolution between the Saudis and, and Iranians to get back to some sort of uh, cold diplomatic detente, I'll say. Um, but about 10 months ago, you wrote something that I thought was quite interesting. You said, although there's been an uptick in the highly visible nature of China's activities in the Middle East over the last year, China's efforts to mediate disputes in the region are not new. The world may just be notice may now just I'm sorry, the world may just now be noticing China as a mediator, but it has worked to contribute to peace and security in the Middle East and resolve what it perceives as hotspot issues for over 20 years. In your earlier remarks, you mentioned the special envoy it's had for 20 years. Does China believe its efforts have actually been successful overall? You know, March is a much more clear example. But aside from March, have, have they been successful? Have they been worthwhile in China's mind? And especially in a post-October 7th world, where the conflict is greater than it's been um, in a number of years, what role does China think it's going to play when it comes to mediation? Right. And so when I made those comments, as you said, I was referring to the yeah. special envoy, also referring to 2016, they had a special envoy um, that was started to try to contribute to resolution of the Syrian civil war. Mm. Um, and then, as you said, the Saudi Arabia, Iran, right. Um, and then even right after the Saudi Iran deal, there was this reinvigorated kind of rhetoric regarding wanting to contribute to resolution of the Palestinian Israeli conflict. Mm -hmm. So I think the having a desire to mediate and seeing a role for themselves in mediating and actually Actually having success are two separate issues. But I do think that they conceptualize themselves as being able to play a unique role among great powers in that in many of these conflicts that are relevant in the region, they have positive relations with all of the relevant actors, whether that be states, or even through some of the mechanisms that were talked about yesterday on the conference, as far as through the International Department of the Chinese Communist Party, having um, relations with non-state actors, such as Hezbollah and you know other groups that are involved in these processes, that I think that they see themselves as uniquely positioned in the longer term of wanting to contribute more to peace and security, not by having unilateral 
unilateral military presence, or as Jonathan's you know, describing, not playing the security role that the US does, but more of a mediator. But I do think that they're realistic in the, in the current conflict between Israel um, and Hamas. I, I think they don't see a role in actually mediating that until we're past the current conflict, and it's more of mm -hmm. a normal Palestinian-Israeli conflict resolution mechanism going forward. So uh, you brought up the only real successful <laughs> quote-unquote example would have been the Saudis and the Iranians, but as you are well aware, they came in quite late in that process. I think what's most interesting in that case is the fact that Saudi and Iran chose to highlight China's role in the process um, and, and open up that opportunity for China to play that type of um, role in the future. Speaking of Iran, Andrea, l let me ask you this, because we saw Beijing relatively recently um, go to the Iranians, talk to them about the Houthis and whether there was potential um, help they could get in, in helping to, um, if not stop, slow Houthi attacks in the Red Sea, doesn't seem to have had that much of an impact, at least not yet. What's driving Chinese thinking, and how are, how are the Chinese, how is Beijing thinking about how much they can push regional states, especially Iran, in order to ensure Chinese interests that are, exist in the Middle East ultimately are not undermined? This is... Um $1 million question, I, <laughs> I fear. Um, I think many people have been discussing exactly how much leverage Beijing has towards um, Iran. Of course, uh, Iran depends much on China from an economic perspective, uh, although, um, for example, uh, me and my colleagues at the China Med Project have been following for a while Iranian media, and it's clear that also Iranians have quite a few, I'd say, they're not that happy about their relationship with Beijing, at least some, some believe that they're too dependent on them, um, and so far and so on. Um, it's also on the Chinese side, from time to time you see, of course it's, a, it's not a um, debate that happens, it's very easy to follow, at least in open sources, but you see sometimes, from time to time, discussions about um, actually the question that you just asked on how much they think that the influence how uh, successful they can be in the region, um, including uh, how much influence they have vis-a-vis -vis the Iranians. And it seems to me a lot of times the answer is not much. Mm. Um, the, some say, you know, it seems that recently we have, at our initiative have gained some traction in the region, but it's not really because of our initiatives, but because the region has changed, uh, simply the demands coming from regional policymakers um, made our initiatives more appealing to them rather than uh, being something that comes from us. Um, and, and a bit the same thing is, is, is the discussion about Iran. Iran is an important partner. They get, of course, very important economic relations, but really difficult to tell how much influence we have because, well, they're so dependent on us and also who knows what they really, you know, um, um, if they're given other opportunities, uh, other choices, they will actually listen to us. Uh, but in, in any case, I think at the moment, um, they even honestly, even if they had that much leverage on Iran to influence Iranians' behavior, I think they would be more on the cautious. They would stay on the cautious side. I don't think they would, in any case, push the Iranians too much because, in any case, Iran is is a too important regional partner, um, especially and and for a long time, the, uh, Chinese scholars have been looking at it as a, a, a country as a country that's many problems that is also a bit fragile. I don't think they want to push too much in any case. Um, and again, I think this also should be seen as part of Beijing's constant efforts to say, this is not about Iran. This is not about the Houthis. Again, keep, let's keep the focus on Israel and Gaza. Um, and so um, it, I think there are a, couple, a mix of things then, right? There is a mix of maybe they don't have so much influence and maybe they have, they do not necessarily want to use it. Um, uh, at full. Um, and I think this also, you know, we were thinking, Jonathan mentioned the, the fact that, uh, uh, of course, uh, Ch China is an important trading nation. Uh, of course, it also has interest at stake. Um, but at the same time, if we look back in time, like 2000, early, uh, 2008, 2007, you know, when there were the pirates in, in, in the 
um, in the Gulf of Aden. It, it took a while for Beijing to react, really. And, uh, and so this is to say they're quite tolerant, in any case, to such kind of economic cost. So, you know, they don't have that kind of motivation in a way. They are tolerant to the economic cost. Um, they want to keep the focus on Israel. And at the same time, again, there is again, the $1 million question, how much real influence they have on the Iranians. Um, all in all. So, difficult to tell. But I wouldn't expect them to push Iran too hard, even if they could. That's by his way. Excellent. Thank you very much. Let me take the little bit of remaining time we have to turn to some audience questions, if I could. Um, Don, maybe I'll start with you, uh, given some of your previous comments here today. Um, there's two questions about the, uh, largely on the same topic. I'm going to combine them a bit. It says, do people in the Middle East and Global South see the contradictions between China's support for Palestinian statehood and its repression of similar aspirations in Xinjiang, Taiwan, Tibet, Hong Kong. Um, and then the other part I'll add on to this is also related to the Palestinians. The part of this is, is there China's approach here, at least in part a reflection of capitalizing on the mood of the global south that was discussed yesterday? Right. And so I'll keep my comments brief. This is a, a very yeah. large topic, right? Um, but as far as Palestinians versus uh, the, the situation in Xinjiang, I think at this point, you know, obviously, we don't have a lot of detailed um, polling data to, to really tell us exactly how people feel about this. But at least what I've seen in my own research is I think China has gotten a lot of traction in, his, in their narratives with Arab states in particular regarding Xinjiang, right, for, for a number of reasons, including framing it as terrorism. I'm not mm -hmm. saying that is, uh, you know, it's exaggerated from a Chinese perspective, but framing it as terrorism, you know, really downplaying the human rights aspect, the fact that Uyghurs are not ethnically Arab, the fact that China is in many ways the predominant economic partner of, of many Arab countries. I think it's kind of overdetermined in certain ways. Mm. But what I've seen more recently is I think part of why there's traction is that China more and more is framing this issue about Xinjiang as something the U.S. is using as part of great power competition. And I think in a number of countries, at least among leadership, because of concerns regarding in the U.S. role because of coming from a post-colonial type of environment. I think there's a bit more receptivity to that narrative. But what I've seen over time is more and more traction and having more proactive statements coming out from the Gulf Cooperation Council, from Arab states, even from the Palestinians, about differentiating what's happening in Xinjiang you know, versus other human rights issues. So I think it's going the other direction. I mean, is there a disconnect? Yes, absolutely. But that doesn't mean that that disconnect is perceived in that way within the region. Jonathan, let me turn to you quickly. Um, there's a question here. Has the failure of the Arab Springs diminished the appeal of democracy and thus enhanced China's appeal? Oh, the failure of the Arab Spring diminished the appeal of democracy. You know, there's been a lot of stuff in democracy since that time that's also added to that. Um, so I live and I teach political science in, in the UAE, which is far from a democracy. And when I talk to my students, which we're actually doing today in class, we were talking about uh, democratization. Um, they're very, very aware of the, the political system they live in, um, its shortcomings and its strengths. When we talk about democracy, the first thing they say, um, and apologies to our American audience, but they say we, we see what's happening in the U.S. with Congress and with you know the, this presidential election, and we don't want that. It looks very chaotic. Um, their experience with the Brits means that they also look at um, the referendum for uh, for Brexit, and they say you know that's what democracy does. You know you get people that are making bad decisions, and then you get uh, you know political chaos. So I wouldn't say that uh, the Arab Spring really contributes to it so much as just uh, a sense that maybe democracy isn't. Um, the right tool for all for every job, and I think that's where China actually um, is able to get some traction in the region because they say, "Look, um, is it the 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 means of the end? Do you want governance or do you want a system?" And China will say, "Look at what we were prior to the reform era. Look how underdeveloped our country was. Look how weak our, economically we were, politically we were. Um, we addressed development issues. We focused on strengthening our country, and uh, we have very good governance now." Now, 
again, you know, it's good governance if you're on one side of it. If you're on the other side, you, you might dispute that. But I think that message resonates in a lot of Arab countries, a lot of Middle Eastern countries that would say, we would love to have that kind of economic reform without political reform. Um, you know, and if, if China's got the secret sauce, if they can tell us how to achieve economic reform and good governance without democracy, you know, mashallah, give me that every time. So I don't think it's really about, uh, you know, post-Arab Spring stuff. I think there's a lot of factors that contribute to it. Uh, and I do think it's one place where, where China's narrative uh, is met with a, a fair bit of uh, enthusiasm around the region. Thank you very much for that. Unfortunately, we're going to have to leave it there. Let me take a moment to thank our three fantastic panelists for what I thought was a truly illuminating conversation. Um, we'll be breaking for lunch here at the council, but we'll resume at 1245 with this afternoon's keynote speaker, Michael Schiffer, the Assistant Administrator for Asia at USAID. We look forward to seeing you then for myself and all of the panelists. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much.
Welcome back from break, everyone. Uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce our luncheon keynote speaker, Michael Schiffer, who's the Assistant Administrator of the Bureau for Asia at the U.S. Agency for International Development. From 2012 to 2022, Mr. Schiffer was a senior advisor and counselor on the Democratic staff of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. From 2009 to 2012, he served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for East Asia in the office of the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Asian and Pacific Security Affairs. Before joining the Def Department of Defense, he was a program officer at the Stanley Foundation, responsible for the Foundation's Asia programs, as well as a range of other US national and global security issues. And in 2004-2005, Mr. Schiffer was a Council on Foreign Relations Hitachi International Affairs Fellow in Japan. From 1995 to 2004, he worked on the staff of U.S. Senator Dianne Feinstein, including as her senior national security advisor and legislative director. It's a real pleasure to have Mr. Schiffer with us here today. Michael, over to you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, really, really uh, pleased to be able to join you all here uh, th th this afternoon. Um, and share with you some thoughts uh, about USAID's uh, approach uh, to development dip diplomacy in this new era of strategic competition. Uh, our discussion today is really timely. Um, two years ago, as, as many of you know, uh, the Biden-Harris administration uh, unveiled its Indo-Pacific strategy, uh, which lays out America's vision for a region that is, that is free, open, connected, prosperous, secure, and resilient. Uh, and while the Indo-Pacific strategy speaks to the animating uh, vision for our policy and engagement in that region, uh, it, it also speaks to the uh, animating spirit for our foreign policy and our national security more, more broadly, um, contributing to global goods, contributing to global architecture, uh, and contributing to a global commons that supports uh, an open, connected, prosperous, secure, and resilient world. Uh, in these two short years, we have made tangible strides uh, in working with our partners in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, we've trained more than 10,000 human rights defenders. We've improved digital connectivity in hard-to-reach communities. Uh, and we've reduced more than 18 million tons of greenhouse gases in the region, uh, the equivalent of more than 4 million cars off the, off the road for a year. Uh, I can go on and on uh, and bore you all to death with our statistical laundry list of, of, of progress. Uh, but hopefully that gives you a little bit of a sense of the flavor uh, of the sort of work we're doing and, and the progress that we're, that we're making. Uh, that said, uh, whenever I speak to uh, Congress, to our partners, uh, to other stakeholders, uh, I'm constantly met with questions about the role that the PRC plays in, in our development diplomacy, whether its model poses challenges, uh, whether we view the PRC as a strategic competitor, uh, and how the PRC's engagement uh, in the, the Global South with the global majority uh, intersects uh, with our efforts to support sustainable development. Uh, I'm not here to talk uh, at length about the PRC, however. Um, I'm here today to talk about the transformative potential uh, of our open model um, as we seek to support positive development partnerships. Uh, that said, we are clear-eyed about the strategic context in which we operate uh, and the role that the People's Republic of China, animated by Xi Jinping's global ambitions, plays in the global south uh, for the global majority uh, and around the world. Uh, it is a simple fact that what the PRC does uh, and PRC behavior has an increasing impact on sustainable global development. As a foreign policy agency and a member of the National Security Council, USAID's approach to development, if it is to be successful, must align with our diplomacy and our defense, the three Ds for, for U.S. foreign and national security policy. That our de development diplomacy aligns with our broader national security goals, however, uh, does not mean that we view it as merely transactional or, or instrumental. Uh, as such, we believe that what defines our work, how it's received, and what it means for our partners must begin with our own story and our own value proposition. It is, above all, not about what the PRC does. Um, it is about what the United States can offer. Uh, it is about our relationships with our partners. Uh, it is about those relationships built on respect uh, and the shared priorities that we together uh, have to support an open and inclusive international order. 
USAID's development model is, by design, a demonstration of US values and how those values contribute to fostering resilience, prosperity, sovereignty, and security. With shared values and, and a people-centric decision-making uh, uh, process, we were able to build greater trust. And with greater trust comes greater cooperation and investment, uh, which in turn charts a mutually beneficial course towards sustainable development uh, and towards security and prosperity for, for all. Most importantly, we believe in meeting our partners where they are and helping them to advance their own aspirations uh, and their own goals for sustainable growth and development uh, and to be able to deliver tangible results. Uh, take the Republic of Korea. Uh, in the aftermath of the Korean War uh, and well into the 1960s, food and income were scarce uh, in, in South Korea, uh, with that country's economy on par with some of the most economically impoverished uh, countries in the world today. Prospects for a, a brighter, more prosperous future, uh, let alone for BTS and K-pop, uh, required hard work uh, and, and a plan. Uh, but, and, and I think many of you uh, know this story, uh, USAID and other development partners uh, stepped in to support the Republic of Korea in pursuing its vision for how to build th its own, their own country. Uh, USAID supported uh, the people of South Korea uh, as they built up their agricultural sector, their health system, uh, their educational institutions, and their major industries, uh, all engines that, that, that drove development. Uh, and we supported the Republic of Korea as it integrated with the global economy uh, to help facilitate its rapid growth. Our development work with the Republic of Korea was laser focused on alleviating suffering, supporting sustainable market-based solutions, uh, and on shared ideals, all building the foundations for that country's long-term growth, security, and resilience. Uh, I, I offer this story uh, to illustrate the success of how a genuine development partnership, uh, in this case with the Republic of Korea, can be central uh, to advancing both U.S interests in building a strong and, and resilient international community uh, and also meet the priorities of our, of our partners. USAID's development practices elevate inclusion, elevate transparency, center on good governance, on robust civil societies, on a free press, uh, build uh, norms that, that help to inculcate respect for human rights uh, and, and democracy. Uh, and we do that not simply because those are moral goods, although we believe they are, um, but because they are key enablers for, for broad-based, inclusive, and sustainable growth. Uh, they are, in a, in a very real sense, uh, our secret sauce uh, when it comes to assuring that product, uh, projects provide uh, a return on investment uh, and do so for those most in need. Uh, it may not always be the easiest model to, to, to work with. We, we acknowledge that. Um, but there is a great wealth of empirical data that suggests that, success, that it, uh, suggests that it is the most successful model for sustainable development over time. Uh, and that is especially so compared to other uh, development models that might deliver short-term results but tend over time to falter, uh, often leaving behind debt, local displacement, and, and environmental devastation. Uh, our model also builds on decades-long uh, history of being responsive to our partners' needs uh, and supporting their efforts to achieve their own development priorities and self-determination. Uh, and uh, as I offered, our results demonstrate that our model uh, can be successful. Uh, 11 of our top 15 trading partners today, like the Republic of Korea, uh, were once recipients of aid from the United States. 17 recipients of USAID assistance have become donors in their own right. We build strong societies. We work with partners on their own paths to success. And we also want our partners to know that USAID assistance does not need to be repaid. They're not loans. USAID seeks to offer emerging economies of the future a trusted development model, one rooted not in debt, debt and dependence, but in mutually uh, beneficial economic in integration, inclusivity, locally led solutions, and the democratic values that can help transform our shared planet for the better. We do not seek to weaponize our development assistance for our own benefit uh, or to leverage it for our own narrow goals. Uh, rather, we pursue development diplomacy to provide public goods and to strengthen the global commons. Uh, I might add that we don't claim to have all the right answers, uh, and we certainly don't claim to have never made mistakes. Uh, crises abroad and at home constantly prompt us to ask probing questions uh, about how we might help live up to our own ideals. 
Our commitment is to help our partners do the same. Uh, as partners, we can and we must push one another as equals to live up to our full potential and our highest ideals and aspirations. When we do so, we are all better equipped to address some of the most pressing challenges of our time. Uh, and in that context, uh, the question we ask ourselves and the questions we ask of our partners in the, in the global south and the global majority is, how can we support the global south individually and collectively to succeed and drive its own destiny? Such an outcome, we believe, will contribute to a world consistent with our interests and values and the affirmative development uh, agenda that we seek to promote. This complements our longstanding practice that emphasizes overall sustainability, from financial prosperity to social well-being to a healthy environment. And while we may have limited ability to change the decisions uh, that are made in Beijing on any given day that in intersect uh, in detrimental ways with the prosperity, uh, environmental sustainability, well-being, and development, uh, developmental potential of the global majority, we can work alongside our partners and our, and our allies to help shape the environment in which the PRC operates. USAID can help su promote sustainable development reforms, the chart of vision for the world in which we all want to live. We work with the private sector to unleash economic growth and our partners' potential. We work with local communities to meet their needs as they define them. We work with international coordinating mechanisms and international institutions that extend resources and technical expertise. We ensure that our work is complementary uh, and respects existing regional architecture. And we know that our grants-based assistance can go further when it is put together with public and private investments. We can do all that, elevating our contributions, doubling down on our commitments, uh, and appealing to the best parts of our rooted history around the globe, recognizing that for countries to flourish on their, on their own development paths, each nation should be able to choose its own way forward, including how they manage their resources and with whom they partner. And that it is on us, not our partners, to demonstrate our own value in this development partnership. We offer our development partners to that end uh, in the Global South and the Global ma uh, Majority, uh, a development model that celebrates listening to and learning from them, understanding their concerns, and finding a pathway forward together. And so across the globe, USAID seeks to show countries the possibilities uh, of a cooperative, inclusive, uh, and to use Administrator Powers' phrase, uh, a big-hearted development model, uh, a model that is rooted in cooperation, in economic trade and integration, and in connectivity, not debt traps or never-ending foreign assistance dependence. That is how we continue our development leadership in the future, and that is how we show our values. Uh, in so doing, we firmly believe that together we will build a free, open, and inclusive architecture for the balance of the 21st century, do so in partnership with uh, the Global South, with the Global Majority, uh, and do so in a more sustainable uh, way that creates prosperity and security uh, for, for all. Uh, so let me again extend my gratitude uh, to the Atlantic Council, to Mr. Shulman, uh, and to all of you uh, who, have, uh, who have joined us today uh, in the room and, uh, and online uh, for, for generously providing me this opportunity to share some thoughts. Um, and I look forward to the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, that was really a fantastic and comprehensive kind of vision you're giving us of, of what USAID does, does generally, but then also how it relates to what we see China doing in the Global South. Um, I, you know, you, you focus understandably on what, you know, what USAID is doing and how that fits into the US drive to kind of support broad-based and sustainable global development, to support other countries reaching their, their goals and their own vision. Um, but I, I would want to kind of bring in the China piece again and kind of ask from your perspective, as someone who's looked at, at China, looked at Asia for a long time, what do you think is driving Beijing's increased attention to the global south, to the developing world, which we've talked about a lot over the last day and a half, and how does this renewed focus on the developing world shape the U.S. approach to development, if at all? Uh, it, it's a great question, and I'm going to disappoint you to some degree um, <laughs> because I, uh, I'm not going to speculate on um, motivations or intentions in in, in Beijing. Um, you know, I think some of them are probably understandable, some mm -hmm. perhaps uh, far less so. 
Um, but what really concerns us is not the motivations, um, but its behavior uh, and how PRC behavior, particularly um, when it drives uh, development outcomes that are not to the benefit of the countries uh, in, in which uh, the PRC is, is working, yeah. um, you know, that, that, that's where our concern is. Um, and that is the emphasis, uh, as I think I offered, on our being able to provide a better uh, a, a better um, model. Um, so, you know, for us, frankly, you know, the, the interest really isn't in countering the, the PRC um, per se, um, and it's certainly not in, uh, you know, mir mirror imaging uh, or, um, or, or modeling, uh, you know, parts of their behavior that we consider to be problematic. Um, our interest is in seeking to, to foster um, the international institutions, the norms, the behavior uh, that we think, um, based on the observations that we have, you know, we don't claim to have all the answers, but the observations that we have about what can contribute to and constitute a healthy, prosperous um, society, uh, you know, how we then can, uh, can, can partner um, to, uh, to, to drive good development outcomes for the global majority. Uh, and to, to help our work with our partners in the Global South as they seek prosperity, as they seek, uh, you know, a more secure order. Yes, and I think the, you know, you, you speak about focusing on China's actions and the, react, and the impact that they have in developing countries around the world. I think that's, that's really important to zero in on. Um, and I, you know, having worked at the International Republican Institute and having worked with USAID quite a bit at that time, did see a lot of ways in which the growth and development initiatives led by the United States in the developing world really could have an impact in terms of bolstering resilience to some of the negative effects that could come with engaging with China. Um, so I'm just curious, you know, if you could zero in a little bit in terms of your thinking on what the U.S. is doing in terms of enhancing local representation, bolstering transparency, um, bolstering civil society. What has been, uh, in your experience, the most effective type of programming that does help to bolster that, that resilience? Because as we've talked about, and as you know, countries are going to, and, and in many ways should, continue to engage China and get the benefits mm -hmm. from that. But what can we be doing? What can USAID in particular be doing to ensure that as they do so, their democratic institutions and rights are protected? Yeah, no, look, I think that's an incredibly important question. And, and I think for us, you know, the, the first gate that we, that, that we go through uh, is in recognizing that we need to be developing locally-led solutions. Uh, and administrator power, uh, as I know you know, has put a, a huge emphasis, uh, and rightly so, on our, uh, you know, what we term our localization uh, uh, initiative. You know, local communities, the countries in which we're, we're partnering in the, in the Global South, they know their problems and they know their solutions much better uh, than, than we do. Uh, the question for us is how do we slot in uh, to their uh, conceptualization of what the development pathway needs to, to look like uh, in a way that can be catalytic uh, as we help them to co-design, co-develop um, development development initiatives, uh, making sure that you know the stakeholders at the local level have the the biggest voice uh, in that process. Uh, you know, and, and to that end, I'm sort of backing my way up to your, your, your question. Uh, you know, we have found that where we can help support strong and vibrant civil society, free and independent journalism, anti-corruption uh, initiatives, um, greater transparency, that, you know, all, all of those things are the critical enablers that allow for economic growth to, to, to flourish and to be sustained uh, over time, uh, you know, it's it's not it, it's not about uh, you know dropping a, a bridge or a highway uh, mm -hmm. on somebody that 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 sort of gives you uh, you know the sugar high of a quick you know quick hit to your your GDP over three or four years, and then that falls off, right? It's it, it's empty calories, uh, as my nutritionist would <laughs> and does tell me, um, right? You know, this is about what the full meal needs to look like, so that you build all of the the, the, the muscles um, that are that are needed for healthy, vibrant, strong, uh, and resilient societies. 
Uh, building on that, we, we talked a fair amount this morning in our uh, panel on, on technology issues, as well as uh, over the last day and a half looking at different regions um, about what China's doing in terms of uh, digital ecosystems, right, and in terms of um, funding infrastructure and services that might give China undue influence over a countries, um, those ecosystems, or undermine the security of their ICT um, backbones, these kinds of things. I know USAID has been focused on digital development um, and helping to, to some extent, um, you know, kind of respond to China's digital Silk Road um, related efforts. So I wonder if you could speak a little bit to that to that digital side of the work that USAID is doing and how it relates to to China, but also just to helping these countries reach their visions. Yeah, look, I, you know, I would offer more, more more broadly than concerns about the PRC as we think about what will be driving economic growth and prosperity for the balance of the 21st century. It is about this whole new emergent suite of technologies. Uh, in, in, the, in the digital space, whether it's quantum computing, whether it's AI, uh, whether it's 5G, soon to be 6G, right? I mean, that, that, that is where the action is at. Um, and so for any and every country uh, that is looking to uh, build a more prosperous future for itself, a focus on developing, designing, and implementing, you know, a resilient, secure telecommunications infrastructure uh, and a resilient and secure digital ecosystem is absolutely, absolutely critical um, and, and absolutely key. We have been uh, deeply involved uh, both in, in Asia and elsewhere in looking to promote open radio access network, mm -hmm. uh, for, for example, both as uh, a way to create that open, inclusive, but also safe and secure uh, digital architecture. Um, and to provide digital upskilling training for our partners um, in Southeast Asia, uh, in, in South Asia, and, and elsewhere to, to help drive uh, and, and generate uh, jobs. Uh, we have worked on uh, you know, undersea marine cables uh, in the Pacific to make sure uh, that uh, our Pacific Island friends um, have access uh, to safe and reliable and secure internet uh, connections and frankly, to help overcome some of the, the market resistance um, that small countries with small economies may face uh, when it comes to getting the private sector, uh, which ultimately is the real driver for sustainable economic growth um, in, in, into the game, right? Some of the, some of the work that we do uh, along with our other partners uh, uh, across the US government in, in de-risking uh, and helping to create uh, the predicates for bankable deals uh, is absolutely crucial for, for our partners. Um, so there's there's a huge opportunity, uh, and we are trying to throw ourselves in there, you know, with with all of our all of our body, all of our heart, and all of our all of our mind. Um, that's great. The the you you touched a little bit in your remarks on kind of what I I think maybe would term kind of the twin mission that that USAID has, which is of course driving development results. But as you also mentioned, and people maybe sometimes think don't think of this as much as advancing U.S. national security interests, right? Um, particularly, and so, so I guess my question is, and you've hinted at this a little bit, particularly in the China context, is there a, a tension there that makes it difficult sometimes in engaging with some of our partners, where we are very much looking to bolster their own visions to help them down their own development paths, but we are also um, through USAID and through other agencies uh, very kind of. Uh, not hiding the fact that this is part of, uh, you know, trying to reach U.S. foreign policy and strategic goals. Uh, I, I guess I would offer that there's that, that, that there's an apparent tension there, um, but not necessarily a, a real one, um, because from our perspective, the best answer to a bad model for development is a good model for development, mm. um, and we have a good model uh, for for development, and anything and everything that we can do that helps to create. And, and you know, we're, we're sort of re repeating the verbiage here, but you know, stable, resilient societies that helps to drive economic growth and prosperity, uh, that helps to meet, you know, helps local communities as they meet their health, their education, uh, you know, needs. All of that creates the sort of international community um, that we believe is consistent with. The, the sort of world that, uh, that, that we want to create um, because it's consonant with U.S. interests and, and, and U.S. values. Um, so the more that we can do that, and that's exactly what we would do whether or not the PRC existed, 
um, you know, the, the better off we think our partners will be um, and the better off the world will be. Uh, but it's incumbent upon us mm -hmm. to, to, to demonstrate uh, that you know, the model that we think is the better model um, is in fact the better model and it's incumbent upon us uh, to stand up and to perform and to deliver with our partners, um, you know, not to or not at them, but with them, uh, you know, tangible, concrete, uh, you know, and visible uh, demonstrations of success so that they appreciate that our model delivers, that democracy delivers, um, and that's what we seek to do. And you mentioned in your comments as well that there we seek to work with our allies as well, right, in terms of, you know, the other countries that have a similar vision for the same sort of democratic model that we think works. Um, can you speak a little bit to, you know, the extent to which we are already working with some of those allies in, in, in you know, putting forward some of these, this development assistance, working with them on uh, development finance, working with them on a, on a range of different topics where we might perhaps um, you know, have different comparative advantages that we could bring to bear in different countries, these sorts of things to really reach, uh, help our partners in the developing world reach their own goals. Yeah, no, look, we, we fully believe um, that uh, given the scope, the scale, the urgency of some of the challenges uh, that we face in the international uh, system today, some of the challenges that we face uh, with climate change, uh, you know, for, for, for example, um, that, the, the, that we need to be doing this work um, with, our, with our allies, with our partners, uh, with, with, with other like-minded. This is, this is a team game and it requires all of the resources that all of us um, can, can bring to bear if we're gonna be successful. Uh, and moreover, you know, given our aspirations for building um, a resilient uh, international community, we want to do this with our with our allies and partners, right? The process is part of the product, uh, in in a real, uh, you know, in in a, in a real and, and significant way. Um, and we also recognize that you know, well, there may be things as you know, you uh, offer that comparative advantage, uh, you know, bumper sticker, uh, which is one that we believe in, right? There, well, there may be things where we have relationships or unique expertise and experience. There are relationships, there's expertise, there are experience, uh, experiences that our partners have where they may be better positioned uh, to be able to do the work. And in that case, uh, in those cases, we want them uh, to, to, to do the work. Um, so we are in deep conversations, and not just conversations, but we're in deep cooperative uh, partnerships with others in the Indo-Pacific, uh, Japan, Korea, uh, Australia, Taiwan, uh, as well as others around the world, uh, uh, including uh, you know our, our European Union mm -hmm. uh, 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 friends, friends and partners, uh, we worked. Uh, you know, we talked a little bit earlier about digital space. We we worked closely with Australia for the digital spur cable mm -hmm. uh, for Palau, for for, for example, uh, where we were each able to bring uh, you know to the table resources and experience uh, that helped to create the partnership um, that was. Uh, that, that was successful. Uh, so we are constantly um, looking uh, to, to deepen those conversations and deepen those partnerships. That's great, thank you. Well, uh, moving from coordination with, with allies in our last minute here to a question about coordination within the U.S. government, uh, which is... Al always perfect. <laughs> always perfect. Um, always perfect across all types of issues. Um, but I would imagine that dealing with a massive subject like how does the United States um, do even better to up our game in terms of uh, engagement across this um, ridiculous concept we're using here of the global south, right, uh, most of the world. Um, what would you say is the, the state of the ability of the U.S. government across USAID and state and DFC and Exum and all these different agencies that, that need to be coordinating to really make sure that our approach is, is kind of is honed, is prioritizing where we should be you know, putting scarce resources and attention. Is there more that could be done there? Or do you feel like we're, we're going in the right direction? Uh, both. I mean, th there is definitely more that can be done by way of closer and, and better coordination. And you, you only you know, listed yeah. <laughs> uh, a handful of the many, many agencies and departments that are uh, that are involved in this, but but I will say um, that you know th this administration has done a very very effective job at creating that you know mythical whole of government 
uh, approach, mm -hmm. um, drawing across all of the instruments uh, of our national security and foreign policy, uh, you know, bureaucracy, um, to really focus down in a way that we intend to be enduring and sustainable and with a certainty of trajectory um, on the, the uh, Indo-Pacific strategy, uh, specifically for, for my bureau, but uh, more broadly as we're engaged in, in pursuing our development diplomacy goals around the world. Great, well that's a great way to end. Thanks again for sharing your expertise, your insights, and the perspective of USAID, uh, particularly right before you jump on a plane to Asia. <laughs> so well, join thank me you. in thanking Mr. Chair. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I'd ask everyone to just stay in your seats while we transition to our next panel. Thank you.
Welcome back, everyone. Um, so uh, we're going to kind of continue with the theme uh, that we ended on with Assistant Administrator Schiffer um, and talk about, on this panel, kind of forging a more effective U.S. approach um, in the Global South, uh, which, of course, allows for, for more potential competition with China as it, as it fo focuses more strategically uh, on the developing world. Uh, and we have a really fantastic panel of experts here from the U.S. government and from the private sector uh, to discuss these issues, so I will briefly introduce them now. Um, to my far left, uh, we have Simon Littlewood, uh, who's the CEO of SDG Global Group. Uh, Simon has over three decades experience founding, investing in, raising, and structuring capital for and advising businesses across a wide range of industry sectors and geographies. He's known for his approach and innovative design of deals, financial products, and structures. He's worked in both developed and emerging markets, starting in Africa and Southeast Asia in the 1980s, and then subsequently spending over two decades investing, working, and living in China. Simon, glad to have you here. Um, to my right, uh, we have Daphne McCurdy. Uh, Daphne is a senior advisor in the Office of China Coordination in the U.S. Department of State. Um, prior to State Department, uh, Daphne served as foreign policy advisor to U.S. Senator Jeff Merkley, where she oversaw the Senator's work on the Foreign Relations Committee and the Appropriations State and Foreign Operations Subcommittee. Uh, previously, Daphne served as USAID OTI Syria Deputy Country Representative based at the U.S. Consulate in Istanbul and as a countering violent extremism specialist in State's Bureau of Conflict and Stabilization Operations. Daphne, thank you for being with us. Uh, and Naz El Khatib is Deputy Chief of Staff for Policy in the U.S. Development Finance Corporation. Uh, Naz leads DFC's foreign policy team there. And before joining DFC, he served at the State Department, where he primarily covered Indo-Pacific affairs, among a range of other policy areas, as a member of the counselor's staff and separately advised the Chief of Staff to the Secretary on Internal Initiatives, and he previously served as an Associate Director of Policy at National Security Action, which is a nonprofit organization, and as Deputy Chief of Staff to the Global Managing Partner of McKinsey, among many other roles. Uh, so truly a great kind of cross-section of folks looking at these issues from U.S. government and the private sector perspective. Um, I want to kick things off by asking a question that kind of gets at at the heart of where I think we are in our politics right now. I mean, we brought this group together, of course, primarily to talk about the U.S. government and policy role in the Global South and our ability to compete. But, um, and we've talked about that for much of the last two days at this conference, but we are at this moment in the United States where a lot of Americans are unconvinced of the need for U.S. global leadership and the importance of foreign aid and diplomacy. So I guess the question to kind of kick things off, or rather, not, maybe not an easy question, is why should the U.S. government or the U.S. people care about um, the developing world uh, when we have so many other challenges uh, going on at this moment? Uh, so I'll open that up. I don't know, Daphne, if you want to kick things off, I'll turn to you. Sure, and, uh, We'll go to. around. Uh, well, first of all, thanks, Dave, um, for convening this really great panel and to the Atlantic Council on Notre Dame for, for having this excellent conference. Um, on your question, I think it's a really important one and one, frankly, that the Biden administration has really put a premium on, um, really trying to break down the silos between what is our domestic policy and what is our foreign policy. And I think that's reflective in the fact that Secretary Blinken, the first speech that he gave um, in the role was a foreign policy for the American people. Um, and the premise there is really that the challenges that we're dealing with globally, or I'm sorry, are dealing with domestically are actually global transnational challenges, ones that we can't do alone, um, confront alone. So um, obviously the most salient is the COVID-19 pandemic where we saw that vulnerable health systems in one part of the world impacted the health of everyday Americans. Um, we've seen it with the horrific war in Ukraine um, that has led to or led to rising oil prices and gas pr prices um, here. And then I think the the biggest challenge is climate change mm -hmm. um, and one that I know we're all working on uh, daily. And, um, you know, the U.S. might be a large contributor of carbon emissions at 15 percent, but the rest of the world is contributing the remaining 85%. And so we really can't tackle that challenge without uh, all working together. 
Um, I'd also just note, and, and the second part of the, of the issue set is I think one more abstract, but um, just as pressing and maybe gets at the nexus with strategic competition, is that right now we're also at this inflection point where we're seeing authoritarian revisionist powers really try to challenge the global order in a way that actually has direct impacts on Americans um, and trying to rewrite the rules of the road, um, the way that we uh, share data, the way that we um, protect privacy, the way that we engage in free debate. And so while it may feel abstract, that sort of challenge to the global order is actually one that could really impact the day-to-day -day freedoms that um, we as Americans, I think, cherish. Those are some really, really important points. <laughs> Thank you. And, and really linking those domestic interests of uh, regular Americans on the street and what's happening uh, in ways that people wouldn't necessarily think of globally. Uh, so thank you. Um, Naz, any other thoughts on this? Well, I'm happy to briefly comment on this. Thank you again, Dave, for hosting us and yeah. for the work that the Atlanta Council on Notre Dame are doing to put on this conference. I mean, I completely agree with what Daphne put forward. At the end of the day, the American foreign policy approach has to be oriented in delivering for the American people. That's why the core pillars of the administration's strategy actually focus first and foremost on investing at home directly, uh, investments in our industrial base, investments uh, in our energy base, and our ability to combat some of the challenges that Daphne pointed out. But central to that idea, because of the nature of the shared challenges that, um, that we've discussed already, is the idea that American foreign policy also has to deliver for people around the world. That's good for them. That's good for the United States. And it's part of the sort of core premise of our approach to development policy as well. It's the idea that uh, animates why we want to invest in, for example, a solar manufacturing facility in India that is with a US company but employs Indian workers that sources supply chain uh, materials from uh, countries other than China so we can avoid some of the human rights issues that um, sort of speak to the authoritarian revisionism that, that Daphne was mentioning. It's why we want to invest in vaccine manufacturing around the world to help prevent disease incidents in other countries before those diseases hit American shores. It's why we want to invest in the engine of most economies around the world, small businesses, so that people in those countries are successful, that their innovation can benefit Americans, but also that um, in certain parts of the world, including in our own hemisphere, people have the tools, the opportunities, the resources they need to stay in their own communities where, um, of course, in many cases, they'd prefer to. All of those help the American people. They also help people around the world. And I think uh, that's a central aspect of what we're collectively trying to do uh, as part of this administration. Great, thank you. Uh, Simon, any additional thoughts on this? Yeah, yeah, I, I took the uh, metro here. So my, my sort of short half hour journey involved uh, walking a five minute walk to the metro. Uh, there were two beggars on the street. Uh, and then on the metro itself, there were three beggars. Um, and I, I flew into the airports here, and you know the airports are run down, the, the bridges are broken, the roads are broken. So if I were an American citizen and taxpayer, I would be saying, hey, why are we shifting all this cash overseas when we have many, many issues at home? So I think in, in answer to your question, yeah, I can see why a lot of American people are sitting there going, why are we doing sort of 50 billion here, 50 billion there? Because we have our own problems and we should be fixing those. Um, so, to now counter my own argument, I, th <laughs> I think there is a huge role for uh, the private sector in the U.S. to get involved worldwide. Now, uh, that's generating wealth for the U.S. economy, generating jobs. It means that the investments that U.S. companies are making in their technology can find a market. Now, by not engaging in the rest of the world, the US risks losing those markets, which ultimately hits US companies, which then hits the US people. So if you look at it from an economic perspective, it is a very good long-term investment for the US to be investing in other markets. Um, but I would, I would say that it should be more of an investment. So I think this idea of donating money and aid, there is obviously a role for that where there's a crisis. But I think the role of the US government is to support US people and US businesses, and that should be much more focused on how do you support the private sector to get into these markets, rather than let's donate money. Yeah. But just to point, um, pick up on one of, of your points as well, which I think is, is essential, and this is one of the, I, I'm from the UK originally, and uh, this is a big issue in Europe, is how do you stop the immigrants coming in? 
because if people are losing their livelihoods in these countries from climate change or war or whatever, they're going to get on boats or, in this case, come across the border in the US. Now, the big issue in the UK right now is how do you stop that? And the answer is that you stop the reason why they're fleeing in the first place. Uh, and that's about investing in those countries and creating jobs, which is, is the point you made, that the only way to solve the immigration problem globally is to start investing. Uh, and that's the great strength that the US has. It, it has the biggest investment and finance industry in the world. It still has the best base of technology. It should be going out into these countries, creating the jobs which solves the problem. Yeah, so I want to pick up on that and ask, uh, especially the two of you, and we'll, we'll come to more questions for you in a sec, definitely. But uh, the role of the private sector, right? Uh, I think everyone agrees uh, that this is essential, um, but I want to draw it a little bit more fr from, from you, Simon, and you from, Na from Nas as well. What is the role of the private sector in bolstering these relationships between the US and developing countries and offering these oft-mentioned alternatives to what China is offering in terms of financing and investment, uh, particularly, I think, in the digital space? Um, and then, you know, and, and this, I guess, mostly for, for, for you, Nas, kind of what can the US government do, be doing to better partner with private industry to spur investment, to mitigate risk, these sorts of things? So, so maybe we'll start with you. Well, well, I'm happy to touch on this. I think, as Simon is mentioning, the private sector has an enormous role to play. The scope and scale of the challenges that Daphne was outlining, uh, outlining earlier are so massive on such a global scale that the idea or notion that public capital alone can solve them is not realistic. And so that's the fundamental premise. The question then is how, how do you structure that? How do you make that effective? And um, you know, at the end of the day, it really does come down primarily to money. It's about devoting investment and resources to so the solutions to some of these challenges. And from our you know, experience in this job, I've been fortunate to travel to over 30 countries. What you hear time and time again, both from governments and from the private sector, is that there is an appetite to make these investments, but that there are barriers or challenges to entering different markets that private sector companies face. Sometimes that's on the regulatory side, which is an area where the US government and other governments can play a role, but sometimes it's just in a private company's ability to assess the risk in a particular market. Um, that can be political risk. They're not sure how to deal with that sort of tail risk that most investment analysts aren't trained to manage. Sometimes it's about credit risk. You, know, you don't have as much experience in a market, it's hard to assess what um, pricing you should use or what sorts of rates um, you should charge. Those are all areas where the US government, other governments, and particularly the role of development finance institutions can play a big part. The Development Finance Corporation, for those uh, who are less familiar with the agency, is one of the newest agencies in the US federal government. It was founded in 2018 by an act of Congress called the BUILD Act. And the whole mission or theory of the case behind it was to mobilize exactly this kind of activity. Um, the US DFC has a range of financial products that it can offer directly to companies. It does not work uh, in the vast majority of cases with governments. That money is going directly to the private sector. It's in the form of political risk insurance, which helps with political risk. Uh, we do lending and equity investments, which also help with some of the other um, situations that I discussed. And we can offer terms because we're a government institution that are attractive to the private sector and these markets. For example, much longer tenor rates on bonds because some of these investments take so long to mature um, and the private capital market isn't willing to wait uh, that long to, to generate a return. So that's one way that the government can help. It's also, um, I think, amplifies or sort of suggests why we as a government are so invested in this. It's the only way to solve the challenge. But I just want to end by saying it's also not just about money. I mean, money is a major part of it, but, but it's not the only um, element. And, and this is where standards come in. This is where having companies that have done this before at an exceedingly high level, best in class, internationally best in class level um, in other markets can bring an enormous amount of expertise to new settings. And I'll give you an example. We, um, Our CEO traveled to the country of Georgia in 2022 and visited a hospital that DFC had helped f uh, finance, the American Hospital in Tbilisi, which not only was a best in class healthcare facility, uh, in Georgia that attracted not only patients from that country, but from the whole region. The process of going through, uh, the, sort of going through the process to um, earn DFC financing mm -hmm. set a new standard for that sector and really for that economy in terms of what a financial plan could look like, what a business plan could look like. We heard that repeatedly on the ground from not just members of the healthcare sector, but from other sectors as well. That's useful. It has a sustainability effect. It has a multiplier effect. And that, uh, I think, is a role the private sector can play as well. 
That's a really important point, and not one that I think people think of a lot when they think of DFC these days, but that standard setting yeah. aspect and yeah. the role there. Uh, Simon, anything to add on that? Yeah, I think you touched on the whole uh, risk point, um, and I think that's actually key to one of the, the reasons why capital isn't flowing into some of the, the global South countries. So um, if you look at uh, the, the ESG sector, for example, you're looking at 30 plus trillion dollars uh, sitting in funds in, in the US and Europe. Now, why is it that Africa is only attracting less than $10 billion in private equity when you've got so much money available. So Africa needs, it needs power, it needs water, it needs food, it needs everything that ESG funds should be doing. But if you, if you speak at ESG conferences like I do and say, right, now who wants to invest in Africa, everybody puts their heads down. I mean, the, the reality is they perceive these countries as being too risky. Um, now, they are risky. Um, China was extremely risky when we started investing there in the 90s. Uh, people like us took the risk, and, and people in America and Europe will take the risk on Africa and Latin America and other developing markets. Um, but I think here again, people like the DFC uh, have a role to play in trying to de-risk that. Uh, and you do see it with some of the embassies uh, that the US has worldwide. There are a couple of embassies in, in Africa that are extremely aggressive in terms of getting information out there, identifying the opportunities for the private sector. And, and where you have those ambassadors and their teams who are actually doing this work, you see a lot of US investment. Mm -hmm. And then you have other countries where the embassy is maybe not as supportive and you're just not seeing the investment because people are looking and going, well, you know, it, it's risky. We don't really know what's going on there. Uh, so I think. I think people like the Atlantic Council, the DFC, USAID, a lot of the US institutions from the government and, and not-for-profit and media side need to be getting the messages out there that yes, these are high-risk markets, it's not as risky as investing in, in Florida, um, but you know there are opportunities and you price that in. The U.S. has the biggest financial market in the world. The two largest stock exchanges are here in the U.S. Uh, they dwarf. The rest of the world put together is smaller than the U.S. Uh, finance industry. So that money should be going in. That is one of the U.S.'s greatest assets, and it's not being deployed. I mean, how many global South companies do you see listing in New York? Uh, the U.S. Has, has shied away from the digital finance sector, which is the fastest growing sector and is where most of the global South will be financed. So if the U.S. isn't adopting those tools, it's handing it to other countries. And in some of these different sectors, right, the United States has to, to some degree, to zero in and prioritize where we're going to focus in terms of mitigating risk and supporting private sector investment, I would think. Um, so, Simon, I just want to follow up with you in terms of, you know, where do you see the greatest opportunities for U.S. investment in different developing regions? So, for example, uh, Secretary Blinken recently in Africa was talking about enhancing food production, climate smart technologies, agricultural services. Do these seem like the right priorities to you? Does it depend very much, obviously, country by country? Um, and what would you maybe add to that list? I mean, the, the Global South is... is is massive in terms yeah. of, of difference. I mean, first of all, it's a lot of people, but you go from extremely wealthy small countries to uh, very large poor countries. So there's no one size fits all. But what you can say as a general thing is um, these countries have a less developed financial system than they would in Europe or the US or Japan. Uh, they have energy issues because the world has energy issues. Uh, how do you bring the cost of energy down and try and get it cleaner? Uh, and how do you produce more food and get that done cheaply? Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, yes, Secretary Blinken was discussing food, and that is by far right now the biggest issue in, in many countries because of food inflation here and, and you know, even in the UK. Uh, but in Africa, doubly so, because they started off with not much money. So when you double the price of food, that means they just don't have money for food. Uh, now, bizarrely, Africa has two-thirds of the world's remaining arable land. So here's a continent that's importing food uh, with money that it has to borrow at high interest rates when it has the ability to feed the whole world itself. So in terms of, of what should the U.S. be doing, well, the U.S. Is, is one of the largest agricultural producers in the world. Uh, prices for every ag agricultural good is priced in U.S. dollars. So the U.S. controls the world's food industry. Uh, why is it not taking those skills and those technologies into Africa? Uh, and how do, do these institutions uh, actually support that? Because the US knows food. And food is, is not just about 
growing the grain. It's about the water. It's about the energy. It's about the logistics, the payment systems. Uh, now, we've got projects for growing food in, in Africa, but the problem is there's no market. So if the farmer grows the food, he doesn't get paid. So why would he grow the food? There's no logistics to get it from his farm into a market. So he grows enough for himself and the village, which means the country ends up importing. Uh, if I go to them, and this is what we do, we go to them and say, I have a purchase contract. You grow the food, and we will get it to the market, which means you get paid. Now, who's the biggest consumer on the planet of just about everything? It's the US. Now, if I go with a purchase order from the US, then they will invest. So it is, in many ways, very, very simple. It's about looking at markets. When I go, when I was based in China, we used to go with purchase orders from the Chinese uh, buyers. And then the farmers all over the world would produce in Brazil or in Argentina or in South Africa. They would produce because they knew they were going to get paid, which is why China has such an attractive package. Um, and the US needs to replicate some of that and look at market forces, which is kind of what the US is supposed to be about. Um, well, we'll probably come back to that. But I, I want to shift gears a little bit uh, and ask you, Daphne. So another one of the administration's priorities is diversifying supply chains with trusted allies and partners. Um, obviously, that means engagement with you know, fellow developed democracies. But of course, it also means engagement with a lot of developing countries through which these, these supply chains would flow. So I'm curious um, you know, if anything to, to kind of um, shed light on uh, how the US engagement with the global south, with the developing world, fits into that, that broader priority. Um, well, thanks so much for the question. Um, and I think it actually connects back to the first question about how does this impact yes. the American people. Um, and obviously, COVID um, brought into sharp relief uh, the importance of having not only diversified supply chains, but resilient ones. Um, and so we've been working, again, not just with our like-minded allies and partners, but um, throughout the world to really try to build resilient, transparent, diverse and secure supply chains. Um, and just to give a couple examples of how we've been doing that. Um, so in July 2022, uh, Secretary Blinken co-hosted a supply chain ministerial with Commerce Secretary Raimondo. Um, and it brought together 18 countries. Um, and this included a di diverse array in addition to our European and Asian partners, included Brazil, included DRC, included Indonesia, who all signed up for a declaration for principles around supply chains, um, which again sort of reinforced what I just mentioned about transparency, security, openness, and diversification. We're also seeing this play out in all of our economic engagement with our partners. So there is a supply chain pillar in our Indo-Pacific economic framework, which is um, an engagement with 13 Southeast Asian mm -hmm. countries. Um, also, similarly, with our um, American Partnership for Economic Prosperity, which is with 11 Latin American countries. So this is really a through line in all of our engagements economically with what we call Global South countries. Um, and then let me give a, one more specific example, and I'm sure Nas will have um, more to say on this because I think DFC is really at the tip of the spear, but um, on these issues is our mineral security partnership, um, which is run out of state and is really focused on how you accelerate the development of clean energy supply chains. So it's really marrying up two administration priorities, right? It's the supply chain diversification, but also our global clean energy transition. And there it's really about building out the clean energy value chain from start to finish. So this is everything from extraction um, to secondary recovery, to processing, all the way up to recycling. Um, and with, through the Mineral Security Partnership, we're working um, at in five projects in Africa. We're also working in other parts of the world. And again, maybe I'll turn to Nas to speak more about the specific projects. But I think the value proposition here is that these projects are not supposed to be extractive or exploitative. They're really supposed to be about adding value to the host country's economy by being inclusive, by bringing communities in, into the process, being transparent, and then also hopefully helping these economies grow by moving up the value chain. So um, they're not just doing the extraction, but hopefully building the skills to also do um, later parts of the value chain. And then the final thing I'll say is the diversification of supply chains also goes the other way. And with the Mineral Security Partnership, I think what it really reflects is that because it's not just the US, 
costs, but it's this coalition of countries that are investing in these places. Um, the host countries are not reliant on just one investor, right? right? They are um, they have their pick of countries to choose from um, and public-private partnerships to choose from um, in developing out their own supply chains. Those are great points and a lot of things I want to come back to, including you touch about minerals. I obviously would like to dig in a little more into the critical minerals question and, and how that relates to, to competition with China in that space and our engagement in the developing world. But uh, thank you. That's fantastic. Niles, did you want to add anything? Well, I'll just add uh, with a comment at the end. I, mean, I completely agree with Daphne. This is about our values and our interests, and that's true both for the United States and for our partner countries around the world. When the U.S. is making these offerings, it's often done in partnership through the settings that Daphne mentioned. Those are formal at a strategic level. They're also formal at the very tactical project level. Um, just to give you a couple examples, DFC has signed MOUs in both uh, settings in um, East Asia and the Western Hemisphere that uh, Daphne mentioned, one with the Inter-American Development Bank in the Western Hemisphere to share diligence on projects and actually get in uh, to this work together. And then with our trilateral partners in, a uh, in Asia, we have a trilateral partnership with Japan and Korea, as well as with Japan and Australia that helps us do this work in a tactical way. Uh, but it's also about this idea we talked of at the very beginning about delivering for people with a value proposition that makes sense in the context where these projects are actually based. It's about being respectful of local conditions, making sure these projects are employing workers in the country where the investment is uh, being directed. It's about not being burdensome financially, and that is a huge part of the reason why DFC works with the private sector. Our projects don't burden public sector balance sheets because they're not to governments, and that's a core element of the strategy. Um, but at the end of the day, it's also about delivering results and projects. You know, To give you a couple examples on critical minerals, last year, uh, DFC invested over $700 million in Africa alone. Our deputy CEO, Nisha Biswal, was just in uh, the region two weeks ago to mm -hmm. make that announcement. We're thrilled about that work. We invested nearly $4 billion last year just in climate and uh, clean energy solutions around the world. It's a significant portion of our portfolio. And we also make similar investments in the health supply chain and the food supply chain that I'd be happy to talk about in more depth. As we've been discussing across the conversation, that's that's good for everyone involved. That's great. Uh, Simon, anything to add on this? Please? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the critical minerals uh, is probably one of the most obvious sectors where um, you see this this uh, competition conflict, whatever you want to call it, between uh, the U.S. and China and and other countries, um, and how to solve that issue. Because as we've seen before, and for the whole history of Africa, other countries have come in and exploited those minerals and taken them away and, and left very little behind other than pollution, um, and that's still going on to a large extent today, which has left Africa poorer and dirtier. Uh, now, how do we move away from that to the point where more of that value is left within the continent so those people can, can effectively get richer, get better educated, and start buying more products from the US and Europe and everywhere else, which is that whole capitalist virtual circle? Um, but at a very practical level, how do you convince US companies to go in there and actually invest in this? Because you've got a mine. It's dirty. Uh, where is the energy going to come from for that mine? Probably fossil fuel. Um, what about the logistics? Because you need a, a road to get there. You need warehouses to store this. Even when you've got it out of the ground, you've got to process it. That's a dirty, dirty job. Uh, are there US companies that have the ability to do that? Uh, so to, to actually achieve what you want to achieve is extremely difficult in practice. Uh, and I, I think it's going down to specific examples like that where you, you can identify where the package that the US uh, is providing is, is either working or not working. Now, the Chinese have, have had a lot of experience of putting this package together. It works very well for China, not necessarily for the countries where it, it's uh, been investing. Um, what package is the US offering to counter that? So if you're going to one of these countries like DRC, uh, which historically the Chinese were, uh, were heavily involved in. What is the US offering today to the president who just got reelected um, from a very practical point of view? I mean, it's, is there a company in the US that will process those minerals? Or are they just going to dig them out of the ground and send them somewhere else? Yeah. Uh, and if I want to go and do that, are you going to give me a loan? 
or am I going to get US exim finance? Is the State Department going to support me in these actions? Because the Chinese have an incredible infrastructure in many countries in the global south supporting their industry. Uh, it's a fantastic package. They give insurance, they give free money, they give diplomatic support. It's an unbelievable package that enables Chinese businesses to win most of these contracts all around the world. The US has to match that. Uh, and that's really the challenge for the US. Uh, it's, it's going and coming up with a better product. It's not the sort of big uh, philosophical thing. Because at a very practical level, people in these countries, they want to get richer because they're poor. They want to have education for their kids. They want health care. They want food. They want water. Now, if you don't provide it, they'll get it from somewhere else. Uh, and right now, they're getting it from China. And this is why the US is, is perceived to be losing out, because it, its package is just not good enough. And I mean, and I'm curious if you guys have responses to that, but I, I think this is something we've been talking about throughout the conference. I mean, I think just in the last conference in the technology panel this morning, we were saying, well, the best way to compete with China is to is to actually compete. And I think the messaging there was that I, obviously there has been progress made. I think we've all seen that in the last few years, but there's a lot more uh, that needs to be done because China is offering such a great alternative uh, and, and a packaged alternative that hits a lot of these different um, factors that need to be brought to bear. Anything uh, to add on what Simon just said or to jump in? Well, well two comments that I think are helpful, and it's, a, it's an incredibly useful perspective. At the end of the day, it all comes down to delivering. I think that's one of the themes of the conversation so far. You know, we have seen over the last few years, and I've been um, briefed recently on some interesting data that's come out in the past few months on the trajectory of Chinese development financing. It's peaked in 2016. It's gone down quite a bit since then. And over the past couple of years, the United States has actually eclipsed it. So I think there's an element of the story here that is grounded in a historical perspective. There's the future. And the future looks like it's shaping up to be uh, potentially different. The other thing I'll note is that uh, one of the enduring strengths for the United States is our approach to doing this with partners and allies that has been fundamental to uh, the administration's approach on a whole range of foreign policy issues, not just those that are relevant for this conversation. But it's also been structural as well. And I'll give you one example. At the Development Finance Corporation, we, uh, our predecessor agency actually had to invest in US companies or projects that had a US nexus. That is no longer true. Mm -hmm. um, so when, we, when I'm referencing dollar figures or talking about specific projects, sometimes those are with Indian companies or British companies or Japanese companies or Korean companies or multiple companies. Sometimes it's with a foreign company and a foreign government. That type of lattice work, that partnership, massively increases the opportunity set, the opportunity, I think, and hopefully um, ability to deliver in the way that Simon was discussing. You know, of course, you need to go down to the project level to talk about specific examples of where that can work. But those two sort of elements, I think, are worth adding to the mix. That's a really important point. I don't think that that's, that's understood as well, that that shift has been made from OPIC to, D, to DFC. Um, and then you bring me to kind of where I want to go in the conversation, which is the allies and partners piece, which, of course, has been discussed throughout the conference. Um, and you mentioned this a little bit already, Naz, but the, speak a little bit more perhaps about how DFC is working with other development finance institutions in other countries uh, at the multilateral level, level, African Development Bank, you already mentioned IADB. Mm -hmm. um, and then you know, we turn to, to Daphne for more perhaps on working with allies on the kind of uh, infrastructure and financing, and well, not fin in the infrastructure piece, the other kind of alternatives, PGII, Global Gateway, what the Japanese are doing, what the Indians are doing, what the Koreans are doing to some extent. Um, so I'd be curious, you know, your thoughts on, on how that's going and, and um, how centrally the administration views those partnerships. Yeah, well, um, I'll be brief because, as you mentioned, Dave, we talked about some of this. Uh, but I'll give you three examples. The uh, Development Finance Corporation recently signed at the President's uh, American uh, Partnership for Economic Prosperity Summit in November a partnership with IDB. Uh, to share projects, share diligence, share uh, information, co-invest and co-finance with one another where we can, but where we can't, just to pass off good opportunities and ideas to each other. It's a part of this push to get tactical uh, and deliver at the ground level. We have a similar partnership, as I mentioned, with uh, partners and countries in Asia. Um, and then the third I'd, I'd like to just emphasize is our work with European allies mm -hmm. to help um, in the wake of Russia's reinvasion of Ukraine. We signed MOUs with EBRD, with uh, EIB, 
um, with other uh, players, other DFIs in Europe, to try and channel our collective resources to do as much as we can to invest in Ukraine today. And uh, we've invested actually over $400 million in Ukraine already just since uh, over the past year and since the start of the war. And there's opportunity to do that on the ground right away, even in the run up to reconstruction, but also to invest in our allies and partners around Ukraine to help them diversify where they are receiving their energy, for example, to help invest uh, in their long term economic resilience. Those partnerships unlock all kinds of opportunities. Some of you may be familiar with one of the landmark investments the US government made last year. We helped uh, the government of Ecuador essentially reissue its debt. Mm -hmm. um, this debt for nature swap is what it's called, saved the government hundreds of millions of dollars on their public balance sheet, but it also created a fund for conservation of the Galapagos Islands. That's good for the environment. It's good for conservation in that country. It actually creates a significant number of jobs in the ocean economy in and around um, those islands. But it also, uh, of course, on the strategic competition side, is a totally different approach to dealing with financial distress at the sovereign level. So that's one example of what this can do. There are others across the world that I'm happy to share. But um, those partnerships are central to how we're approaching the work. That's great. Uh, and, and Daphne, to you. So, so on the infrastructure piece, where do you see some of that collaboration with allies and partners, but also more broadly than that, where else do you see that those partnerships with allies in the developing world as being most important? And where are the, the greatest challenges that you would kind of see in terms of partnering um, with countries that, yes, there are allies or partners, but maybe we have different priorities in what we're trying to achieve uh, in the developing world vis-a-vis -vis competition with China or just, just generally? Yeah, thanks for that. I mean, first, I would just say that um, our engagement and our vast constellation of allies and partners is really the United States secret sauce. This is really our comparative advantage on the world stage. Um, and when we talk about or think about sort of what are the challenges um, when it comes to working with them on strategic competition, I guess I would push back and say, if we were trying to create coalitions based on what we're against, mm -hmm. we would have a lot of challenges. But what we're doing is really building these coalitions, and, and they're, ver they're taking various forms based on um, the specific issue set and problem we're trying to solve. But we're really doing it um, based on what we're for. And so I'll just go back to you know, taking a step back as to what is our broader vision for, for the international order. And it's one um, where we have a free world, an open world, a prosperous world, and a secure world. And that's, um, I think, a vision that most countries can get behind. And when we lead with that, that's one that I think a lot of countries want to work together on to help build, preserve, um, update, and modernize. And so. Um, going back to your question specifically on, on infrastructure, there I think what we saw was that there is this clear infrastructure, infrastructure gap in developing countries, um, and we have seen the PRC come in and fill that, but there still is a yearning for, I think, sustainable quality infrastructure that doesn't come with the negative externalities of environmental degradation or um, internal displacement or lack of transparency and some of these other issues that I think Nas got to um, unsustainable debt burdens. And so what we're really trying to do is work um, through the G7 to provide an alternative. Um, you've probably heard our secretary say this multiple times. Um, we don't want to make countries choose, but we want to give them a choice. And so um, the Partnership for Global Infrastructure and Investment, PGI, is really one of those choices and offers. How do we provide a better offer to developing countries? And so um, through PGI, again, this is in coordination with the G7, we have already mobilized um, $30 billion towards a broader goal of mobilizing $600 billion um, by 2027. And so um, our one of our landmark projects is in um, Africa and the Lobita Corridor, and it's really about creating a connection between the port in Lobito um, to across DRC to Zambia. And um, the whole idea behind PGI and these core Doors is um, to build transportation connectivity, to build digital connectivity, um, to create clean energy jobs, um, and sort of lay them over one another to, for these transformative investments. Um, so there, recently, we announced that it's not just the US doing this work, but we're doing it in partnership with the EU. Um, similarly, a couple months ago, we announced the India Middle East Corridor, IMEC, um, which is in partnership with India, 
the Saudis, the UAE, and our European partners to connect um, in all sorts of ways between Europe and Asia through the Middle East. So these are some of the ways that we're working specifically in the infrastructure piece. I'd also just note quickly, um, we also have other ways that we're partnering with um, our allies and partners for investments in developing countries. One clear example is the Just Energy Transition Partnerships. So these are investments, again, leveraging public sector dollars um, to encourage more public, uh, private sector investment towards clean energy transitions. And right now we have those partnerships in Vietnam, South Africa, and um, Indonesia. Um, another example of this is a um, recent health security partnership we have with the AU called VAX, where we're really trying to build the long-term health security of these countries um, by boosting agricultural productivity, helping build um, crops that are resilient to climate change. Um, and I think getting to Simon's point, moving away from just um, aid and really trying to build the long-term resiliencies of these countries and doing it with our allies and partners. That's great. Uh, thank you. That was a lot of a lot of great information, and I think you know um, it, some of it touches on what I think has been some themes throughout this conference thus far, which is you know a sense, true or not, that China is engaging more on the ground in a lot of these countries, and the U.S. is not showing up to some extent. Um, there was some discussion of you know what's the what's the solution to a lot of these problems, not just the U.S. government, but also in the private sector get on a plane and get to these places and actually be on the ground and experience it. Um, some discussion around um, the fact that you know China is uh, offering um, trainings uh, across different domains to folks uh, to come from the developing world to come to China, um, and that uh, we're not doing that as much as we could be. We're not necessarily uh, doing enough to ensure that, that uh, we're, we're cultivating talent in the tech sector in a lot of these in a lot of these countries, um, and part of that would be a problem with our with our visa regime. So, um, not just a question for you, Daphne, but maybe for the group: Is there more that you feel we could be doing more broadly, uh, the United States, but also you know other allied countries, to be engaging um, in a people-to-people -people way on the ground uh, in a lot of these countries, being more open to having folks come to the United States because we have, of course, still the best educational institutions in the world. We have a lot of things that are very attractive uh, that China still does not does not have. So, uh, open that up to anyone who wants to jump in. Maybe Simon. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think um, I remember when DSC was formed, and I think it, it's been a huge plus for the U.S. Uh, what's happened with DSC and the initiatives, and, and that's growing all the time. As you say, that they're expanding their mandates, so uh, we've actually seen that on the ground. Projects getting funded by DSC, so uh, I'd, I'd love to see you guys expand a lot more. I think you need more physical presence on the ground as opposed to most of it currently run from Washington. So. I think expanding that is, is a great thing. I think the State Department as well. I think a lot of the US institutions have um, definitely upped their game. They were starting from scratch pretty much, uh, but they are getting better all the time. Um, I think one of the problems and sort of the pushbacks that I've seen at a practical level is that sometimes the US is, is tying its packages too much to a set of um, political philosophies that don't necessarily match with the countries it's operating in. Um, the, what the Chinese call cultural colonialism. Uh, and I think that is a major pushback in a lot of the countries that we operate. Where there's a feeling that the US is trying to impose its culture on the countries. Uh, and there's certainly been a huge resistance. Uh, and I was speaking with one of the African presidents about three weeks ago here in DC. Uh, and he said he'll take the package from China, even though it's not as good as the US, because the US wants to force its religious and other beliefs on his country, and that's not acceptable to his people. So I think that the US is being heavy-handed in certain instances. Uh, we were trying to do some business in Uganda. Uh, clearly, that didn't go well because of the US changed position on Uganda. Now, that's a huge problem for the private sector. Because if we're investing in infrastructure, which could take 10 to 15 years to get our money back, if there are changes in the US uh, stance on a country, which means they can no longer export into the US market, and we're investing on the basis of those, those businesses are allowed to export, we've lost our investment. Now, we need to price that into our decision of whether to invest in that country. And, and the answer is no, we won't. Um, so I think that is a major problem at, at your level. Uh, because that it means that you're just massively increasing our risk. 
I'm curious what, if, if, if Naz or Daphne, if you have thoughts on this, because this has been kind of a key point that has kept coming back to throughout the conference on different sides of the issue, right? We hear um, what you're saying about cultural colonialism. We had Bill Harry Kafsikan talking about the U.S. Uh, being too preachy and that turning off some countries. But you also have, you know, um, in the discussions uh, that in Latin America, the kind of values proposition that the U.S. offers is our strongest uh, point. Uh, in Africa, uh, Afrobarometer polling showing that despite the fact that there's generally positive views of engagement of uh, with China, that there's overwhelmingly a desire for, you know, democratic forms of, of government. Um, and also points made during our governance and rights discussion about the fact um, that you know, if you're engaging just at the elite level, you don't necessarily know what's what the public want from the civil society bottom-up perspective. So I think I think there's no right answer to this. I think it's a, a valid point. I think it's it's kind of one of these these points that uh, that there's no uh, solid answer to yet that involves I, I think need more people, investigation. You know, do they want freedom? Do they want a good legal system? Do they want to end to corruption? Everybody around the world would say the same thing. Yeah, that's what we want. Yeah. We want safety, security. We want a better future for our kids. So, I mean, if you ask them that question, then the answer is yes. Um, and if you ask the average American, do you believe in, in American policies and American culture? Most Americans would say yes, we have a great culture. But I think if you tied uh, federal support in certain states in the U.S. to the right to abortion, uh, you would have a kickback from a lot of people within the U.S. Um, so uh, it's a similar thing when you go into other countries. If you are tying this aid to things which are just not acceptable to the local people, um, you will get kickback, yeah, and you I would in this country as well. That's a, that's a related point as well, related question on, on those. Any, anything else to add on that? Anyone else? Okay. Nos? Well, I, mean, I guess one quick thought would be to say, um, you know, all of this is part of a clearly a much larger conversation, but two of the themes that keep coming up to me as we debate and discuss these ideas are the notions of sustainability and accessibility. Mm -hmm. And on the sustainability front, that, you know, has a particular meaning. Of course, we, we mean in terms of the financial sustainability of the investment, it's environmental sustainability, but um, fundamentally it's about uh, the market-driven element of this. If there is a demand on the ground for a particular investment and we can help meet that demand, that's a much more sustainable approach than some sort of top-down approach, approach with specific conditions. That's core to the model. I yeah. think that um, you, know, you can talk about particular situations where there may be some differences, but at the sort of broad level, it is a fundamental difference between how we're operating and I think how other um, countries might approach this work. And then on the accessibility side, I mean, this goes all the way back to the beginning to what we were talking about with the first question, why should we be investing the resources in um, getting out into the world and expanding uh, this work? Um, DSC has been uh, in a position to expand its overseas presence. That is something I think, Simon, that you're very right to call out at the end of the day. If you're accessible on the ground, it increases outcomes on all of these dimensions. We're also trying to be more accessible in Washington. We've just announced that we're um, organizing our team around our sector priorities, which are energy, infrastructure, including critical minerals and uh, technological infrastructure, health and agriculture, and small business support. So that makes it a lot easier to know where to go, depending on what you need. But there's, of course, more we can do on that front. It has to be part of this broader conversation of how we're making sure we're delivering for people around the world and here in the United States. Yeah, uh, I, that's great points. I, I want to follow up with you um, just to get a little more granularity. Just uh, I think everyone would be interested to learn a little bit more about how a DFC makes its decisions as to which mm -hmm. projects to, to invest and finance in. Um, how do you balance the merits of individual projects when you make decisions about, about what yeah. you're going to finance um, with uh, you know, the kind of strategic, more foreign policy yeah. considerations right around perhaps where China might be interested for strategic reasons and obviously where the U.S. for strategic geopolitical reasons uh, feels the need to, to give more attention yeah. and give more support? Well, maybe to start at the project level and then expand a little bit into the overall strategy, every project that DFC invests in has to meet a range of standards on both the development side and the foreign policy side. We're assessing our projects for their development impact. We're assessing them uh, for their compliance with U.S. sanctions policy. We do know your customer vetting, um, for example. But we're also looking at the foreign policy impact of those transactions as well, and that is all part of the assessment that then gets put forward to our board if it's a, um, a transaction that has to go to our Board, which many do mm -hmm. um, for assessment. So that's at the project level. At the sort of strategic level, a lot of it comes down to how you organize that sector strategy that I mentioned. That's a key you know, way of suggesting to the world, this is how we're going to prioritize where we work. 
same with the overseas expansion you know, strategy. We obviously, uh, maybe not obviously, at the moment we cannot put someone in every country in the world. So the countries where we are putting people is a signal of what we'd like to prioritize. But fundamentally and sort of built into the model are all these ideas that we've been talking about, about sustainability, mobilizing private capital. That in its own sense is a strategy, and it's a strategy that's bipartisan. It's a strategy uh, that has earned wide uh, support within the interagency. It's why we work so closely with Daphne, her team, and the State Department more generally. It's why we're part of the Partnership for Global Infrastructure and Investment. Um, this connects to so many other elements of what we're trying to accomplish. So it's it's embedded in the mission. It's embedded in our organization, and it also gets reflected at every project uh, in our assessment. That's great, and that, that leads me to kind of my, my last question before we go to some great audience questions I, I see uh, here, um, which is to the point about how to um, prioritize and coordinate across the U.S. government, and maybe I'd turn especially to Nas and, and, and to Daphne on this. I asked the same question of, uh, of Assistant Administrator uh, Schiffer. You know, we have, um, you know, the idea now that we are, to some extent, competing with China all around the globe. Um, we have uh, DFC, State, USAID, XM, all these different agencies that are involved in this. To what extent do you think there is effective coordination happening across the U.S. government right now to figure out where those um, scarce resources should be going and how different uh, agencies should be partnering on these issues uh, to really achieve maximum effect from uh, from uh, the U.S. government in the uh, in the kind of whole of government kind of terminology that we use these days, uh, focusing on on priorities. Yeah, I think this is a great question, and I think actually we've come a really long way. And here in Washington, I think we're really doing a good job of coordinating in diagnosing the problem, figuring out what is the right tool for, for addressing that problem, um, and then working together throughout implementation to ensure that we're still staying true to um, the strategic vision behind a particular project. I would say, going back to maybe something Simon said, where I think we um, can still improve is how we present that coordination on the ground. And by that I mean, China is coming with the whole package. And we, in fact, have the whole package. Mm -hmm. It's just that we're showing up at different times and we're not necessarily providing and presenting that whole suite of tools when we're engaging with local governments or local populations. So we go in and say, we're happy to do an assessment. We're happy to provide trainers to um, get you up to speed on negotiation tactics. Um, we will help you with the monitoring and evaluation at the end, but we're all doing this sort of piecemeal um, when we're on the ground, even if back here at home we are, I think, thinking through that whole life cycle of a project. So it's partly about, I think, just telling our story better, but I think it's also about coordinating on the ground so that um, host governments and populations, when they're engaging with us, know that they're not only getting a whole package, but they almost have a one-stop shop to go to to just make the whole transaction much more seamless and efficient. That's great. Uh, Naz, anything to add? I, I couldn't agree more. We have a very strong bottoms-up approach. We're doing a much better job in Washington of connecting it top-down, but I think we can tell our story better around the world. One, one other thing I'll be open about, too, is that part of doing this work at the standards level that we've discussed over the course of this conversation takes work. It takes work to do the additional feasibility studies yeah. or the additional environmental studies, and that takes time. Um, you know, The government is not does not operate as quickly as a private sector timeline. I think that is not a statement that will shock anyone. And I think we have work to do to get close to that. We might not ever be able to get all the way there because of what we're trying to ensure these projects do the standards that they meet. But that's an area, too, where we can continue to coordinate better on the interagency side. But it, the strides have been significant. It's a function of some of the initiatives that we've talked about in the past. It's a function of the connectivity between our teams, both in Washington and around the world. But especially out in the global uh, south, the focus of this conference, it's a resource question, too. Not every agency has someone on the ground, and therefore it makes it a lot more difficult to do, I think, exactly what uh, Daphne is right to call out as the core uh, element of what we should be doing in telling our story. That's great. Well, you both touched on telling our story, which yeah. gets to the uh, one of the questions we have here. I mean, we've talked a lot about the kind of concrete things the U.S. government is uh, doing and could be doing more of and how that relates to the private sector. But a lot of this comes down to messaging. It comes down to to, um, to how the public is kind of understanding what the U.S. is doing or what China is doing in many cases. Um, so uh, the question here related to that is, uh, the Chinese government and companies are very effective at getting local media coverage and hype around proposed aid and investment. 
even when that money doesn't materialize or is less than what the US uh, or the EU are offering. But many local publics end up oblivious to that fact. Is there discussion within the US about doing uh, this telling our story, doing this messaging, doing this type of PR better, so the publics have a more accurate understanding of what U.S. is doing to help local development, what could be, what more could be done in this space. Uh, so open that up to anyone who wants to comment. Simon. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll come from the customer point of view. Um, uh, I think the U.S. government has a lot of money uh, and a lot of great technology and a lot of great solutions. Um, I live here in DC, this is what I do for a living. I probably only know 5% of what the US government's offering. It's so difficult to figure out what exists. And once you find it, you sit there and go, oh my god, this is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, it is, it's extremely difficult to find out what's happening. I think the idea of having one platform that coordinates uh, is definitely needed because you, people like us need to go to one department, not get shunted from, we're doing a project here in the US and it's, it's six different departments within the government and we're four years into it now and we're still doing paperwork. I mean, it, it's a nightmare getting through this system. Um, so it does need improving. I think the, the media message, um, the US has been extremely bad at this. Uh, and China has been very good at getting its message across about the good stuff it's doing and the bad stuff the US is doing. Uh, how you solve that, though, is a problem because um, the US is a, is a private sector-run economy. Uh, the US should not be funding propaganda campaigns saying, look how good we are. That's not how the US works. Other countries do, which is why they're getting their message out much better than the US. Um, but I think one of the things we looked at, and you know, we've discussed with various groups here is, um, is getting messages out about what the US is doing from a positive perspective. So the success stories that you're talking about, the minerals thing, which is huge, but nobody has heard of it. I heard of it because <laughs> I'm on the press releases, but the, the reality is that most people don't read the press releases and they're not seeing this and it's just not getting out in the media. Um, uh, and there needs to be more of an effort from the US government to, to you know, shout about its successes because it's doing a lot, but people don't realize it. I was at an IDB meeting before Christmas. I was speaking on one of the panels. And the IDB was saying they have more money than they have projects because nobody knows they're giving out money. Um, and, and the guy was sitting through and going what he's offering to the Caribbean nations. And I'm going, Christ, I want some of that. I didn't <laughs> know. Uh, so there is an incredible range of stuff the U.S. is doing. And on the technology side, it's the same. I spent two hours this morning talking to a U.S. technology company, which has an incredible solution for uh, off-grid electricity. Now, they're actually funded by the DOE here. Uh, and they're talking to us about how they can expand into the global south. Um, now, you know, nobody here, you guys have probably never heard of it. Um, most of the world haven't heard of this company. Uh, but it's already raised hundreds of millions of dollars. It is a great solution. And I was chatting while I was in Europe uh, to Ukraine about whether they should implement it. And they just said, please, bring it over straight away. Um, so there's a great story, and nobody's telling it. Uh, and, and I think that's a shame, because the US should be shouting about it. You know, when, when US makes all these aid donations, um, nobody knows. I mean, you know, other countries put it sort of two cents, and the US comes up with $100 million, and, and the country that puts up the two cents gets the credit. Well, Simon, you've inspired me. Let me, uh, <laughs> Maybe, let me. Yeah, we're, we're over time, so last, <laughs> last comments from, uh, from each of you. <laughs> yeah, I'll, yeah. Be, I'll be quick. Um, the US government and the Development Finance Corporation are open for business. Uh, DFC last year invested $9.3 billion in private sector companies around the world. I think most people do not know that. That was a record for the institution. The year before was a record for the institution. And that year, we invested $7.4 billion. So the growth is significant. If you know companies or you happen to work at a company or represent a company that's looking for uh, debt support, debt financing, equity investments, uh, political risk insurance in countries around the world, you can come to DFC. But if you're looking um, for other kinds of products, there's all sorts of tools that are available to you in the US government. Our colleagues at the State Department, our colleagues who work on the Partnership for Global Infrastructure and Investment team can help direct you to that. Uh, I'm sure Daphne will have more to say on this, but uh, please do be in touch and please do spread the word. That's one small thing we can do to start telling the story better uh, in addition to some of the broader challenges that we were discussing earlier. Yeah, and um, since this is our concluding remarks, I'll just say that um, just going back, I think, to the, the 
um, original point about our vision and you know where we draw our source of strength. And I think it is the fact that we've got a free, open, pluralistic, and really diverse society. So when we think about how do we tell our story, I think uh, building on something Simon said, it's not just the US government telling that story. It's the private sector going out and telling that story. It's civil society going out and telling that story. It's our massive diaspora communities who have the relationships with the populations on the ground in many of these global south countries. So I think when we think about um, amplifying our efforts, it's really doing it um, with what is the greatest source of strength for us as um, a country, which is just our inclusive, empowering um, system that allows for multiple voices with multiple views to really get out and um, share our story. Great. Well, that is a fantastic point to end on. Uh, thank you, Daphne. Thank you, Naz. Thank you, Simon. I think we uh, covered the waterfront here in terms of what the U.S. is already doing in the Global South and, and what, what is yet to come, what we perhaps could be doing better and building on some of those successes, as well as at the end here really talking about uh, getting that, that word out about what, what is already happening and what is, what is to come. So thank you very much for a great panel. Uh, let's thank our panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and we will now take a 10-minute break uh, when we will come back for our final panel uh, where we will talk about uh, our allies and their perspectives on these issues. Thank you.
A warm welcome to this final session of the China in the Global South Conference organized by the Atlantic Council's Global China Hub and our partners at the University of Notre Dame. My name is Jan Fleck. I'm the Senior Director of the Europe Center here at the Atlantic Council and I'm delighted to be here with our partners to explore the issues around the allied alternative in the Global South. Uh, we, we'll, we'll turn at the, at the end of this one and a half days of rich discussions around the subject to a perspective from allies. This has come up throughout the discussions over the last day and a half and a, a long regional and technological, financial and governance issues. We will explore how major capitals around the world are looking at engagement with the global south and providing some alternatives to Chinese economic influence and political influence that has become entrenched in, in across continents. Um, for many in the United States, in Europe and Asia, this issue really came into much sharper focus in the context of both the pandemic, the, the back to back shocks of the pandemic and uh, Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine, the dependencies and vulnerabilities that highlighted uh, on, on the economic front, and then, of course, against the background of accelerating debates around economic security and de-risking um, in this geopolitical context. In this session, we'll look at two at, at how two major European allies look at engagement with the Global South and providing some alternatives to Chinese influence. So we're delighted to have with us Axel Dietmann, Deputy Chief of Mission at uh, the German Embassy here in Washington, D.C., someone who served as ambassador, German ambassador to Serbia, has a rich career covering Western Balkans issues, experience at the United Nations, um, and on many aspects of EU affairs. Joining us also is James Roscoe, Deputy Head of Mission at the British Embassy uh, here in Washington, D.C., former U.K. Ambassador to the U.N. General Assembly, served in the Prime Minister's Office, and also with experience in Africa and Sierra Leone, I believe. Um, so we're looking forward to that conversation. A quick point on housekeeping, you can submit your questions here for the in-person audience, but also for our virtual audience through askac.org. Um, and we will come in the, in the latter part of our conversation uh, to questions from the audience. So start thinking about your questions, but let's kick off with you, Mr. Dittmann, um, and give us an idea, A, how the German government in Germany is thinking about engagement with the Global South, providing an alternative to the Chinese vision and, and involvement uh, across many regions, and why, why this is important right now, and why make this a priority as Germany has with its uh, G7 pre uh, presidency two years ago, um, a lot of engagement travels by the chancellor, vice chancellor, mm -hmm. to Latin America, to Africa, and other regions. Why this priority, and, and how are you thinking about this engagement? So, Jörn, thanks so much for, for having the opportunity together with uh, uh, my British colleague to, to be part of, of this panel. Um, interestingly, I find the, the um, um, alternative or the, 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 the view of, uh, of uh, European partners, I mean, of course, we um, we work very closely together with the U.S. Uh, in the engagement on the on the global south, but just before the parenthesis, I um, would like to say that I feel that our engagement with countries from the so-called global south, and it's of course a very heterogeneous group, is I think not something which nobody is nobody like, likes the term, but everyone has to use it. So I would say it's not like a, a new concept. Uh, I would like to say that I mean these are important partners for. Uh, for a very long time, and I think they are indispensable partners to, to solve uh, like uh, for prosperity generation, economic prosperity for them, for us, um, to solve like issues like uh, um, climate change, combating climate change is, uh, is a global challenge, so this is something we have to address with everyone together. 
uh, is also now, some issues, I totally agree, have come more into focus now, uh, global supply chain, critical minerals, et cetera. So there's a very wide area of issues where we want to cooperate. Also, of course, on issues like global governance. Um, to do all this, uh, uh, um, we are um, working bilaterally. We have a, a lot of uh, bilateral exchange, direct investment by our companies, uh, uh, bilateral agreements. Uh, um, we are working, of course, uh, with our European partners. Um, we have the, the concept of, uh, of Global Gateway. Maybe we can talk about it later a bit more, mm. which is also about uh, infrastructure investment. Uh, another issue where we, and, and there comes the issue of coordinating with, with partners towards so-called Global South. I think very important is the coordination uh, in the G7 framework um, uh, with the United States, with Japan, uh, United Kingdom. So that is really uh, uh, an important uh, framework. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to mention one last point, uh, um, which is an instrument also we are using uh, related uh, again to the European Union is of course our uh, trade free trade agreements, I think that is a, a very important uh, um, element to, to, to engage with countries of the Global South, to engage worldwide, and which really is beneficial to both sides. So maybe this, to kick it off. Thanks for setting the table a little bit. Um, and we'll, we'll come to these various elements of free trade that you mentioned, cooperation, different formats. We'll come to that in, in the course of our, our conversation, but I want to turn to you, uh, Mr. Roscoe, and, and get get the UK perspective. Uh, Mr. Dietmann said nothing new, really, but maybe an intensified effort. Mm -hmm. How is how is the UK looking at the urgency of this now, and is there a need for for a new approach? So I, I think I'd absolutely agree. There's nothing new here. I think what's fascinating is, of course, if you look at the Cold War, there was huge competition for influence in what we would define as the Global South during that era. And perhaps, you know, as after the fall of the Berlin Wall, as the West found itself ascendant um, for a period, um, arguably, you know, we got into a pattern of complacency in some of those relationships. And certainly from the UK perspective, from the late 90s onwards, we had a very intense um, development push and I think became a, a world leader in terms of our development relationships. I think the big difference is a bit like the Cold War. We've now got a situation where we have someone who offers a different vision um, for how the world should work. And I think that our engagement now with, and I also don't particularly like the term the Global South, but our engagement with um, countries uh, outside of the Euro-Atlantic area um, is cognizant of that competition and cognizant of the idea that we now need to offer an alternative vision um, and that our investment, our relationship needs to in some ways be an advertisement um, for the, um, the framework that we would encourage them to, to embrace. So I think when you look at um, the sort of post-1945 model, when you look at multilateralism through the UN, through the UN Charter, the context of the rule of law, um, the, context, the concept of world trade and the WTO, I think what we're trying to do is defend that vision and defend those structures um, against uh, a power in China who would, who would seek out an alternative. And just you mentioned my, my time in Sierra Leone. I mean, uh, back in the days when Chinese diplomats would talk to us a little more freely, I sort of was sat with one of my Chinese colleagues in Freetown and I said, you know, this is what we're trying to achieve through our development model. Um, what are you trying to achieve? And he said, well, we're not really interested in any anti-corruption stuff. We're not here to lecture people on democracy. Um, we're not here to lecture people on how their courts should work. We just want economic growth. But frankly, if they want to look and govern a bit more like us, we'd quite like that too. And if they want to agree with us in places like the UN, we'd quite like that too. So I think it was quite interesting to get that insight. You, you touched on a very important point. It's not just a different vision, it's also different terms of engagement, right, from, from the Chinese side. Um, what strategies, how is Germany looking at providing that alternative through different strategies? You already touched on a few points, but would like to come back to that from, from the 100,000 foot level, actually down, down to a few more concrete initiatives. Well, uh, let's, let's speak uh, uh, about, uh, f 
I think developing a bit on, on what, uh, what James said, uh, the, the, the engagement uh, with specific countries, uh, um, uh, financing, um, infrastructure, um, I think that's an important uh, element. We have on the Chinese side the Belt and Road Initiative, which uh, um, gives a lot of, uh, uh, makes important um, infrastructure investments. Uh, uh, the way it's done is, uh, um, I think, uh, through no con real conditionality, uh, uh, good governance, etc. Um, the question is also uh, creating um, um, an element of uh, dependency through uh, provision, through loans, um, I think uh, rather also uh, which uh, leaves the country with a burden with debt quite a bit. Um, and then the question is also how much uh, uh, local content, how much uh, local uh, capability is, are, are, are being created. And I think w we set together with our partners uh, with the, um, in the G7 uh, in the European Union. Uh, I think it started off in our presidency also of the G7 in the ELMAO uh, um, declaration. Uh, and it's something where we have the PGII. Um, and concept and in the European Union, of course, the concept of global gateway, uh, which is really uh, collaborative. It is uh, um, good governance. It is also creating uh, sustainability on the ground, uh, really not just exploiting, taking things out, but really creating a local industry uh, um, and, and uh, therefore much uh, stronger value creation on the ground. But what we have to do is really to, uh, we believe it's a very good uh, alternative. A global gateway, I think, is to the tune of uh, uh, 300 billion um, um, euro uh, in the next years. And uh, what we have to do is to um, offer a better alternative. So uh, the recipient country really can choose. And uh, uh, we believe it's a strong offer that we can make. Uh, and uh, and so, so this is something where um, we have to compete. Uh, and we believe we have a really a strong product to sell. James, are you similarly confident in the package uh, uh, that you, that the UK and and you know other European or Asian partners can offer these countries? Well, first of all, I think I'm confident in the broader package. So I'm confident in capitalism. I'm confident in the rule of law. I'm confident in the value of private property, and I'm confident in the value of a state which bears down on corruption, so it doesn't interfere. Um, with economics. So broadly speaking, the UK thinks that that's the secret source for developmental success. So yes, I'm confident in that. Um, I suppose what I would say is our, our, our development offer needs to be a bit more sophisticated than it's been. I think we probably walked into places like Sierra Leone just after the conflict in 2004 saying, guys, this is what you need to do. Um, and I think that we've now got to the point where we're a lot better at saying, right, let's set, sit down and listen. Let's understand this country knows itself much better than we as the donor ever will. Um, what do they want out of the development relationship? Um, how can we explain in terms that, you know, rebuilding their legal system to make it effective is going to be a key component of their economic growth? Um, how can we listen? So if they say we really need to help us on the education side and the health side, that's where we're making the investment. So I think maybe that's a slight subtle difference that um, uh, it's become a lot more of a conversation. And certainly um, the assistance packages we're putting together now are based on those conversations and based on a much more conversational um, exchange rather than a didactic model. And I think that's been, that's been incredibly important. Um, if I, I can ask, are you seeing some initial success stories of this difference in tone and, and approach that, that you can refer to? Yeah, I mean, I think across the board, um, I think that countries are very receptive. Um, I think that um, where we've seen a lot of difference will probably be in our relationship with small and developing uh, states, particularly island states who are vulnerable to climate change, where you know, they have set the agenda on climate very, very clearly in terms of um, the mitigation that they, they want to look for, the investment in, in clean growth, the investment in renewable energy. So from the Caribbean to the Pacific, I think um, we've seen a realization on our side that the way into the development relationship is through recognizing the existential climate crisis. Similar question to Axel about 
some success stories. Is this new approach gaining traction in, in your opinion? I believe so. Um, if we take a concrete example, uh, um, picking up uh, on this is, uh, I think, the Partners for the Blue Pacific, um, um, coordinated, uh, I think, here, discussed here. Uh, we are both uh, members of that. It's something where we uh, uh, really give, uh, provide uh, uh, value added uh, uh, for, for, for the, the partner countries uh, in the, um, the so-called uh, uh, Blue Continent. Um, and we um, are really looking what can we offer concretely. For example, in climate change, there's a number of, of very concrete uh, initiatives. We uh, coordinate with the partners who does what, so there's no duplic uh, uh, duplication of, of efforts. Um, uh, um, look at my notes, uh, for example, I believe that we are having a bit of a lead, very focused on a project called the Pacific Humanitarian Warehousing Program, yeah, which is uh, Im important to, to pre-position humanitarian emergency supplies for 14 Pacific countries. So this, this is something where um, we, we really um, um, provide something very concrete, um, thinking about uh, picking up on what I said before, um, with the uh, Global Gateway, there's also some very, very concrete uh, projects which uh, bring a lot of value added. Uh, satellite connectivity in Central Asia, Copernicus, Mirasite in the Philippines, uh, a number of underground uh, um, fiber cables. So I think these are, are things which uh, really uh, um, bring value added. You already jumped to my next question in many ways, to um you know, we, you talked about green investment, uh, green transition investments. There's also the component of digital and ICT uh, infrastructure and, 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 and investments. How's the UK thinking about that component of engagement, whether it's in Latin America, Africa, uh, elsewhere? Well, I, think, I think the first thing I would say is um, we need to be really clear that this can't just be about development assistance and um, direct budgetary support or other direct support. We've got to harness the private sector and we've got to harness capital more effectively. And I know the last mm. panel talked a bit about this. Um, we're incredibly lucky that we have the City of London. It's a hugely important resource in terms of mobilizing private sector capital to invest in um, a whole swathe of um, opportunities. Um, principally, we're driving at releasing money again for um, climate-related assistance, but we've also got um, our own investment fund, which is linked to the government, um, which essentially allows countries or businesses to come and say, here's a proposition, would you be interested in investing? And either going in as a partner to that investment or going in uh, as a whole owner of that investment. So that, that's a really critical thing. I think that you know, we need to accept, though, that there's a balance in that relationship, too. So. You know, I, I have um, people who I work very closely with in Sierra Leone. I left 20 years ago. They've been there for the last 20 years. They've had tens of millions of dollars at their disposal to invest, but they've struggled to actually invest all the funds across West Africa because it's very difficult sometimes to find the investments um, and, the, and the sort of network of protections around the investments to make them worthwhile for investors. So I think, you know, we need to... We need to encourage Western capital to look at developing countries, to look at Latin America, to look at opportunities in Africa and um, Southeast Asia and beyond. But at the same time, the recipient countries need to think carefully about how they attract that investment. And I think part of our side of the development game needs to be to help those countries build the ecosystems that make themselves attractive to foreign investment. And dare I say it, when countries do really commit to that process, <laughs> come in very hard behind them. And I know that USAID is looking closely at this at the moment, and Zambia is a good example that perhaps has been already talked about earlier today. So I think that's the key thing. We need to make sure that this is a balanced proposition. We're encouraging capital. Countries are doing what they can to allow the capital to flow in safely and with, um, with effect. Can I ask you and press you a little bit on that in terms of you spoke about leveraging private capital much, much more effectively? What are some of the tools or strategies that, that the UK is thinking about? And then the same, same question to Axel. So I think we can provide seed capital in some cases. So for example, Axel talked about the PGII. I think you know, 
um, what we can do is we can say the UK government is willing to invest you know, 20% of the investment it will take to get this solar operation over the line. Would you, you know, this bank or this pension fund be interested in coming in and meeting the other 80%? So I think seed capital is important. I think if we think a proposition is particularly strong, I think looking to um, sort of ensure uh, other people's investments up to a point is something that's always worth looking at as well. Um, and I think, you know, looking around the investment uh, infrastructure, and again, you know, whether it's the City of London or whether it's New York, giving businesses the access to those markets. So if you have someone who's sitting in um, Lagos or someone who's sitting in Bolivia who has a proposition, our development teams are able to say, this is where you should go to look for the financing for that. And, and being the sort of um, the link in the chain between those two opportunities. So I think direct investment, seed capital, and also just being part of the, um, the ecosystem that allows the money to flow. Same, same question to you, maybe adding one component. You already spoke about um, you know, getting private companies to, to invest, not just private capital. Um, there, obviously, Germany, the UK, others, that, that pursue a much more uh, open markets approach have, have a disadvantage maybe to Chinese actors that are much more um, in, influential in telling their own state-owned enterprises how to invest yeah. and how to approach, how to target uh, and prioritize. Uh, are we are at a natural disadvantage there? And can we overcome that? Um, well, I'm not, I'm not sure we are at a disadvantage. I think we have to, to work to um, to create uh, uh, and help create the uh, conditions uh, uh, for, for private investment, and then it can be very powerful. Um, and uh, we have to, to see those, uh, um, those regions really uh, um, um, not anymore, which might have been uh, something in the past as recipients of AIDS, but really as uh, uh, um, partners, partners to create uh, uh, prosperity. Uh, partners to crew to solve uh, uh, the global issues of today, um, and I think we are we are doing that. Uh, um, you're doing it here. We see it in the in the U.S. You had the the big uh, U.S. Africa summit, but we also have this uh, for several iterations already um, uh, with Africa, EU Africa uh, uh, leader summit, uh, where it is really about uh, also creating the uh, conditions uh, uh, for. Uh, strengthened uh, economic exchange for, for creating the uh, conditions for uh, investment by companies and, and uh, instruments like uh, Global Gateway, instruments like free trade agreements really help a lot there. Um, and then we have, of course, also a lot of bilateral um, elements to do that. We have our um, uh, GIZ, KFW, uh, and they uh, work uh, on the ground uh, uh, to create uh, also the conditions uh, to, to uh, develop the countries, to uh, um, make them more prosperous. And by that, uh, making uh, uh, focusing also, for example, I was uh, in, in Serbia, as you mentioned, focusing on good governance. Uh, and these will then uh, uh, create the conditions also to, to bring about uh, private investment. So I think. Uh, we, um, we are open societies. It's, we don't tell a company, you have to go there, do it. Uh, but uh, if we, uh, with the countries, uh, work together, uh, create the uh, conditions which are sustainable, uh, this has, of course, a much longer lasting effect. Yeah, and if I could say. Yeah, absolutely. I think we, you know, we have to trust the markets, right? People um, all over the world who have capital are very good at deciding where to put that capital and what good options are and what bad options are. Um, our job, I think, is to maybe open their eyes to some of the really good investment opportunities that are in place across the global south um, and the things that will drive um, real change, change that will have advantages for them in terms of um, climate change and issues. But you, you mentioned sort of um, the Chinese government being able to tell its banks where to put their money. Um, I think you know, people talk about the Sri Lankan port, um, Hambam Tota, quite a lot. Um, and they talk about it as a sort of debt trap. Actually, it was just an investment trap in some ways. You know, that was not a good port to invest in, full stop. Um, and I think the Chinese banks that did that have, have discovered that. Now, there may be contingent impacts on you know, Sri Lanka's debt um, situation. I, I personally think that the Chinese debt is not as consequential as Sri Lanka's broader private debt. I think China only has about 10% of 
Sri Lanka's debt, and Japan has about 10%. The rest is, is all private debt. But that's a good example of you know, a political decision um, delivering a bad investment outcome. So I think our job is to let the capital do its job and find the good opportunities. But our other job is to create a better ecosystem for the investment and to open up the eyes of investors to the opportunities. Mm. We're already running fast towards the, the one million pound and euro question about uh, whether... Which is worth more. <laughs> um, whether you know, European governments, uh, other partners that are re-engaging or stepping up that engagement at least can sustain that in terms of budgetary resources. Because yeah. yeah. whether it's development aid or, or other means are often the first target of uh, under fiscal pressures, how confident are you that the UK will stay the course and similar in Germany where we've already seen with the budget uh, issues towards the end of the year, some cuts in the development budget, right? Maybe. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm very confident. We have a new development white paper that came out this year. We have a very energized uh, Secretary of State for development um, within our Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. Um, there's no doubt that money is tight globally. Um, and you will know that we reduced our development spend from 0.7% down to 0.5% because of some of those financial pressures. Um, it's our ambition to get back up to 0.7% as, um, as soon as the economic situation allows. But I think, as I've said, I don't think it's just about government money. I think it's about releasing all the other money um, that's out there. And it's also, it's also not a financial proposition alone. So I think when we think about, I don't like this talk about a shift to the center of gravity from Euro-Atlantic. I think there's a dispersal uh, of, of, of gravity. And I think um, when you look at the growing importance of um, you know, the Indo-Pacific region, um, when you look at the potential demographic growth in Africa um, from, you know, I think we're looking at 37% growth over the next um, 50 years or so. Um, the, the potential there is enormous, and the, um, the key emerging regional players are going to be incredibly important in the multilateral system. So engaging them from a political perspective as well as an economic perspective will be key. Drawing the African Union into the G20, making sure we get an African seat at the Security Council, making sure we get Brazil into the Security Council, getting Germany and Japan into the Security Council. Um, I think all of those things um, will be incredibly important. So it's not, you know, I think we, we need to not be too myopic in the way we look at this challenge. Quick follow-up on the budget uh, side of things and the consistent and long-term commitments to this. And then I want to turn back to James's question about the formats and mm -hmm. mechanisms we have. But I agree with uh, um, what James said. Uh, um, it's like on several dimensions, huh? the engagement. So it's not just uh, um, budgetary. And I'm not saying that to justify now that there are budget cuts. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, um, I think uh, at the beginning of our discussion here, uh, I mentioned the, the, the figure of 300 billion for the Global Gateway uh, project. Uh, um, if you look at uh, investment into climate change, I think we, um, just before the COP28, uh, we could, uh, uh, um, from the Secretariat, got the number that the um, 100 billion goal uh, um, uh, climate money had been reached. So, so I think there is a very serious uh, money, and the commitment is absolutely there. And I can say for, for Germany, and I think also for the EU, uh, there is no uh, dithering there, and uh, the priority is absolutely clear. Um, and in addition to that, it is very much also um, you, about using, in addition, other instruments. And I, I'd like to come back to the, to the um, uh, instrument of uh, uh, trade agreements, um, free trade agreements, uh, which uh, do play a role. It play a big role for us. It's always difficult to um, negotiate. You Mercosur in, in trouble a little bit? Well, I can say that uh, um, I think in, in, in this year we, are, uh, we will um, um, put into effect uh, the free trade agreement uh, uh, with Chile and uh, with Kenya. And uh, we are working hard on Mercosur, um, uh, still ongoing, not easy, but it's a very uh, substantive one. So, so, um, and also with, with other partners, uh, India, Indonesia, negotiating are, are ongoing. So just to say, on the budgetary side, the commitment is there, uh, even if there's, of course, always competing things. 
Uh, and there are also other instruments we have to use and are using. I want to turn now to the uh, mechanisms that we have. If, if resources are tight, right, um, and, and we want to leverage together some of, some of uh, the private capital, also cover different priority areas, um, and do this in a coordinated fashion, do we have the right coordination, consultation, mechanisms between Germany, the EU, the UK, the US, Japan, and other partners. We've already talked about the G7, PGII, um, Partnerships for Global Infrastructure Investment, Global Gateway, but are there other um, um, formats that we need in order to, to drive a more coordinated approach amongst ourselves as allies? I mean, I certainly think we could do better. Um, is the bottom line. I still think that um, there is uh, duplication out in the system. Uh, I still think that uh, to an extent you have uh, allies sort of competing in some of these um, spaces in a way that maybe we don't need to be competing. I mean, certainly uh, the UK works very closely alongside the EU in most of our development locations. You know, we, we don't um, conclude a uh, a, um, a development assistance program without properly sitting down um, with our other partners too and looking at it in the round. So I think that's very important, making sure that on the ground um, the teams that are engaged in, uh, in the negotiations and the development of the programs with the country are talking to the other donors and making sure we're, we're joined up at that level. Um, but I, I definitely think that we could look um, beyond the G7 um, at the wider group of development players and join that up um, a bit more dynamically. I think that one of the things we could look at a bit more is, is um, countries playing to their regional strengths a bit more. Um, you know, so the UK playing to its strengths of its deeper relationships in Africa, others playing to their strengths of their deeper relationships in Latin America, those of us with very strong relationships in the Pacific leaning into those. So I think that's one area where I think we could do um, a bit more to um, to cut back on some of the duplication that's out there, but really lean into expertise uh, a little bit more than perhaps we already do. You already mentioned Germany starting this conversation again in, in, uh, during Germany's G7 presidency uh, two years ago. Any thoughts on, on coordination, cooperation on this front? Well, I think it's, it's very important to, to always work on the um, uh, uh, coordination uh, uh, in the donor countries, so to say. Um, I mentioned, uh, and I think here also with the United States, uh, uh, we are really uh, engaged very much on that. Uh, I mentioned the part of the Blue Pacific where, with really uh, the countries coming together, uh, working on this, who does what, uh, no duplication or to, to avoid it, um, the G7 uh, uh, initiatives. But I think it's also uh, um, important to use uh, global governance instruments. I mean, we have to, it is not just uh, a group of countries sitting together our best to, to coordinate. It's really to, 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 to have a global discussion. Um, we will have uh, the Summit for the Future in the framework for the, of the UN, uh, um, where um, we, together with Namibia, also trying to, to help to um, coordinate a bit, setting it up. Uh, I think that is very important. We have a very, we have the G20 um, uh, uh, foreign ministers meeting on, uh, as, yeah. we, as we're speaking. Um, we have a very important uh, WTO uh, conference, which will start, I think, in uh, three or four days, uh, which will be very important. And a uh, uh, question also about dispute settlement mechanism, et cetera. So, so I think, uh, uh, global um, coordination mechanisms to, to, to work together are key, and uh, um, there's always room for improvement. Always room for improvement. I want to turn to some of the questions from the audience, which you can still submit at askac.org. Uh, one question here concerning um, relations with India have been spotlighted, especially with countries such as France making a concerted effort to build that bilateral relationship. Uh, we've heard of other uh, bilateral relationships. How might bolstering relations with powerful global South countries, such as India, Brazil, and others, have a trickle-down effect on the broader regions? Do you see that as one strategy? Absolutely. And you know, when I when I talked about that sort of gravitational dispersal, it's clear the world is becoming more 
multipolar um, and that there are countries who can be real linchpins in their regions, either for peace and security or for economic growth um, or for standing up for the international, um, the international law order. So I think you know, we will continue to invest in, in key countries, whether it's India, or whether it's Indonesia, or whether it's you know, um, the new government in Argentina. It's, it's really critical that we recognize that um, right across the world, there are countries who are going to be really critical to um, their region's prosperity and security, and investing in those relationships, and once again, convincing them to stay the course with us um, in terms of how the world should look is going to be key. How's Germany looking at that prioritization? Totally. To, well, I mean, uh, totally agree with that. And uh, that's why I, I mentioned uh, some, some uh, uh, concrete uh, projects we are uh, um, having at the moment. Uh, you mentioned the Mercosur Agreement. Uh, we have in close discussion with uh, key countries there. Um, um, India uh, working on a, a free trade agreement, which will be, of course, uh, uh, quite a, a, a long slog to, to, to negotiate, but very important. Uh, and uh, so we really um, see some very, very important uh, regional players, uh, global players, and uh, we are absolutely engaging with them. We had, uh, for example, um, this year, um, um, very intense government-to-government uh, -government consultations uh, with Brazil. Uh, basically, the whole German government uh, going there, and uh, we're having really very uh, intense and, and also fruitful discussions. Another question here from the audience is how concerned, concerning is China's messaging and propaganda across the global south, including about Europe's colonial past, its parroting of Russian talking points, about uh, Russia's war in Ukraine, blaming NATO and the United States, and so on. Uh, I mean, how much of a of a headwind is is that for for the strategy of engagement in Latin America, Africa, elsewhere? Well, I think that's of course a problem, uh, uh, and uh, uh, these are uh, uh, talking points. For example, when you speak about uh, um, uh, Russia, uh, we have this uh, uh, friendship with no limits. Uh, um, and, and we have uh, still waiting for, for China to, to speak out against uh, uh, Russia's uh, war, a brutal war of aggression against uh, uh, Ukraine, um, uh, threatening territorial uh, integrity, sovereignty of a country, uh, really um, putting the, the whole global order, international law, uh, into question. And uh, uh, these, are, these are things we have to uh, also make our point, to explain our point of view. We have to uh, um, also, for example, make the point uh, that as a result of uh, Russia's war of aggression, uh, the whole uh, global food security is challenged. Uh, and and the, really, this is something uh, that uh, needs to be explained. And I think we are making the point. Yeah, I mean, actually, I agree with, I agree with all of that. I would, I would also just say, though, you know, it's important that we don't make this a zero-sum game. That, you know, this, it's not a choice between um, the West and China. I think countries can, can find relationships with, with both partners uh, and find a way through with both partners. But I agree um, that the, the way that China positions itself sometimes in these countries and the narrative it has about the West can be incredibly unhelpful. And I'm sure that if you were sitting in Beijing, you might make the contrary argument um, that our, you know, that our lines on, on China are equally unhelpful. But um, I think the fundamental point is um, countries are presented with a choice about how they want their countries to run and how they want the world to look. And that's, that's the proposition um, that we're making uh, at the moment. And that's, that's the really critical exercise that we're engaged in. Another question here, I think, goes to a broader set of issues. How have security concerns impacted uh, the EU's uh, as it try, the EU as it tries to work with, with the global south. So how do you connect the dots? This is not just, as you said, not just an economic agenda. It is connected to a security agenda, to a broader geopolitical agenda. How do you connect the dots between these different agendas as Germany engages, as the UK engages um, in, with different countries? Can you repeat that? So, the question here was about how security concerns have impacted EU engagement with countries well, of the global south. So to the point of this is not just an economic engagement, it is, goes to a broader geopolitical, 
uh, security and, and technology engagement? Well, uh, absolutely. I think it is not just a mercantilistic approach. Uh, uh, it's also about uh, security. It's also about economic security, uh, political security. And therefore, um, I think the approach to, to build uh, stable uh, relationships uh, to uphold the uh, rules-based international order uh, is, is uh, at the key of our, of our engagement. It's about uh, solving the global uh, questions. Uh, it's about being about prosperity, but it's also uh, um, really um, having a stronger web of uh, alliances, of partnerships, uh, and, and therefore, if you look, for example, uh, towards uh, Asia Pacific, um, we are uh, really uh, engaging very closely also uh, with a lot of uh, uh, um, partners in the regions, uh, and, and also that is part of the de-risking strategy. And I would say from the UK perspective, insecurity makes the world poorer. And so it fundamentally bears down on the space for development and, and economic growth. So we need as much security as possible. And certainly, as Axel has said, you know, China is engaged um, with Russia and with Iran and with North Korea and essentially being complicit to an extent in that insecurity through not condemning it and also through, um, through allowing certain things to happen. So I think there's that strand to it. I think the other strand is, frankly, insecurity takes away bandwidth. You know, I would love it if instead of talking about um, competition with China or um, the war in Ukraine or the terrible situation in the Middle East, that we could talk about the sustainable development goals because that would actually help us win the argument. That would help us drive the development agenda forward. If we were talking about the SDGs and about climate change at the top of our agenda, but instead the bandwidth is sucked into dealing um, with the insecurity. And I think the third part to the question is that our economic security um, depends on our engagement with some of the countries that will provide the raw materials that are required to drive um, our security, whether that's in chips or in um, in, in green growth over the next two decades. Well, thank you both uh, for that view from Berlin, London, Europe more generally and how um, European allies can provide more viable engagement and alternatives in the global south to entrench Chinese political and, and economic influence. That was a rich and wide ranging discussion with you both. Thank you for joining us for this conference and helping us wrap up with the final session on important issues of allied uh, engagement and alternatives. Thank you to our colleagues at the Global China Hub here at the Atlantic Council um, for, for allowing us to bring in European allied perspectives. Um, and thank you to our partners at the University of Notre Dame. I'm inv inviting Joshua Eiserman to provide some closing remarks to the whole conference. Over to you, Joshua. Thank you. Thank you, guys, for your excellent remarks. Uh, realizing that uh, I am the one who stands between you and a cold beverage, I will be relatively quick about this. But I think we, we really need to begin where we probably where, end where we should have began, and that is to thank the amazing staff here at the Atlantic Council for the fantastic work they've done. Specifically, Caroline, Matt, Kitch, Samantha, and Sylvia have done all of this, and we are all very grateful for all their work. So thank you so much, guys. Really. You have no idea how many emails have flown across. Uh, it is fantastic. Um, so thanks again. Let me begin uh, and just add a couple of comments that have kind of come to me throughout this process. And one, one thing I want to do is, is say a couple of words about this term Global South, which has been discussed so much and where it comes from, right? So we all know that Mao Zedong created this idea of the third world, right? And the third world is a deeply political concept, okay? You have the first world, the, the hegemonic powers, the second world, which are the so-called running dogs of the first world, and then you have the third world, right, which China says it was part of. This concept then evolves into the developing world, which is a very economic concept, right? It's, a, it's about emerging economically. The Global South actually brings both of these together. It has an economic component, but it also has a political component. Now, that does not mean that in the next day or two, and maybe in five minutes, we won't come up with a better term. And if we come up with a better term, I'd be happy to adopt it. But I do think that the Global South does bring something. It brings economics and politics together. And it's imperfect to be sure, but I don't think we should abandon it necessarily, because it does do some service more than I would say the term the developing world, which is what we used to use. 
Now, getting to some more substantive points here. Throughout this discussion, we have talked about how China's rise has impacted and affected countries throughout the global south. Um, we've talked about in different regions and different aspects of China's rise, political, security, and economic, and how those have impacted the global south. And we have also begun to talk about what we are now beginning, which is the kind of downslope, right? There's um, a variety of different reasons for this that you know, but most of them are pretty systemic and unlikely to change soon. The Chinese uh, uh, real estate market is unlikely to rebound anytime soon. The Chinese population is unlikely to rebound anytime soon. The disparity between men and women in China is unlikely to resolve itself anytime soon. The, re the problems between the, the, the city dwellers and the country folk are unlikely to resolve themselves anytime soon. And this would suggest that in the future, we are going to have a China-Global South relationship where China China is not growing nearly as fast economically as it has. And that's going to fundamentally change the way in which the Global South engages. Economics has been at the fore. And when we look at the FOCAC, for instance, we saw for uh, FOCAC meeting after FOCAC meeting, a doubling of Chinese commitments to FOCAC. Well, those days are done, right? Uh, in 2021, China had $1 billion of investment in Africa. In 2016, it was somewhere around $21 billion, right? And it's unlikely to return to that anytime soon. And I think that that's the new normal, if you will, that we have to adopt and understand. And we've talked about that throughout the conference. And I think that is really a value add that we have brought here, because I have not heard that discussion taking place to the degree I believe it has to take place if we are to be forward looking in our understanding. The second thing that I thought I think was brought up throughout the conference is this idea of China's trust deficit in the global south. And this is fascinating because you would think that a country like China, which claims itself part of the global south, who originated the term the third world, and who has been deeply engaged in the global south for so long, would have more trust than folks uh, like uh, Emika and others have su suggested during this conference that they have. The fact that they have to use other outlets to carry water for them is suggestive that, well, CGTN, Xinhua, don't have the kind of credibility that I think they would like to have. And that says something, right? It says something that they've put billions and billions of dollars into this and at the end of the day are still trying to sneak the messages in through local outlets because their own outlets are not nearly as credible as, say, the BBC or DW, which is, by the way, one of my favorites. Um, and so this, this really suggests that China's state-run uh, um, uh, uh, media and state-run propaganda still has a problem. Um, and I think this came out uh, in a variety of different ways throughout the conference. At the same time, the issue of technology and China's evolving efforts to influence the global south through that thing in your hand, right? That technology, right? To, and to influence a new generation of people, young people throughout the global south in ways that, frankly, I don't see the United States and the West doing nearly as effectively. Um, fourth, excuse me, third, I think that one thing that came out here is that for the most part, I did not hear much enthusiasm for the BRICS. Um, and that's interesting because the BRICS is growing, right? They're, they're adding new members. They're holding big events in South Africa. Um, and, and these members that they're adding are all members of the Global South, big players. You would think that there would be enthusiasm, but there isn't, right? We see Argentina saying, no, thank you. We see Indonesia no, thank you. And uh, we see the Indians saying, you know what? We're not so sure about a common currency. I mean, frankly, the whole idea of a common currency is somewhat amusing because currencies are very closely tied to the, the, the nation they're in, right? You, 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 you change your policies based on the national conditions. And, and you know, the national conditions in countries as disparate as Brazil, Iran, and China it would be hard to imagine how they could coordinate it. Similarly, in the security side, in the Red Sea, it's hard to see how the BRICS is bringing much value added to solving that problem. And we heard about this today. And so it seems to me one thing I learned here is that it, we should be a little BRICS pessimistic, at least for the, for the time being. And then finally, I think maybe the most important thing is, is that 
the U.S.-China rivalry is really at the heart of China's engagement in the Global South. That China sees its engagement with the Global South as part of what it calls the democratization of international relations, what it sees as kind of spreading power throughout the international system, as a kind of Gulliver strategy constrain the United States. And so it sees this as Nadej Roland explained to us in a kind of zero-sum manner, where efforts to uh, advance Chinese interests will ipso facto decrease the United States and vice versa. And we also see this reflected in some comments you made here in Washington, D.C., people talking about how the United States has to beat China in the global south or advantage itself in the global south. But what's fascinating is when we're hearing from people like Richard earlier today, he, he was suggesting that, no, Chinese concepts of multilateralism are very different than the multilateralism that the South China Sea nations are looking at, excuse me, the, the Southeast Asian nations are looking at, right? The, 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 glo the, the multilateralism they see includes countries like Japan and India um, and, and a whole variety, he, I think he mentioned Turkey as well in the European states. But the idea that it is a bipolar world and the US-China rivalry is a zero-sum game doesn't seem to be as prevalent within Global South nations as it is in Beijing and in Washington, D.C. Interestingly enough, also, uh, as Joseph Asunka's um, uh, Afrobarometer indicates, we see a strange correlation in Africa between negative views of the U.S. and negative views of China. I mean, it's quite interesting, right? You would think if it's a zero-sum game, then if you go down, then I go up. But in fact, we don't. We pull each other down together. And this is fascinating because it would suggest that rather than a zero-sum game between the U.S. and China, at least in Africa, we're split perhaps as we are in the U.S. between people who are more global-minded and people who are more nativist. And when we pour scorn upon each other, we put a pox on both of our houses and drag each other down, right? That simply um, having this negative anti-U.S. drumbeat through Chinese propaganda doesn't actually harm the U.S. to advantage China. It, in fact, may just harm both of us all together. And I think this is a, an interesting juxtaposition between the way we in the US and those in China see this and those nations of the, uh, the global south. Right? And so I guess the, the final point I'll make here is that you know, whether we like it or not, however, um, our efforts to evolve China into a, uh, a responsible stakeholder or a more liberal democratic country, uh, both from the European side and the American side, have failed. And in part, that is the kind of backdrop of where we find ourselves today. And so there is going to be, I think, undoubtedly, increasing US-China rivalry uh, within the Global South for the foreseeable future. I don't think uh, that even with a, a Chinese economy that's on the decline, uh, or that's not rising as fast as it once was, I should say, um, that that's necessarily going to change. But I want to go back to something I said in my opening remarks, which is I do not believe that anything I heard in the last two days leads me to change my mind that we are not destined for uh, proxy wars, for the kinds of conflicts we saw in the first Cold War. That the US and China can find a modus vivendi for competition without conflict in the global south. Because I think it would be a terrible thing if we ended up arming different groups and fighting the way the US and the Soviet Union once did. And so maybe that's a positive note. While we will compete with each other, while we will maybe criticize each other, the one thing I think I don't see in the offing is us coming to blows with each other in the global south. And to me, that's actually one of the most important things that we can do, is to find a way to compete without conflict. And I think that that is the kind of thing that you know, I hope that people in this town and in Beijing keep in mind, uh, because I think that it can be very tempting as you compete more and more to kind of slip into conflict. But I think that we should be very, we should kind of firewall this, right, to the best degree we can, so that we can compete in a way which does not lead us into the direct conflicts we saw in the first, um, in the, in the first Cold War. And you know what? That may not be possible. Um, eventually, in places like the South China Sea, as we heard, conflicts may occur. That being said, I think we have to do our best to try to, uh, um, try to constrain those conflicts and try to maintain, uh, for the sake of the global south um, and its development, um, uh, a, a maybe not cooperative, but uh, not directly uh, a militarily competitive relationship. And so maybe the final point I want to do is just thank my good friend, uh, Dave Shulman, uh, for all of his efforts to bring this uh, conference together um, and all of the, the great thoughts that he has shared with us here today uh, through his moderation and um, to thank you all.
for coming and spending the last two days with us. So let's get a drink. <laughs>